Section One of the Morals, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. The Morals, Volume One, by Plutarch, translated by several hands corrected and revised by william w goodwin section one editor's preface the translation of plutarch's morals quotes, by several hands close quotes, was first published in london in sixteen eighty four to sixteen ninety four the fifth edition quotes, revised and corrected from the many errors of the former editions close quotes, published in seventeen eighteen is the basis of the present translation the earlier translation made by philemon holland doctor of physic published in london in sixteen o three and again in sixteen fifty seven has often been of great use in the revision it need hardly be stated that the name morals is used by tradition to include all the works of plutarch except the lives the original editions of the present work contained translations of every grade of merit some of the essays were translated by eminent scholars like william baxter nephew of richard baxter and thomas creech whose work generally required merely such revision as every translation of such an age would now need but a large number including some of the longest and most difficult treatises were translated by men whose ignorance of greek or whatever language was the immediate ancestor of their own version was only one of their many defects as translators perhaps we may gain a better idea than we have had of the scholars of oxford whom bentley delighted to torment from these specimens of the learning of their generation and it may have been a fortunate thing for some of our translators that bentley was too much occupied with the wise heads of christ church to be able to notice the blunders of men who could write notes saying that the parthenon is quotes, a promontory shooting into the black sea where stood a chapel dedicated to some virgin godhead and famous for some victory thereabout obtained close quotes or who could torture a plain statement that a certain water when stirred produced bubbles pompholuges into a story of a new substance called pompholuges quotes, made by mixture of brass with the air close quotes. see volume five page three hundred and thirty seven and volume three page five hundred and seventeen of the original translation besides the great variety of scholarship and ignorance each translator had his own theory of translation while some attempted a literal version so as even to bracket all words not actually represented in the greek others gave a mere paraphrase which in one case mr pullin's customs of the lacedaemonians became an original essay on the subject based on the facts supplied by plutarch the present editor's duty of course changed with each new style of translation it would have been impossible to bring the whole work to a uniform standard of verbal correctness unless essentially a new translation had been made the original version was often so hopelessly incorrect that no revision was possible and here the editor cannot flatter himself that he has succeeded in patching the english of the seventeenth century with his own without detriment fortunately the earlier translation of holland supplied words and even whole sentences 
in many cases in which the other was beyond the help of mere revision the translation of holland is generally more accurate than the other and on the whole a more conscientious work its antiquated style and diffuseness however render it less fitted for republication at the present time notwithstanding all the defects of the translation which is here revised it is beyond all question a more readable version than could be made now and the liveliness of its style will more than make up to most readers for its want of literal correctness it need not be stated to professional scholars that translations made in the seventeenth century cannot even by the most careful revision be made to answer the demands of modern critical scholarship one of the greatest difficulties in preparing the present work has been to decide how much of the antiquated language of the old translation should be retained on this point the editor has fortunately been able to consult the widest and most experienced advisers to whose aid he has been constantly indebted but even the highest authorities occasionally disagree on the first principles he is fully aware therefore that he has dissatisfied a large number of the friends of plutarch in this respect but he is equally sure that he should have dissatisfied an equal number by any other course which he might have followed the general principle adopted has been to retain such expressions as were in good use when the translation was made provided the meaning is obvious or easy to be learned from a dictionary and to discard such as would be unintelligible to ordinary readers it has in some cases been assumed that the use of a phrase of obvious meaning in this translation is of itself authority for accepting it on these principles many words and expressions are retained which are decidedly weaker than their modern equivalents especially many latinisms and gallicisms which now seem pedantic even here consistency has been impossible where the duty of a reviser changed with every new treatise perhaps the editor cannot state his own object more correctly than by saying that he has tried to make each treatise what the original translator would have made it if he had carried out his own purpose conscientiously and thoroughly where so many errors were to be corrected it would be absurd to hope that many have not remained still unnoticed the corrupt state of the greek text of many parts of plutarch's morals must not be overlooked no complete edition of the greek has been published since wittenbach's seventeen ninety five to eighteen hundred except the french one by dubner in the dido collection the latter gives no manuscript readings and although it professes to be based partly on a new collation of the manuscripts in the public library of paris nothing distinguishes the changes made on this authority from conjectures of the editor and his predecessors a slight glance at wittenbach will show that many parts of the text are restored by conjecture and many of the conjectures though plausible and ingenious are not such as would be accepted by modern scholarship if they were made in earlier classic authors a translator must accept many of these under silent protest to enumerate one half of them would introduce a critical commentary entirely out of place in a translation in fact no critical translation of these treatises is possible until a thorough revision of the text with the help of the best manuscripts has been made and this is a task from which most scholars would shrink in dismay in many cases in this edition 
blanks have been preferred to uncertain conjectures or traditional nonsense the treatises on music on the procreation of the soul and the two on the stoics have many of their dark corners made darker by the utter uncertainty of the greek text the essays in this edition follow the same order as in the old translation but those on fortune and on virtue and vice with the conjugal precepts are transferred from the beginning of volume third to the end of volume second the sections have been numbered in accordance with the modern editions of the greek text references to most of the classic authors quoted by plutarch are given in the footnotes except where a quotation is a mere fragment of an unknown work the tragic fragments are numbered according to the edition of nauck leipzig eighteen fifty six all notes except these references introduced by the editor are marked g a few notes are taken from holland and all which are not otherwise marked are retained from the old translation in conclusion the editor must express his warmest thanks to his colleagues at the university and other friends who have kindly aided him with their advice and skill without their help the undertaking would sometimes have seemed hopeless harvard college november eighteen seventy end of section one Section 2 of The Morals, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Morals, Volume 1, by Plutarch. Translated by several hands, corrected and revised by William W. Goodwin. Introduction by Ralph Waldo Emerson It is remarkable that of an author so familiar as Plutarch, not only to scholars, but to all reading men, and whose history is so easily gathered from his works, no accurate memoir of his life, not even the dates of his birth and death, should have come down to us strange that the writer of so many illustrious biographies should wait so long for his own it is agreed that he was born about the year fifty a d he has been represented as having been the tutor of the emperor trajan as dedicating one of his books to him as living long in rome in great esteem as having received from trajan the consular dignity and as having been appointed by him the governor of greece he was a man whose real superiority had no need of these flatteries meantime the simple truth is that he was not the tutor of trajan that he dedicated no book to him was not consul in rome nor governor of greece appears never to have been in rome but on two occasions and then on business of the people of his native city chironia and though he found and made friends at rome and read lectures to some friends or scholars he did not know or learn the latin language there with one or two doubtful exceptions never quotes a latin book and though the contemporary in his youth or in his old age of perseus juvenal lucan and seneca of quintilian marshall tacitus suetonius pliny the elder and the younger he does not cite them and in return his name is never mentioned by any roman writer it would seem that the community of letters and of personal news was even more rare at that day than the want of printing of railroads and telegraphs would suggest to us 
but this neglect by his contemporaries has been compensated by an immense popularity in modern nations whilst his books were never known to the world in their own greek tongue it is curious that the lives were translated and printed in latin thence into italian french and english more than a century before the original works were yet printed for whilst the lives were translated in rome in fourteen seventy one and the morals part by part soon after the first printed edition of the greek works did not appear until fifteen seventy two hardly current in his own greek these found learned interpreters in the scholars of germany spain and italy in france in the middle of the most turbulent civil wars amio's translation awakened general attention his genial version of the lives in fifteen fifty nine of the morals in fifteen seventy two had signal success king henry the fourth wrote to his wife marie de medici vive dieu as god liveth you could not have sent me anything which could be more agreeable than the news of the pleasure you have taken in this reading plutarch always delights me with a fresh novelty to love him is to love me for he has been long time the instructor of my youth my good mother to whom i owe all and who would not wish she said to see her son an illustrious dunce put this book into my hands almost when i was a child at the breast it has been like my conscience and has whispered in my ear many good suggestions and maxims for my conduct and the government of my affairs still earlier rabelais cites him with due respect montaigne in 1589 says we dunces had been lost had not this book raised us out of the dirt by this favor of his we dare now speak and write the ladies are able to read to schoolmasters tis our breviary montesquieu drew from him his definition of law and in his ponce declares i am always charmed with plutarch in his writings are circumstances attached to persons which give great pleasure and adds examples saint evremond read plutarch to the great conde under a tent rollin so long the historian of antiquity for france drew unhesitatingly his history from him voltaire honored him and rousseau acknowledged him as his master in england sir thomas north translated the lives in fifteen seventy nine and holland the morals in 1603 in time to be used by shakespeare in his plays and read by bacon dryden and cudworth then recently there has been a remarkable revival in france in the taste for plutarch and his contemporaries led we may say by the eminent critic saint beauve monsieur octave Gréard, in a critical work on the morals has carefully corrected the popular legends and constructed from the works of plutarch himself his true biography monsieur l'eveque has given an exposition of his moral philosophy under the title of a physician of the soul in the revue des deux mondes and m c martha chapters on the genius of marcus aurelius of perseus and lucretius in the same journal whilst monsieur fustel de collange has explored from its roots in the aryan race then in their greek and roman descendants the primeval religion of the household plutarch occupies a unique place in literature as an encyclopedia of greek and roman antiquity whatever is eminent in fact or in fiction in opinion in character in institutions in science natural moral or metaphysical or in memorable sayings drew his attention and came to his pen 
with more or less fullness of record he is among prose writers what chaucer is among english poets a repertory for those who want the story without searching for it at first hand a compend of all accepted traditions and all this without any supreme intellectual gifts he is not a profound mind not a master in any science not a lawgiver like lycurgus or solon not a metaphysician like parmenides plato or aristotle not the founder of any sect or community like pythagoras or zeno not a naturalist like pliny or linnaeus not a leader of the mind of a generation like plato or goethe but if he had not the highest powers he was yet a man of rare gifts he had that universal sympathy with genius which makes all its victories his own though he never used verse he had many qualities of the poet in the power of his imagination the speed of his mental associations and his sharp objective eyes but what specially marks him he is a chief example of the illumination of the intellect by the force of morals though the most amiable of boon companions this generous religion gives him aperçu like goethe's plutarch was well born well taught well conditioned a self-respecting amiable man who knew how to better a good education by travels by devotion to affairs private and public a master of ancient culture he read books with a just criticism eminently social he was a king in his own house surrounded himself with select friends and knew the high value of good conversation and declares in a letter written to his wife that he finds scarcely an erasure as in a book well written in the happiness of his life the range of mind makes the glad writer the reason of plutarch's vast popularity is his humanity a man of society of affairs upright practical a good son husband father and friend he has a taste for common life and knows the court the camp and the judgment hall but also the forge farm kitchen and cellar and every utensil and use and with a wise man's or a poet's eye thought defends him from any degradation he does not lose his way for the attractions are from within not from without a poet in verse or prose must have a sensuous eye but an intellectual co-perception plutarch's memory is full and his horizon wide nothing touches man but he feels to be his he is tolerant even of vice if he finds it genial enough a man of the world to give even the devil his due and would have hugged robert burns when he cried oh why'd ye take a thought and mend he is a philosopher with philosophers a naturalist with naturalists and sufficiently a mathematician to leave some of his readers now and then at a long distance behind him or respectfully skipping to the next chapter but this scholastic omniscience of our author engages a new respect since they hope he understands his own diagram he perpetually suggests montaigne who was the best reader he has ever found though montaigne excelled his master in the point and surprise of his sentences plutarch had a religion which montaigne wanted and which defends him from wantonness and though plutarch is as plain spoken his moral sentiment is always pure what better praise has any writer received than he whom montaigne finds frank in giving things not words dryly adding it vexes me that he is so exposed to the spoil of those that are conversant with him 
it is one of the felicities of literary history the tie which inseparably couples these two names across fourteen centuries montaigne whilst he grasps etienne de la boise with one hand reaches back the other to plutarch these distant friendships charm us and honor all the parties and make the best example of the universal citizenship and fraternity of the human mind i do not know where to find a book to borrow a phrase of ben jonson's so rammed with life and this in chapters chiefly ethical which are so prone to be heavy and sentimental no poet could illustrate his thought with more novel or striking similes or happier anecdotes his style is realistic picturesque and varied his sharp objective eyes seeing everything that moves shines or threatens in nature or art or thought or dreams indeed twilights shadows omens and spectres have a charm for him he believes in witchcraft and the evil eye in demons and ghosts but prefers if you please to talk of these in the morning his vivacity and abundance never leave him to loiter or pound on an incident i admire his rapid and crowded style as if he had such store of anecdotes of his heroes that he is forced to suppress more than he recounts in order to keep up with the hasting history his surprising merit is the genial facility with which he deals with his manifold topics there is no trace of labor or pain he gossips of heroes philosophers and poets of virtues and genius of love and fate and empires it is for his pleasure that he recites all that is best in his reading he prattles history but he is no courtier and no boswell he is ever manly far from fawning and would be welcome to the sages and warriors he reports as one having a native right to admire and recount these stirring deeds and speeches i find him a better teacher of rhetoric than any modern his superstitions are poetic aspiring affirmative a poet might rhyme all day with hints drawn from plutarch page on page no doubt this superior suggestion for the modern reader owes much to the foreign air the greek wine the religion and history of antique heroes thebes sparta athens and rome charm us away from the disgust of the passing hour but his own cheerfulness and rude health are also magnetic in his immense quotation and allusion we quickly cease to discriminate between what he quotes and what he invents we sail on his memory into the ports of every nation and enter into every private property and do not stop to discriminate owners but give him the praise of all tis all plutarch by right of eminent domain and all property vests in this emperor this facility and abundance make the joy of his narrative and he is read to the neglect of more careful historians yet he inspires a curiosity sometimes makes a necessity to read them he disowns any attempt to rival thucydides but i suppose he has a hundred readers where thucydides finds one and thucydides must often thank plutarch for that one he has preserved for us a multitude of precious sentences in prose or verse of authors whose books are lost and these embalmed fragments through his loving selection alone have come to be proverbs of later mankind i hope it is only my immense ignorance that makes me believe that they do not survive out of his pages not only thespis polemus euphorion ariston 
evanus etc but fragments of menander and pindar at all events it is in reading the fragments he has saved from lost authors that i have hailed another example of the sacred care which has unrolled in our times and still searches and unrolls papyri from ruined libraries and buried cities and has drawn attention to what an ancient might call the politeness of fate we will say more advisedly the benign providence which uses the violence of war of earthquakes and changed watercourses to save underground through barbarous ages the relics of ancient art and thus allows us to witness the upturning of the alphabets of old races and the deciphering of forgotten languages so to complete the annals of the forefathers of asia africa and europe his delight in poetry makes him cite with joy the speech of gorgias that the tragic poet who deceived was juster than he who deceived not and he that was deceived was wiser than he who was not deceived it is a consequence of this poetic trait in his mind that i confess that in reading him i embrace the particulars and carry a faint memory of the argument or general design of the chapter but he is not less welcome and he leaves the reader with a relish and a necessity for completing his studies many examples might be cited of nervous expression and happy allusion that indicate a poet and an orator though he is not ambitious of these titles and cleaves to the security of prose narrative and only shows his intellectual sympathy with these yet i cannot forbear to cite one or two sentences which none who reads them will forget in treating of the style of the pythian oracle he says quote, do you not observe some one will say what a grace there is in sappho's measures and how they delight and tickle the ears and fancies of the hearers whereas the sibyl with her frantic grimaces uttering sentences altogether thoughtful and serious neither facused nor perfumed continues her voice a thousand years through the favor of the divinity that speaks within her another gives an insight into his mystic tendencies quote, early this morning asking epaminondas about the manner of lysis's burial i found that lysis had taught him as far as the incommunicable mysteries of our sect and that the same demon that waited on lysis presided over him if i can guess at the pilot from the sailing of the ship the paths of life are large but in few are men directed by the demons when theonor had said this he looked attentively on epaminondas as if he designed a fresh search into his nature and inclinations and here is his sentiment on superstition somewhat condensed in lord bacon's citation of it quote, i had rather a great deal that men should say there was no such man at all as plutarch than that they should say that there was one plutarch that would eat up his children as soon as they were born as the poets speak of saturn End quote. the chapter on fortune should be read by poets and other wise men and the vigor of his pen appears in the chapter whether the athenians were more warlike or learned and in his attack upon usurers there is of course a wide difference of time in the writing of these discourses and so in their merit many of them are mere sketches or notes for chapters in preparation which were never digested or finished many are notes for disputations in the lecture room his poor indignation against herodotus 
was perhaps a youthful prize essay it appeared to me captious and labored or perhaps at a rhetorician school the subject of herodotus being the lesson of the day plutarch was appointed by lot to take the adverse side the plain speaking of plutarch as of the ancient writers generally coming from the habit of writing for one sex only has a great gain for brevity and in our new tendencies of civilization may tend to correct a false delicacy we are always interested in the man who treats the intellect well we expect it from the philosopher from plato aristotle spinoza and kant but we know that metaphysical studies in any but minds of large horizon and incessant inspiration have their dangers one asks sometimes whether a metaphysician can treat the intellect well the central fact is the superhuman intelligence pouring into us from its unknown fountain to be received with religious awe and defended from any mixture of our will but this high muse comes and goes and the danger is that when the muse is wanting the student is prone to supply its place with microscopic subtleties and logomachy it is fatal to spiritual health to lose your admiration let others wrangle said saint augustine i will wonder plato and plotinus are enthusiasts who honor the race but the logic of the sophists and materialists whether greek or french fills us with disgust whilst we expect this awe and reverence of the spiritual power from the philosopher in his closet we praise it in the man of the world the man who lives on quiet terms with existing institutions yet indicates his perception of these high oracles as do plutarch montaigne hume and goethe these men lift themselves at once from the vulgar and are not the parasites of wealth perhaps they sometimes compromise go out to dine make and take compliments but they keep open the source of wisdom and health plutarch is uniformly true to this centre he had not lost his wonder he is a pronounced idealist who does not hesitate to say like another barclay matter is itself privation and again the sun is the cause that all men are ignorant of apollo by sense withdrawing the rational intellect from that which is to that which appears he thinks that souls are naturally endowed with the faculty of prediction he delights in memory with its miraculous power of resisting time he thinks that alexander invaded persia with greater assistance from aristotle than from his father philip he thinks that he who has ideas of his own is a bad judge of another man's it being true that the elians would be the most proper judges of the olympic games were no elians gamesters he says of socrates that he endeavored to bring reason and things together and make truth consist with sober sense he wonders with plato at that nail of pain and pleasure which fastens the body to the mind the mathematics give him unspeakable pleasure but he chiefly liked that proportion which teaches us to account that which is just equal and not that which is equal just of philosophy he is more interested in the results than in the method he has a just instinct of the presence of a master and prefers to sit as a scholar with plato than as a disputant and true to his practical character he wishes the philosopher not to hide in a corner 
but to commend himself to men of public regards and ruling genius for if he once possess such a man with principles of honor and religion he takes a compendious method by doing good to one to oblige a great part of mankind tis a temperance not an eclecticism which makes him adverse to the severe stoic or the gymnosophist or diogenes or any other extremist that vice of theirs shall not hinder him from citing any good word they chance to drop he is an eclectic in such sense as montaigne was willing to be an expectant not a dogmatist in many of these chapters it is easy to infer the relation between the greek philosophers and those who came to them for instruction this teaching was no play nor routine but strict sincere and affectionate the part of each of the class is as important as that of the master they are like the baseball players to whom the pitcher the bat the catcher and the scout are equally important and plutarch thought with ariston that neither a bath nor a lecture served any purpose unless they were purgative plutarch has such a keen pleasure in realities that he has none in verbal disputes he is impatient of sophistry and despises the epicarmian disputations as that he who ran in debt yesterday owes nothing to-day as being another man so he that was yesterday invited to supper the next night comes an unbidden guest for that he is quite another person except as historical curiosities little can be said in behalf of the scientific value of the opinions of the philosophers the questions and the symposiacs they are for the most part very crude opinions many of them so puerile that one would believe that plutarch in his haste adopted the notes of his younger auditors some of them jocosely misreporting the dogma of the professor who laid them aside as memoranda for future revision which he never gave and they were posthumously published now and then there are hints of superior science you may call from this record of barbarous guesses of shepherds and travellers statements that are predictions of facts established in modern science usually when thales anaximenes or anaximander are quoted it is really a good judgment the explanation of the rainbow of the floods of the nile and of the remora etc are just and the bad guesses are not worse than many of lord bacon's his natural history is that of a lover and poet and not of a physicist his humanity stooped affectionately to trace the virtues which he loved in the animals also knowing and not knowing is the affirmative or negative of the dog knowing you is to be your friend not knowing you your enemy he quotes thucydides saying that not the desire of honor only never grows old but much less also the inclination to society and affection to the state which continue even in ants and bees to the very last but though curious in the questions of the schools on the nature and genesis of things his extreme interest in every trait of character and his broad humanity lead him constantly to morals to the study of the beautiful and good hence his love of heroes his rule of life and his clear convictions of the high destiny of the soul la harpe said that plutarch is the genius the most naturally moral that ever existed is almost inevitable to compare plutarch with seneca who born fifty years earlier was for many years his contemporary though they never met 
and their writings were perhaps unknown to each other plutarch is genial with an endless interest in all human and divine things seneca a professional philosopher a writer of sentences and though he keep a sublime path is less interesting because less humane and when we have shut his book we forget to open it again there is a certain violence in his opinions and want of sweetness he lacks the sympathy of plutarch he is tiresome through perpetual didactics he is not happily living cannot the simple lover of truth enjoy the virtues of those he meets and the virtues suggested by them so to find himself at some time purely contented seneca was still more a man of the world than plutarch and by his conversation with the court of nero and his own skill like voltaire's of living with men of business and emulating their address in affairs by great accumulation of his own property learned to temper his philosophy with facts he ventured far apparently too far for so keen a conscience as he inly had yet we owe to that wonderful moralist illustrious maxims as if the scarlet vices of the times of nero had the natural effect of driving virtue to its loftiest antagonisms seneca says lestrange was a pagan christian and is very good reading for our christian pagans he was buddhist in his cold abstract virtue with a certain impassibility beyond humanity he called pity that fault of narrow souls yet what noble words we owe to him Quote, god divided man into men that they might help each other End quote. and again quote, the good man differs from god in nothing but duration End quote. his thoughts are excellent if only he had a right to say them plutarch meantime with every virtue under heaven thought it the top of wisdom to philosophize yet not appear to do it and to reach in mirth the same ends which the most serious are proposing plutarch thought truth to be the greatest good that man can receive and the goodliest blessing that god can give when you are persuaded in your mind that you cannot either offer or perform anything more agreeable to the gods than the entertaining a right notion of them you will then avoid superstition as a no less evil than atheism he cites euripides to affirm if gods do aught dishonest they are no gods and the memorable words of antigone in sophocles concerning the moral sentiment quote, for neither now nor yesterday began these thoughts which have been ever nor yet can a man be found who their first entrance knew End quote. his faith in the immortality of the soul is another measure of his deep humanity he reminds his friends that the delphic oracles have given several answers the same in substance as that formerly given to Coraz the Naxian. Quote, it sounds profane impiety to teach that human souls e'er die. End quote. He believes that the doctrine of the divine providence and that of the immortality of the soul rest on one and the same basis. He thinks it impossible either that a man beloved of the gods should not be happy or that a wise and just man should not be beloved of the gods to him the epicureans are hateful who held that the soul perishes when it is separated from the body the soul incapable of death suffers in the same manner in the body as birds that are kept in a cage he believes that the souls of infants 
pass immediately into a better and more divine state i can easily believe that an anxious soul may find in plutarch's chapter called pleasure not attainable by epicurus and his letter to his wife to moxena a more sweet and reassuring argument on the immortality than in the phaedo of plato for plutarch always addresses the question on the human side and not on the metaphysical as walter scott took hold of boys and young men in england and america and through them of their fathers his grand perceptions of duty lead him to his stern delight in heroism a stoic resistance to low indulgence to a fight with fortune a regard for truth his love of sparta and of heroes like aristides phocian and cato he insists that the highest good is in action he thinks that the inhabitants of asia came to be vassals to one only for not having been able to pronounce one syllable which is no so keen is his sense of allegiance to right reason that he makes a fight against fortune whenever she is named at rome he thinks her wings were clipped she stood no longer on a ball but on a cube as large as italy he thinks it was by superior virtue that alexander won his battles in asia and africa and the greeks theirs against persia but this stoic in his fight with fortune with vices effeminacy and indolence is gentle as a woman when other strings are touched he is the most amiable of men to erect a trophy in the soul against anger is that which none but a great and victorious puissance is able to achieve anger turns the mind out of doors and bolts the door he has a tenderness almost to tears when he writes on friendship on marriage on the training of children and on the love of brothers there is no treasure he says parents can give to their children like a brother tis a friend given by nature a gift nothing can supply once lost not to be replaced the arcadian prophet of whom herodotus speaks was obliged to make a wooden foot in place of that which had been chopped off a brother embroiled with his brother going to seek in the street a stranger who can take his place resembles him who will cut off his foot to give himself one of wood all his judgments are noble he thought with epicurus that it is more delightful to do than to receive a kindness this courteous gentle and benign disposition and behavior is not so acceptable so obliging or delightful to any of those with whom we converse as it is to those who have it there is really no limit to his bounty it would be generous to lend our eyes and ears nay if possible our reason and fortitude to others whilst we are idle or asleep his excessive and fanciful humanity reminds one of charles lamb whilst it much exceeds him when the guests are gone he would leave one lamp burning only as a sign of the respect he bore to fires for nothing so resembles an animal as fires it is moved and nourished by itself and by its brightness like the soul discovers and makes everything apparent and in its quenching shows some power that seems to proceed from a vital principle for it makes a noise and resists like an animal dying or violently slaughtered and he praises the romans who when the feast was over dealt well with the lamps and did not take away the nourishment they had given but permitted them to live and shine by it i can almost regret that the learned editor of the present republication has not preserved if only as a piece of history the preface of mr morgan the editor 
and in part writer of this translation in 1718. In his dedication of the work to the Archbishop of Canterbury, William Wake, he tells the primate that Plutarch was the wisest man of his age, and if he had been a Christian, one of the best, too. But it was his severe fate to flourish in those days of ignorance, which, tis a favorable opinion to hope that the Almighty will sometime wink at, that our souls may be with these philosophers together in the same state of bliss. The puzzle in the worthy translator's mind between his theology and his reason well reappears in the puzzle of his sentence. I know that the chapters of Apothems of Noble Commanders is rejected by some critics as not a genuine work of Plutarch, but the matter is good and is so agreeable to his taste and genius that if he had found it, he would have adopted it. If he did not compile the piece, many, perhaps most, of the anecdotes were already scattered in his works. If I do not lament that a work not his should be ascribed to him, I regret that he should have suffered such destruction of his own. What a trilogy is lost to mankind in his lives of Scipio, Epaminondas, and Pindar. His delight in magnanimity and self-sacrifice has made his books, like Homer's Iliad, a Bible for heroes, and wherever the Cid is relished, the legends of Arthur, Saxon Alfred, and Richard the Lionhearted, Robert Bruce, Sidney, Lord Herbert of Cherbury, Cromwell, Nelson, Bonaparte, and Walter Scott's Chronicles in prose or verse, there will Plutarch, who told the story of Leonidas, of Agesilus, of Aristides, Phocian, Themistocles, Demosthenes, Epaminondas, Caesar, Cato, and the rest, sit as the bestower of the crown of noble knighthood and laureate of the ancient world. The chapters on the fortune of Alexander in the morals are an important appendix to the portrait in the lives. The union in Alexander of sublime courage with the refinement of his pure tastes, making him the carrier of civilization into the East, are in the spirit of the ideal hero, and endeared him to Plutarch. That prince kept Homer's poems not only for himself under his pillow in his tent, but carried these for the delight of the Persian youth, and made them acquainted also with the tragedies of Euripides and Sophocles. He persuaded the Sogdians not to kill, but to cherish their aged parents, the Persians to reverence, not marry their mothers, the Scythians to bury, and not eat their dead parents. What a fruit and fitting monument of his best days was his city Alexandria to be the birthplace or home of Plotinus, St. Augustine, Senecius, Posidonius, Ammonius, Jamblicus, Porphyry, Origen, Aratus, Apollonius, and Apuleius. If Plutarch delighted in heroes and held the balance between the severe Stoic and the indulgent Epicurean, his humanity shines not less in his intercourse with his personal friends. He was a genial host and guest, and delighted in bringing chosen companions to the supper table. He knew the laws of conversation and the laws of good fellowship quite as well as Horace, and has set them down with such candor and grace as to make them good reading today. The guests not invited to a private board by the entertainer, but introduced by a guest as his companions, the Greeks called shadows. And the question is debated whether it was civil to bring them, and he treats it candidly, but concludes. Therefore, when I make an invitation, since it is hard to break the custom of the place, I give my guests leave to bring shadows. 
but when i myself am invited as a shadow i assure you i refuse to go he has an objection to the introduction of music at feasts he thought it wonderful that a man having a muse in his own breast and all the pleasantness that would fit an entertainment would have pipes and harps play and by that external noise destroy all the sweetness that was proper and his own i cannot close these notes without expressing my sense of the valuable service which the editor has rendered to his author and to his readers professor goodwin is a silent benefactor to the book wherever i have compared the editions i did not know how careless and vicious in parts the old book was until in recent reading of the old text on coming on anything absurd or unintelligible i referred to the new text and found a clear and accurate statement in its place it is the vindication of plutarch the correction is not only of names of authors and of places grossly altered or misspelled but of unpardonable liberties taken by the translators whether from negligence or freak one proof of plutarch's skill as a writer is that he bears translation so well in spite of its carelessness and manifold faults which i doubt not have tried the patience of its present learned editor and corrector i yet confess my enjoyment of this old version for its vigorous english style the work of some forty or fifty university men some of them imperfect in their greek it is a monument of the english language at a period of singular vigor and freedom of style i hope the commission of the philological society in london charged with the duty of preparing a critical dictionary will not overlook these volumes which show the wealth of their tongue to greater advantage than many books of more renown as models it runs through the whole scale of conversation in the street the market the coffee-house the law courts the palace the college and the church there are no doubt many vulgar phrases and many blunders of the printer but it is the speech of business and conversation and in every tone from lowest to highest we owe to these translators many sharp perceptions of the wit and humor of their author sometimes even to the adding of the point i notice one which although the translator has justified his rendering in a note the severer criticism of the editor has not retained Quote, were there not a sun we might for all the other stars pass our days in reverend dark as heraclitus calls it End quote. i find a humor in the phrase which might well excuse its doubtful accuracy it is a service to our republic to publish a book that can force ambitious young men before they mount the platform of the county conventions to read the laconic apothems and the apothems of great commanders if we could keep the secret and communicate it only to a few chosen aspirants we might confide that by this noble infiltration they would easily carry the victory over all competitors but as it was the desire of these old patriots to fill with their majestic spirit all sparta or rome and not a few leaders only we hasten to offer them to the american people plutarch's popularity will return in rapid cycles if overread in this decade so that his anecdotes and opinions become commonplace in today's novelties are sought for variety his sterling values will presently recall the eye and thought of the best minds and his books will be reprinted and read anew by coming generations and thus plutarch will be perpetually rediscovered from time to time as long as books last end of section two recording by 
Lucretia B. Section 3 of The Morals, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Morals, Volume 1, by Plutarch. Translated by several hands. Corrected and revised by William W. Goodwin. A Discourse Touching the Training of Children. Part 1. The course which ought to be taken for the training of free-born children and the means whereby their manners may be rendered virtuous will, with the reader's leave, be the subject of our present disquisition. In the management of which, perhaps it may be expedient to take our rise from their very procreation. I would, therefore, in the first place, advise those who desire to become the parents of famous and eminent children that they keep not company with all women that they light on, I mean such as harlots or concubines, for such children as are blemished in their birth either by the father's or the mother's side, are liable to be pursued, as long as they live, with the indelible infamy of their base extraction, as that which offers a ready occasion to all that desire to take hold of it of reproaching and disgracing them therewith. So that it was a wise speech of the poet who said, Misfortune on that family is entailed, whose reputation in its founder failed. Wherefore, since to be well born gives men a good stock of confidence, the consideration hereof ought to be of no small value to such as desire to leave behind them a lawful issue. For the spirits of men who are alloyed and counterfeit in their birth are naturally enfeebled and debased, as rightly said the poet again, a bold and daring spirit is often daunted when with the guilt of parents' crimes tis haunted. So, on the contrary, a certain loftiness and natural gallantry of spirit is wont to fill the breasts of those who are born of illustrious parents, of which Diophantus, the young son of Themistocles, is a notable instance, for he is reported to have made his boast often and in many companies that whatsoever pleased him pleased also all Athens, for whatever he liked his mother liked, and whatever his mother liked Themistocles liked, and whatever Themistocles liked all the Athenians liked. Wherefore it was gallantly done of the Lacedaemonian states, when they laid a round fine on their king Archidamus for marrying a little woman, giving this reason for their so doing, that he meant to beget for them not kings, but kinglings. The advice which I am in the next place about to give is, indeed, no other than what hath been given by those who have undertaken this argument before me. You will ask me, what is that? It is this that no man keep company with his wife for issue's sake, but when he is sober, having drunk either no wine, or at least not such a quantity as to distemper him. For they usually prove wine-bibbers and drunkards, whose parents begot them when they were drunk. Wherefore Diogenes said to a stripling, somewhat crack-brained and half-witted, Surely, young man, thy father begot thee when he was drunk. Let this suffice to be spoken concerning the procreation of children." and let us pass thence to their education. And here, to speak summarily, what we are wont to say of arts and sciences may be said also concerning virtue, that there is a concurrence of three things requisite to the completing thereof in practice, which are nature, reason, and use. Now, by reason here I would understand to mean learning, and by use, exercise. Now the principles come from instruction, the practice comes from exercise, and perfection from all three combined. And accordingly, as either of the three is deficient, virtue must needs be defective. For if nature be not improved by instruction, it is blind. If instruction be not assisted by nature, it is maimed. And if exercise fail of the assistance of both, it is imperfect as to the attainment of its end. And as in husbandry it is first requisite that the soil be fertile, next that the husbandman be skilful, and lastly that the seed he sows be good. So here nature resembles the soil, the instructor of youth, the husbandman, and the rational principles and precepts which are taught, the seed. And I would peremptorily affirm that all these met and jointly conspired to the completing of the souls of those universally celebrated men, Pythagoras, Socrates, and Plato, 
together with all others whose eminent worth hath gotten them immortal glory. And happy is that man, certainly, and well beloved of the gods, on whom by the bounty of any of them all these are conferred. And yet, if any one thinks that those in whom nature hath not thoroughly done her part, may not in some measure make up her defects, if they be so happy as to light upon good teaching, and withal apply their own industry towards the attainment of virtue, he is to know that he is very much, nay, altogether, mistaken. For, as a good natural capacity may be impaired by slothfulness, so dull and heavy natural parts may be improved by instruction, and whereas negligent students arrive not at the capacity of understanding the most easy things, those who are industrious conquer the greatest difficulties. And many instances we may observe that give us a clear demonstration of the mighty force and successful efficacy of labour and industry. For water continually dropping will wear hard rocks hollow. Yea, iron and brass are worn out with constant handling. Nor can we, if we would, reduce the fellows of a cartwheel to their former straightness, when once they have been bent by force. Yea, it is above the power of force to straighten the bended staves sometimes used by actors upon the stage. So far is that which labour effects, though against nature, more potent than what is produced according to it. Yea, have we not many millions of instances more which evidence the force of industry? Let us see in some few that follow. A man's ground is of itself good, yet, if it be unmanured, it will contract barrenness, and the better it was naturally, so much the more is it ruined by carelessness, if it be ill-husbanded. On the other side, let a man's ground be more than ordinarily rough and rugged, yet experience tells us that, if it be well manured, it will be quickly made capable of bearing excellent fruit. Yea, what sort of tree is there which will not, if neglected, grow crooked and unfruitful? And what but will, if rightly ordered, prove fruitful and bring its fruit to maturity? What strength of body is there which will not lose its vigour and fall to decay by laziness, nice usage, and debauchery? And, on the contrary, where is the man of never so crazy a natural constitution who cannot render himself far more robust if he will only give himself to exercises of activity and strength? What horse well managed from a cold proves not easily governable by the rider? And where is there one to be found which, if not broken betimes, proves not stiff-necked and unmanageable? Yea, why need we wonder at anything else when we see the wildest beasts made tame and brought to hand by industry? And lastly, as to men themselves, that Thessalian answered not amiss, who, being asked which of his countrymen were the meekest, replied, those that have received their discharge from the wars. But what need of multiplying more words in this matter, when even the notion of the word ethos in the Greek language imports continuance, and he that should call moral virtues customary virtues would seem to speak not incongruously. I shall conclude this part of my discourse, therefore, with the addition of one only instance. Lycurgus, the Lacedaemonian lawgiver, once took two whelps of the same litter, and ordered them to be bred in a quite different manner, whereby the one became dainty and ravenous, and the other of a good scent and skilled in hunting. Which done, a while after he took occasion thence in an assembly of the Lacedaemonians to discourse in this manner. Of great weight in the attainment of virtue, fellow citizens, are habits, instruction, precepts, and indeed the whole manner of life, as I will presently let you see by example. And, withal, he ordered the producing those two whelps into the midst of the hall, where also there were set down before them a plate and a live hare. Whereupon, as they had been bred, the one presently flies upon the hare, and the other as greedily runs to the plate. And while the people were musing, not perfectly apprehending what he meant by producing those whelps thus, he added, These whelps were both of one litter, but differently bred. The one, you see, has turned out a greedy cur, and the other a good hound. And this shall suffice to be spoken concerning custom and different ways of living. The next thing that falls under our consideration is the nursing of children, which, in my judgment, the mothers should do themselves, giving their own breasts to those they have borne. 
for this office will certainly be performed with more tenderness and carefulness by natural mothers who will love their children intimately as the saying is from their tender nails whereas both wet and dry nurses who are hired love only for their pay and are affected to their work as ordinarily those that are substituted and deputed in the place of others are yea even nature seems to have assigned the suckling and nursing of the issue to those that bear them for which cause she hath bestowed upon every living creature that brings forth young milk to nourish them withal and in conformity thereto providence hath also wisely ordered that women should have two breasts that so if any of them should happen to bear twins they might have two several springs of nourishment ready for them though if they had not that furniture mothers would still be more kind and loving to their own children and that not without reason for constant feeding together is a great means to heighten the affection mutually betwixt any persons yea even beasts when they are separated from those that have grazed with them do in their way show a longing for the absent wherefore as i have said mothers themselves should strive to the utmost to nurse their own children but if they find it impossible to do it themselves either because of bodily weakness and such a case may fall out or because they are apt to be quickly with child again then are they to choose the honestest nurses they can get and not to take whomsoever they have offered them and the first thing to be looked after in this choice is that the nurses be bred after the greek fashion for as it is needful that the members of children be shaped aright as soon as they are born that they may not afterwards prove crooked and distorted so it is no less expedient that their manners be well fashioned from the very beginning for childhood is a tender thing and easily wrought into any shape yea and the very souls of children readily receive the impressions of those things that are dropped into them while they are yet but soft but when they grow older they will as all hard things are be more difficult to be wrought upon and as soft wax is apt to take the stamp of the seal so are the minds of children to receive the instructions imprinted on them at that age whence also it seems to me good advice which divine plato gives to nurses not to tell all sorts of common tales to children in infancy lest thereby their minds should chance to be filled with foolish and corrupt notions the like good counsel for Kilides the poet seems to give in this verse of his if we'll have virtuous children we should choose their tenderest age good principles to infuse now are we to omit taking due care in the first place that those children who are appointed to attend upon such young nurslings and to be bred with them for playfellows be well mannered and next that they speak plain natural greek lest being constantly used to converse with persons of a barbarous language and evil manners they receive corrupt tinctures from them for it is a true proverb that if you live with a lame man you will learn to halt next when a child is arrived at such an age as to be put under the care of pedagogues great care is to be used that we be not deceived in them and so commit our children to slaves or barbarians or cheating fellows for it is a course never enough to be laughed at which many men nowadays take in this affair for if any of their servants be better than the rest they dispose some of them to follow husbandry some to navigation some to merchandise some to be stewards in their houses and some lastly to put out their money to use for them but if they find any slave that is a drunkard or a glutton and unfit for any other business to him they assign the government of their children whereas a good pedagogue ought to be such a one in his disposition as phoenix tutor to achilles was and now i come to speak of that which is a great matter and of more concern than any that i have said we are to look after such masters for our children as are blameless in their lives not justly reprovable for their manners and of the best experience in teaching for the very spring and root of honesty and virtue lies in the felicity of lighting on good education and as husbandmen are wont to set forks to prop up feeble plants so do honest schoolmasters prop up youth by careful instructions and admonitions that they may duly bring forth the buds of good manners but there are certain fathers nowadays who deserve that men should spit on them in contempt who before making any proof of those to whom they design to commit the teaching of their children either through unacquaintance or as it sometimes falls out through unskilfulness entrust them to men of no good reputation 
or it may be such as are branded with infamy, although they are not altogether so ridiculous if they offend herein through unskilfulness. But it is a thing most extremely absurd when, as oftentimes it happens, though they know and are told beforehand by those who understand better than themselves both of the inability and rascality of certain schoolmasters, they nevertheless commit the charge of their children to them, sometimes overcome by their fair and flattering speeches, and sometimes prevailed on to gratify friends who entreat them. This is an error of like nature with that of the sick man who, to please his friends, forbears to send for the physician that might save his life by his skill, and employs a mountebank that quickly dispatches him out of the world, or of him who refuses a skilful shipmaster, and then, at his friend's entreaty, commits the care of his vessel to one that is therein much his inferior. In the name of Jupiter and all the gods, tell me, how can that man deserve the name of a father, who is more concerned to gratify others in their requests than to have his children well educated? Or is not that rather fitly applicable to this case, which Socrates, that ancient philosopher, was wont to say, that if he could get up to the highest place in the city, he would lift up his voice and make this proclamation thence? What mean you, fellow citizens, that you thus turn every stone to scrape wealth together, and take so little care of your children, to whom one day you must relinquish it all? To which I would add this, that such parents do like him that is solicitous about his shoe, but neglects the foot that is to wear it. And yet many fathers there are, who so love their money and hate their children, that, lest it should cost them more than they are willing to spare to hire a good schoolmaster for them, they rather choose such persons to instruct their children as are of no worth, thereby beating down the market, that they may purchase ignorance cheap. It was, therefore, a witty and handsome jeer which Aristippus bestowed on a sottish father, who asked him what he would take to teach his child. He answered, A thousand drachms. Whereupon the other cried out, O Hercules, what a price you ask, for I can buy a slave at that rate. Do so, then, said the philosopher, and thou shalt have two slaves instead of one. Thy son for one, and him thou buyest for another. Lastly, how absurd it is, when thou accustomest thy children to take their food with their right hands, and chidest them if they receive it with their left, yet thou takest no care at all that the principles that are infused into them be right and regular. And now I will tell you what ordinarily is like to befall such prodigious parents when they have had their sons ill-nursed and worse taught. For when such sons are arrived at man's estate, and, through contempt of a sound and orderly way of living, precipitate themselves into all manner of disorderly and servile pleasures, then will those parents dearly repent of their own neglect of their children's education, when it is too late to amend it and vex themselves even to distraction at their vicious courses. For then do some of those children acquaint themselves with flatterers and parasites, a sort of infamous and execrable persons, the very pests that corrupt and ruin young men. Others maintain mistresses and harlots, insolent and extravagant. Others waste their substance. Others again come to shipwreck on gaming and revelling. And some venture on still more audacious crimes, committing adultery and joining in the orgies of Bacchus, being ready to purchase one bout of debauched pleasure at the price of their lives. If now they had but conversed with some philosopher, they would never have enslaved themselves to such courses as these, though possibly they might have learned at least to put in practice the precept of Diogenes, delivered by him indeed in rude language, but yet containing, as to the scope of it, a great truth, when he advised a young man to go to the public stews, that he might then inform himself, by experience, how things of greatest value and things of no value at all were there of equal worth. In brief, therefore, I say, and what I say may justly challenge the repute of an oracle rather than of advice, that the one chief thing in this matter, which comprises the beginning, middle, and end of all, is good education and regular instruction and that these two afford great help and assistance towards the attainment of virtue and felicity. For all other good things are but human and of small value, such as will hardly recompense the industry required to the getting of them. It is indeed a desirable thing to be well descended, but the glory belongs to our ancestors. Riches are valuable, but they are the goods of fortune, 
who frequently takes them from those that have them, and carries them to those that never so much as hoped for them. Yea, the greater they are, the fairer mark are they for those to aim at, who design to make our bags their prize. I mean evil servants and accusers. But the weightiest consideration of all is, that riches may be enjoyed by the worst as well as the best of men. Glory is a thing deserving respect, but unstable. Beauty is a prize that men fight to obtain, but, when obtained, it is of little continuance. Health is a precious enjoyment, but easily impaired. Strength is a thing desirable, but apt to be the prey of diseases and old age. And, in general, let any man who values himself upon strength of body know that he makes a great mistake. For what, indeed, is any proportion of human strength if compared to that of other animals, such as elephants and bulls and lions? but learning alone of all things in our possession is immortal and divine. And two things there are that are most peculiar to human nature, reason and speech, of which two, reason is the master of speech, and speech is the servant of reason, impregnable against all assaults of fortune, not to be taken away by false accusation, nor impaired by sickness, nor enfeebled by old age. For reason alone grows youthful by age, and time which decays all other things, increaseth knowledge in us in our decaying years. Yea, war itself, which like a winter torrent, bears down all other things before it, and carries them away with it, leaves learning alone behind. Whence the answer seems to me very remarkable, which Stilpo, a philosopher of Mega, gave to Demetrius, who, when he levelled that city to the ground, and made all the citizens bondmen, asked Stilpo whether he had lost anything. Nothing, said he, for war cannot plunder virtue. To this saying, that of Socrates also is very agreeable, who, when Gorgias, as I take it, asked him what his opinion was of the king of Persia, and whether he judged him happy, returned answer, that he could not tell what to think of him, because he knew not how he was furnished with virtue and learning, as judging human felicity to consist in those endowments, and not in those which are subject to fortune, Moreover, as it is my advice to parents that they make the breeding up of their children to learning the chiefest of their care, so I here add that the learning they ought to train them up unto should be sound and wholesome, and such as is most remote from those trifles which suit the popular humour. For to please the many is to displease the wise. To this saying of mine, that of Euripides himself bears witness. I am better skilled to treat a few, my peers, than in a crowd to tickle vulgar ears, though others have the luck on't when they babble most to the wise than most to please the rebel. Besides, I find by my own observation that those persons who make it their business to speak so as to deserve the favour and approbation of the scum of the people ordinarily live at a suitable rate, voluptuously and intemperately, and there is reason for it. For they who have no regard to what is honest, so they may make provision for other men's pleasures, will surely not be very propensed to prefer what is right and wholesome before that which gratifies their own inordinate pleasures and luxurious inclinations, and to quit that which humours them for that which restrains them. If any one ask what the next thing is wherein I would have children instructed, and to what further good qualities I would have them inured, I answer, that I think it advisable that they neither speak nor do anything rashly, for, according to the proverb, the best things are the most difficult. But extemporary discourses are full of much ordinary and loose stuff, nor do such speakers well know where to begin or where to make an end. And besides other faults, which those who speak suddenly are commonly guilty of, they are commonly liable to this great one, that they multiply words without measure, whereas premeditation will not suffer a man to enlarge his discourse beyond a due proportion. To this purpose it is reported of Pericles that, being often called upon by the people to speak, he would not, because, as he said, he was unprepared. And the Mosthenes also, who imitated him in the managery of public affairs, when the Athenians urged him to give his counsel, refused it with this answer, I have not yet prepared myself though it may be that this story is a mere fiction, brought down to us by uncertain tradition, without any credible author. But Demosthenes, in his oration against Midias, 
clearly sets forth the usefulness of premeditation. For there he says, I confess, O ye Athenians, that I came hither provided to speak, and I will by no means deny that I have spent my utmost study upon the composing this oration, for it had been a pitiful omission in me, if, having suffered and still suffering such things, I should have neglected that which in this course was to be spoken by me. But here I would not be understood altogether to condemn all readiness to discourse extempore, nor yet to allow the use of it upon such occasions as do not require it, but we are to use it only as we do physic. Still, before a person arrives at complete manhood, I would not permit him to speak upon any sudden incident occasion, though, after he has attained eradicated faculty of speaking, he may allow himself a greater liberty, as opportunity is offered. For, as they who have been a long time in chains, when they are at last set at liberty, are unable to walk, on account of their former continual restraint, and are very apt to trip, so they who have been used to a fettered way of speaking a great while, if upon any occasion they be enforced to speak on a sudden, will hardly be able to express themselves without some tokens of their former confinement. But to permit those that are yet children to speak extemporarily is to give them occasion for extremely idle talk. A wretched painter, they say, showing Apelles a picture, told him withal that he had taken a very little time to paint it. "'If thou hadst not told me so,' said Apelles, "'I see cause enough to believe it was a hasty draught, but I wonder that in that space of time thou hast not painted many more such pictures. I advise, therefore, for I return now to the subject that I have digressed from, the shunning and avoiding, not merely of a starched, theatrical, and over-tragical form of speaking, but also of that which is too low and mean. For that which is too swelling is not fit for the managery of public affairs, and that, on the other side, which is too thin, is very inapt to work any notable impression upon the hearers. For as it is not only requisite that a man's body be healthy, but also that it be of a firm constitution, so ought a discourse to be not only sound, but nervous also. For though such as is composed cautiously may be commended, yet that is all it can arrive at, whereas that which hath some adventurous passages in it is admired also. And my opinion is the same concerning the affections of the speaker's mind, for he must be neither of a too confident nor of a too mean and dejected spirit, for the one is apt to lead to impudence, the other to servility, and much of the orator's art, as well as great circumspection, is required to direct his course skilfully betwixt the two. End of section 3《Section 4 of The Morals, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Morals, Volume 1, by Plutarch. Translated by several hands, corrected and revised by William W. Goodwin. A Discourse Touching the Training of Children, Part 2. And now, whilst I am handling this point concerning the instruction of children, I will also give you my judgment concerning the frame of a discourse, which is this, that to compose it, in all parts uniformly, not only is a great argument of a defect in learning, but also is apt, I think, to nauseate the auditory when it is practiced, and in no case can it give lasting pleasure. For to sing the same tune, as the saying is, is in everything cloying and offensive. But men are generally pleased with variety, as in speeches and pageants, so in all other entertainments. 10. Wherefore, though we ought not to permit an ingenuous child entirely to neglect any of the common sorts of learning, so far as they may be gotten by lectures or from public shows, Yet I would have him to salute these only, as in his passage, taking a bare taste of each of them, seeing no man can possibly attain to perfection in all, and to give philosophy the preeminence of them all. I can illustrate my meaning by an example. It is a fine thing to sail round and visit many cities, but it is profitable to fix our dwelling in the best. 
Witty also was the saying of Bias, the philosopher, that as the wooers of Penelope, when they could not have their desires of the mistress, consented themselves to have to do with her maids. So commonly those students who are not capable of understanding philosophy waste themselves in the study of those sciences that are of no value. Whence it follows that we ought to make philosophy the chief of all our learning. For though in order to the welfare of the body the industry of men hath found out two arts, medicine, which assists to the recovery of lost health, and gymnastics, which helps us to attain a sound constitution, yet there is but one remedy for the distempers and diseases of the mind, and that is philosophy. For by the advice and assistance thereof it is that we come to understand what is honest, and what dishonest, what is just, and what unjust, in a word, what we are to seek, and what to avoid. We learn by it how we are to demean ourselves towards the gods, towards our parents, our elders, the laws, strangers, governors, friends, wives, children, and servants. That is, we are to worship the gods, to honor our parents, to reverence our elders, to be subject to the laws, to obey our governors, to love our friends, to use sobriety toward our wives, to be affectionate to our children, and not to treat our servants insolently. And, which is the chiefest lesson of all, not to be overjoyed in prosperity, nor too much dejected in adversity, not to be dissolute in our pleasures, nor in our anger to be transported with brutish rage and fury. These things I account the principal advantages which we gain by philosophy, for to use prosperity generously is part of a man, to manage it so as to decline envy, of a well-governed man, to master our pleasures by reason is the property of wise men, and to moderate anger is the attainment only of extraordinary men. But those of all men I count most complete who know how to mix and to temper the managery of civil affairs with philosophy seeing they are thereby masters of two of the greatest good things that are, a life of public usefulness as a statesman, and a life of calm tranquillity as students of philosophy. For whereas there are three sorts of lives, the life of action, the life of contemplation, and the life of pleasure, the man who is utterly abandoned and a slave to pleasure is brutish and mean-spirited, he that spends his time in contemplation without action is an unprofitable man, and he that lives in action and is destitute of philosophy is a rustical man, and commits many absurdities. Wherefore we are to apply our utmost endeavor to enable ourselves for both, that is, to manage public employments, and withal, at convenient seasons, to give ourselves to philosophical studies, such statesmen were Pericles and Archytas, the Tarentine. Such were Dion, the Syracusan, and Epimenides, the Theban, both of whom were of Plato's familiar acquaintance. I think it not necessary to spend any more words about this point, the instruction of children in learning. Only it may be profitable, at least, or even necessary, not to omit procuring for them the writings of ancient authors but to make such a collection of them as husbandmen are wont to do of all needful tools. For of the same nature is the use of books to scholars as being the tools and instruments of learning, and withal enabling them to derive knowledge from its proper fountains. 11. In the next place, the exercise of the body must not be neglected, but children must be sent to schools of gymnastics, where they may have sufficient employment that way also. This will conduce partly to a more handsome carriage, and partly to the improvement of their strength. For the foundation of a vigorous old age is a good constitution of the body in childhood. Wherefore, as it is expedient to provide those things in fair weather, which may be useful to the mariners in a storm, so it is to keep good order, 
and govern ourselves by rules of temperance in youth, as the best provision we can lay in for age. Yet must they husband their strength, so as not to become dried up, as it were, and destitute of strength to follow their studies. For according to Plato, sleep and weariness are enemies to the arts. But why do I stand so long on these things? I hasten to speak of that which is of the greatest importance, even beyond all that has been spoken of. Namely, I would have boys trained for the contests of wars, by practice in the throwing of darts, shooting of arrows, and hunting of wild beasts. For we must remember, in war, the goods of the conquered are proposed as rewards to the conquerors. But war does not agree with a delicate habit of body used only to the shade. For even one lean soldier that hath been used to military exercises shall overthrow whole troops of mere wrestlers who know nothing of war. But somebody may say, whilst you profess to give precepts for the education of all free-born children, why do you carry the matter so as to seem only to accommodate those precepts to the rich, and neglect to suit them also to the children of poor men and plebeians? To which objection it is no difficult thing to reply, for it is my desire that all children whatsoever may partake of the benefit of education alike. But if yet any persons, by reason of the narrowness of their estates, cannot make use of my precepts, let them not blame me that give them, but fortune, which disableth them from making the advantage by them they otherwise might. Though even poor men must use their utmost endeavor to give their children the best education, or if they cannot, they must bestow upon them the best that their abilities will reach. Thus much I thought fit here to insert in the body of my discourse, that I might the better be enabled to annex what I have yet to add concerning the right training of children. 12. I say now that children are to be won to follow liberal studies by exhortations and rational motives, and on no account be forced thereto by whipping or any other contumelious punishments. I will not urge that such usage seems to be more agreeable to slaves than to ingenuous children, and even slaves, when thus handled, are dulled and discouraged from the performance of their tasks, partly by reason of the smart of their stripes, and partly because of the disgrace thereby inflicted. But praise and reproof are more effectual upon free-born children than any such disgraceful handling the former to incite them to what is good, and the latter to restrain them from that which is evil. But we must use reprehensions and commendations alternately, and of various kinds according to the occasion, so that when they grow petulant they may be shamed by reprehension, and again, when they better deserve it, they may be encouraged by commendations. Wherein we ought to imitate nurses, who, when they have made their infants cry, stop their mouths with the nipple to quiet them again. It is also useful not to give them such large commendations as to puff them up with pride, for this is the ready way to fill them with a vain conceit of themselves and to enfeeble their minds. 13. Moreover, I have seen some parents whose too much love to their children hath occasioned, in truth, their not loving them at all. I will give light to this assertion by an example to those who ask what it means. It is this. While they are over hasty to advance their children in all sorts of learning beyond their equals, they set them to hard and laborious tasks, whereby they fall under discouragement, and this, with other inconveniences accompanying it, causeth them in the issue to be ill-affected to learning itself. For as plants by moderate watering are nourished, but with overmuch moisture are glutted, so is the spirit improved by moderate labors. 
but overwhelmed by such as are excessive. We ought, therefore, to give children some time to take breath from their constant labors, considering that all human life is divided betwixt business and relaxation. To which purpose it is that we are inclined by nature not only to wake, but to sleep also, that as we have sometimes wars, so likewise at other times peace, as some foul, so other fair days, and as we have seasons of important business, so also the vacation times of festivals. And to contract all in a word, rest is the sauce of labor. Nor is it thus in living creatures only, but in things inanimate too. For even in bows and harps we loosen their strings, that we may bend and wind them up again. Yea, it is universally seen that, as the body is maintained by repletion and evacuation, so is the mind by employment and relaxation. Those parents, moreover, are to be blamed who, when they have committed their sons to the care of pedagogues or schoolmasters, never see or hear them perform their tasks, wherein they fail much of their duty, for they ought, ever and anon, after the intermission of some days, to make trial of their children's proficiency, and not entrust their hopes of them to the discretion of a hireling. For even that sort of men will take more care of the children when they know that they are regularly to be called to account. And here the saying of the king's groom is very applicable, that nothing made the horse so fat as the king's eye. But we must of all exercise and keep in constant employment the memory of children, for that is, as it were, the storehouse of all learning. Wherefore the mythologists have made Mimison, or memory, the mother of the muses, plainly intimating thereby that nothing doth so beget or nourish learning as memory. Wherefore we must employ it to both those purposes, whether the children be naturally apt or backward to remember. For so shall we both strengthen it in those to whom nature in this respect hath been bountiful, and supply that to others wherein she hath been deficient. And as the former sort of boys will therefore come to excel others, so will the latter sort excel themselves. For that of Hesiod was well said, Off little add to little, and the account will swell, heaped atoms thus produce a mount. Neither, therefore, let the parents be ignorant of this, that the exercising of memory in the schools doth not only give the greatest assistance towards the attainment of learning, but also to all the actions of life. For the remembrance of things past affords us examples in our consults about things to come, 14. Children ought to be made to abstain from speaking filthily, seeing, as Democritus said, words are but the shadows of actions. They are, moreover, to be instructed to be affable and courteous in discourse. For as churlish manners are always detestable, so children may be kept from being odious in conversation, if they will not be pertinaciously bent to maintain all they say in dispute. For it is of use to a man to understand not only how to overcome, but also how to give ground when to conquer would turn to his disadvantage. For there is such a thing, sometimes, as a Cadmian victory, which the wise Euripides attesteth when he said, Where to discourse if the one's anger rise, the man who lets the contest fall is wise. Add we now to these things some others of which children ought to have no less, yea, rather greater care, to wit, that they avoid luxurious living, bridle their tongues, subdue anger, and refrain their hands. Of how great moment each of these counsels is, 
I now come to inquire, and we may best judge of them by examples. To begin with the last, some men there have been, who by opening their hands to take what they ought not, have lost all the honor they got in the former part of their lives. So Gylippus, the Lacedaemonian, for unsewing the public money-bags, was condemned to banishment from Sparta, and to be able also to subdue anger is the part of a wise man. Such a one was Socrates. For when a hectoring and debauched young man rudely kicked him, so that those in his company, being sorely offended, were ready to run after him and call him to account for it, what said he to them, if an ass had kicked me? Would you think it handsomely done to kick him again? And yet the young man himself escaped not unpunished. For when all persons reproached him for so unworthy an act, and gave him the nickname of Lactistes, or the kicker, he hanged himself. The same Socrates, when Aristophanes, publishing his play, in which he called The Clouds, therein, threw all sorts of the foulest reproaches upon him, and a friend of his, who was present at the acting of it, repeated to him what was there said, in the same comical manner, asking him withal, Does not this offend you? Socrates replied, Not at all, for I can as well bear with a fool in a play as at a great feast. And something of the same nature is reported to have been done by Archytas of Tarentum and Plato. Archytas, when upon his return from the war, wherein he had been a general, he was informed that his land had been impaired by his bailiff's negligence, sent for him, and said only thus to him when he came, If I were not very angry with thee, I would severely correct thee. And Plato, being offended with a gluttonous and debauched servant, called to him Spusippus, his sister's son, and said unto him, Go beat thou this fellow, for I am too much offended with him to do it myself. These things, you will perhaps say, are very difficult to be imitated. I confess it, but yet we must endeavor to the utmost of our power, by setting such examples before us, to repress the extravagancy of our immoderate furious anger for neither are we able to rival the experience or virtue of such men in many other matters, but we do, nevertheless, as sacred interpreters of divine mysteries and priests of wisdom, strive to follow these examples, and, as it were, to enrich ourselves with what we can nibble from them. As to the bridling of the tongue, concerning which also I am obliged to speak, if any man think it a small manner, or of mean concernment, he is much mistaken. For it is a point of wisdom to be silent when occasion requires, and better than to speak, though never so well. And in my judgment, for this reason, the ancients instituted mystical rites of initiation in religion, that being in them accustomed to silence, we might thence transfer the fear we have of the gods, to the fidelity required in human secrets. Yea, indeed, experience shows that no man ever repented of having kept silent, but many that they have not done so. And a man may, when he will, easily utter what he hath by silence concealed, but it is impossible for him to recall what he hath once spoken. And moreover, I can remember infinite examples that have been told me of those that have procured great damages to themselves by intemperance of the tongue, one or two of which I will give, omitting the rest. When Ptolemaeus Philadelphus had taken his sister Arsinoe to wife, Stotatis, for breaking an obscene jest upon him, lay languishing in prison a great while, a punishment which he deserved for his unseasonable babbling, whereby to provoke laughter in others he purchased a long time of mourning to himself. Much after the same rate, or rather still worse, 
did Theocritus, the sophist, both talk and suffer. For when Alexander commanded the Grecians to provide him a purple robe, wherein upon his return from the wars he meant to sacrifice to the gods in gratitude for his victorious success against the barbarians, and the various states were bringing in the sums assessed upon them, Theocritus said, I now see clearly that this is what Homer calls purple death, which I never understood before, by which speech he made the king his enemy from that time forwards. The same person provoked Antigonus, the king of Macedonia, to great wrath by reproaching him with his defect, as having but one eye. Thus it was. Antigonus commanded Eutropian, his master cook then in waiting, to go to this Theocritus and settle some accounts with him, and when he announced his errand to Theocritus, and called frequently about the business, the latter said, I know that thou hast a mind to dish me up raw to that Cyclops. Thus reproaching at once the king with the want of his eye, and the cook with his employment, to which Eutropian replied, Then thou shalt lose thy head as the penalty of thy loquacity and madness. And he was as good as his word, for he departed and informed the king, who sent and put Theocritus to death. Besides all these things, we are to accustom children to speak the truth, and to account it, as indeed it is, a matter of religion for them to do so. For lying is a servile quality, deserving the hatred of all mankind, yea, a fault for which we ought not to forgive our meanest servants. 15. Thus far I have discoursed concerning the good breeding of children, and the sobriety requisite to that age, without any hesitation or doubt in my own mind concerning anything that I have said, but in what remains to be said, I am dubious and divided in my own thoughts, which, as if they were laid in a balance, sometimes incline this and sometimes that way. I am therefore loath to persuade or dissuade in this matter, but I must venture to answer one question, which is this, whether we ought to admit those that make love to our sons to keep them company, or whether we should not rather thrust them out of doors and banish them from their society. For when I look upon those straightforward parents of a harsh and austere temper, who think it an outrage not to be endured that their sons should have anything to say to lovers, I am tender of being the persuader or encouraging of such a practice. But, on the other side, when I call to mind Socrates, and Plato, and Xenophon, and Aeschines, and Cebus, with an whole troop of other such men who have approved those masculine lovers, and still have brought up young men to learning, public employments, and virtuous living, I am again of another mind, and am much influenced by my zeal to imitate such great men. And the testimony also of Euripides is favorable to their opinion when he says, Another love there is in mortals found, the love of just and chaste and virtuous souls. And yet I think it is not improper here to mention withal that saying of Plato, spoken betwixt jest and earnest, that men of great eminence must be allowed to show affection to what beautiful objects they please, I would decide, then, that parents are to keep off such as make beauty the object of their affection, and admit altogether such as direct the love to the soul, whence such loves are to be avoided as are in Thebes and Ellis, and that sort which in Crete they call ravishment, armas, and such are to be imitated as are in Athens and Sparta. 16. But in this matter let every man follow his own judgment. Thus far I have discoursed concerning the right ordering and decent carriage of children. I will now pass thence to speak somewhat concerning the next age, that of youth. For I have often blamed the evil custom of some, 
who commit their boys in childhood to pedagogues and teachers, and then suffer the impetuosity of their youth to range without restraint, whereas boys of that age need to be kept under a stricter guard than children, for who does not know that the errors of childhood are small, and perfectly capable of being amended, such as slighting their pedagogues, or disobedience to their teachers' instructions, but when they begin to grow towards maturity, their offences are oftentimes very great and heinous, such as gluttony, pilfering money from their parents, dicing, revellings, drunkenness, courting of maidens, and defiling of marriage beds. Wherefore it is expedient that such impetuous heats should with great care be kept under and restrained. For the ripeness of that age admits no bounds in its pleasures. It is skittish, and needs a curb to check it, so that those parents who do not hold in their sons with great strength about that time find to their surprise that they are giving their vicious inclinations full swing in the pursuit of the vilest actions. Wherefore it is a duty incumbent upon wise parents, in that age especially, to set a strict watch upon them, and to keep them within the bounds of sobriety, by instructions, threatenings, entreaties, counsels, promises, and by laying before them examples of those men, on one side, who by immoderate love of pleasure have brought themselves into great mischief, and of those, on the other, who by abstinence in the pursuit of them have purchased to themselves very great praise and glory. For these two things, hope of honor and fear of punishment, are, in a sort, the first elements of virtue, the former whereof spurs men on the more eagerly to the pursuit of honest studies, while the latter blunts the edge of their inclinations to vicious courses. 17. And in sum, it is necessary to restrain young men from the conversation of debauched persons, lest they take infection from their evil examples. This was taught by Pythagoras in certain enigmatical sentences, which I shall here relate and expound, as being greatly useful to further virtuous inclinations. Such are these. Taste not of fish that have black tails. That is, converse not with men that are smutted with vicious qualities. Stride not over the beam of the scales, wherein he teaches us the regard we ought to have for justice, so as not to go beyond its measures. Sit not on a conix, wherein he forbids sloth, and requires us to take care to provide ourselves with the necessaries of life. Do not strike hands with every man. He means we ought not to be over hasty to make acquaintances or friendships with others. Wear not a tight ring, that is, we are to labor after a free and independent way of living, and to submit to no fetters. Stir not up the fire with a sword, signifying that we ought not to provoke a man more when he is angry already, since this is a most unseemly act. But we should rather comply with him while his passion is in its heat. Eat not thy heart, which forbids to afflict our souls and waste them with vexatious cares, abstain from beans, that is, keep out of public offices, for anciently the choice of the officers of state was made by beans. Put not food in a chamber-pot, wherein he declares that elegant discourse ought not to be put into an impure mind. For discourses is the food of the mind, which is rendered unclean by the foulness of the man who receives it. When men are arrived at the goal, they should not turn back. That is, those who are near the end of their days, and see the period of their lives approaching, ought to entertain it contentedly, and not to be grieved at it. But to return from this digression, our children, as I have said, are to be debarred from the company of all evil men, but especially flatterers, for I would still affirm what I have often said in the presence of diverse fathers, that there is not a more pestilent sort of men than these, nor any that more certainly and speedily hurry youth into precipices. Yea, 
they utterly ruin both fathers and sons, making the old age of the one and the youth of the other full of sorrow, while they cover the hook of their evil counsels with the unavoidable bait of voluptuousness. Parents, when they have good estates to leave their children, exhort them to sobriety, flatterers to drunkenness. Parents exhort to continence, these to lasciviousness. Parents to good husbandry, these to prodigality. Parents to industry, these to slothfulness. And they usually entertain them with such discourses as these. The whole life of man is but a point of time. Let us enjoy it, therefore, while it lasts, and not spend it to no purpose. Why should you so much regard the displeasure of your father, an old doting fool, with one foot already in the grave, and tis to be hoped it will not be long ere we carry him thither altogether? And some of them there are who procure young men foul harlots, yea, prostitute wives to them, and they even make a prey of those things which the careful fathers have provided for the sustenance of their old age, a cursed tribe, true friendships hypocrites. They have no knowledge of plain dealing and frank speech. They flatter the rich and despise the poor, and they seduce the young as by a musical charm. When those who feed them begin to laugh, then they grin and show their teeth. They are mere counterfeits bastard pretenders to humanity, living at the nod and beck of the rich, free by birth, yet slaves by choice, who always think themselves abused when they are not so, because they are not supported in idleness at others' cost. Wherefore, if fathers have any care for the good breeding of their children, they ought to drive such foul beasts as these out of doors, they ought also to keep them from the companionship of vicious schoolfellows, for these are able to corrupt the most ingenuous dispositions. 18. These counsels which I have now given are of great worth and importance. What I have now to add touches certain allowances that are to be made to human nature. Again, therefore, I would not have fathers of an over-rigid and harsh temper but so mild as to forgive some slips of youth, remembering that they themselves were once young. But as physicians are wont to mix their bitter medicines with sweet syrup to make what is pleasant a vehicle for what is wholesome, so should fathers temper the keenness of their reproofs with lenity. They may occasionally loosen the reins and allow their children to take some liberties they are inclined to, and again, when it is fit, manage them with a straighter bridle. But chiefly should they bear their errors without passion, if it may be, and if they chance to be heated more than ordinary, they ought not to suffer the flame to burn long. For it is better that a father's anger be hasty than severe, because the heaviness of his wrath, joined with implacableness, is no small argument of hatred toward the child. It is good also not to discover the notice they take of diverse faults, and to transfer to such cases the dimness of sight and hardness of hearing that are wont to accompany old age, so as sometimes not to hear what they hear, nor to see what they see, of their children's miscarriages. We used to bear with some failings in our friends, and it is no wonder if we do the like to our children especially when we sometimes overlook drunkenness in our very servants. Thou hast at times been too straight-handed to thy son. Make him at other whiles a larger allowance. Thou hast, it may be, been too angry with him. Pardon him the next fault to make him amends. He hath made use of a servant's wit to circumvent thee in something. Restrain thy anger. He hath made bold to take a yoke of oxen out of the pasture, or he hath come home smelling of his yesterday's drink. Take no notice of it, and if of ointments too, say nothing, for by this means the wild colt sometimes is made more tame. Besides, for those who are intemperate in their youthful lusts, 
and will not be amended by reproof, it is good to provide wives, for marriage is the strongest bond to hamper wild youth withal. But we must take care that the wives we procure for them be neither of too noble a birth, nor of too great a portion to suit their circumstances. For it is a wise saying, drive on your own track, whereas men that marry women, very much superior to themselves, are not so truly husbands to their wives, as they are unawares made slave to their portions. I will add a few words more, and put an end to these advices. The chiefest thing that fathers are to look to is that they themselves become effectual examples to their children by doing all those things which belong to them and avoiding all vicious practices, that in their lives, as in a glass, their children may see enough to give them an aversion to all ill words and actions. For those that chide children for such faults as they themselves fall into unconsciously, accuse themselves under their children's names, and if they are altogether vicious in their own lives, they lose the right of reprehending their very servants, and much more do they forfeit it toward their sons. Yea, what is more than that, they make themselves even counsellors and instructors to them in wickedness. For where old men are impudent, there of necessity must the young men be so too. Wherefore we are to apply our minds to all such practices as may conduce to the general breeding of our children. And here we may take example from Eurydice of Hierapolis, who, although she was an Illyrian, and so thrice a barbarian, yet applied herself to learning, when she was well advanced in years, that she might teach her children. Her love toward her children appears evidently in this epigram of hers, which she dedicated to the muses. Eurydice to the muses here doth raise this monument, her honest love to praise, who her grown sons, that she might scholars breed, then well in years, herself first learn to read. And thus I have finished the precepts, which I design to give concerning this subject, but that they should all be followed by any one reader is rather, I fear, to be wished than hoped, and to follow the greater part of them, though it may not be impossible to human nature, yet will need a concurrence of more than ordinary diligence joined with good fortune. End of section 4 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com Section 5 of The Morals, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Morals, Volume 1, by Plutarch. Translated by several hands, corrected and revised by William W. Goodwin. Concerning the Cure of Anger A Dialogue Part 1 Scylla Fundanus Those painters, O Fundanus, in my opinion do very wisely, who never finish any piece at the first sitting, but take a review of it at some convenient distance of time, because the eye, being relieved for a time, renews its power by making frequent and fresh judgments, and becomes able to observe many small and critical differences which continual poring and familiarity would prevent it from noticing. Now, because it cannot be that a man should stand off from himself and interrupt his consciousness, and then, after some interval, return to accost himself again, which is one principal reason why a man is a worse judge of himself than of other men, the next best course that a man can take will be to inspect his friends after some time of absence, 
and also to offer himself to their examination not to see whether he be grown old on the sudden or whether the habit of his body be become better or worse than it was before but that they may take notice of his manner and behavior whether in that time he hath made any advance in goodness or gained ground of his vices wherefore being after two years absence returned to rome and having since conversed with thee here again for these five months i think it no great matter of wonder that those good qualities which by the advantage of a good natural disposition you were formerly possessed of have in this time received so considerable an increase but truly when i behold how that vehement and fiery disposition which you had to anger is now through the conduct of reason become so gentle and tractable my mind prompts me to say with homer o oh wonder how much gentler is he grown nor hath this gentleness produced in thee any laziness or irresolution but like cultivation in the earth it hath caused an evenness and a profundity very effectual unto fruitful action instead of thy former vehemency and over eagerness and therefore it is evident that thy former proneness to anger hath not been withered in thee by any decay of vigor which age might have effected or spontaneously but that it hath been cured by making use of some mollifying precepts and indeed to tell you the truth when i heard our friend eros say the same thing i had a suspicion that he did not report the thing as it was but that out of mere good will he testified those things of you which ought to be found in every good and virtuous man and yet you know he cannot be easily induced to depart from what he judges to be true in order to favor any man but now truly as i acquit him of having therein made any false report of thee so i desire thee being now at leisure from thy journey to declare unto us the means and as it were the medicine by use whereof thou hast brought thy mind to be thus manageable and natural thus gentle and obedient unto reason fundanus but in the meanwhile o most kind scylla you had best beware lest you also through affection and friendship may be somewhat careless in making an estimate of my affairs for eris having himself also a mind oft times unable to keep its ground and to contain itself within that obedience which homer mentions but subject to be exasperated through an hatred of men's wickedness may perhaps think i am grown more mild just as in music when the key is changed that note which before was the bass becomes a higher note with respect to others which are now below it scylla neither of these is so fundanus but i pray you gratify us all by granting the request i made this then o scylla is one of those excellent rules given by musonius which i bear in memory that those who would be in sound health must physic themselves all their lives now i do not think that reason cures like hellebore by purging out itself together with the disease it cures but by keeping possession of the soul and so governing and guarding its judgments for the power of reason is not like drugs but like wholesome food and with the assistance of a good natural disposition it produceth a healthful constitution in all with whom it hath become familiar and as for those good exhortations and admonitions which are applied to passions while they swell and are at their height they work but slowly and with small success and they differ in nothing from those strong smelling things 
which indeed do serve to put those that have the falling sickness upon their legs again after they are fallen but are not able to remove the disease for whereas other passions even when they are in their rough and acme do in some sort yield and admit reason into the soul which comes to help it from without anger does not as melanthius says displace the mind and then act dismal things but it absolutely turns the mind out of doors and bolts the door against it and like those who burn their houses and themselves within them it makes all things within full of confusion smoke and noise so that the soul can neither see nor hear anything that might relieve it wherefore sooner will an empty ship in a storm at sea admit of a pilot from without than a man tossed with anger and rage listen to the advice of another unless he have his own reason first prepared to entertain it but as those who expect to be besieged are wont to gather together and lay in provisions of such things as they are like to need not trusting to hopes of relief from without so ought it to be our special concern to fetch in from philosophy such foreign helps as it affords against anger and to store them up in the soul beforehand seeing that it will not be so easy a matter to provide ourselves when the time is come for using them for either the soul cannot hear what is spoken without by reason of the tumult unless it have its own reason like the director of the rowers in a ship ready to entertain and understand whatsoever precept shall be given or if it do chance to hear yet will it be ready to despise what is patiently and mildly offered and to be exasperated by what shall be pressed upon it with more vehemency for since wrath is proud and self-conceited and utterly averse from compliance with others like a fortified and guarded tyranny that which is to overthrow it must be bred within it and be of its own household now the continuance of anger and frequent fits of it produce an evil habit in the soul called wrathfulness or a propensity to be angry which oft times ends in choleric temper bitterness and moroseness then the mind becomes ulcerated peevish and querulous and like a thin weak plate of iron receives impression and is wounded by even the least occurrence but when the judgment presently seizes upon wrathful ebullitions and suppresses them it not only works a cure for the present but renders the soul firm and not so liable to such impressions for the future and truly when i myself had twice or thrice made a resolute resistance unto anger the like befell me that did the thebans who having once foiled the lacedaemonians that before that time had held themselves invincible never after lost so much as one battle which they fought against them for i became fully assured in my mind that anger might be overcome by the use of reason and i perceived that it might not only be quieted by the sprinkling of cold water as aristotle relates but also be extinguished by putting one into a fright yea according to homer many men have had their anger melted and dissipated by sudden surprise of joy so that i came to this firm resolution that this passion is not altogether incurable to such as are but willing to be cured since the beginnings and occasions of it are not always great or forcible but a scoff or a jest or the laughing at one or a nod only or some other matter of no great importance will put many men into a passion thus helen 
by addressing her niece in the words beginning o my electra now a virgin stale provoked her to make this nipping return thou'rt wise too late thou shouldst have kept at home and so did callisthenes provoke alexander by saying when the great bowl was going round i will not drink so deep in honor of alexander as to make work for aesculapius as therefore it is an easy matter to stop the fire that is kindled only in hare's wool candlewick or a little chaff but if it have once taken hold of matter that hath solidity and thickness it soon inflames and consumes as aeschylus says with youthful vigor the carpenter's lofty work so he that observes anger while it is in its beginning and sees it by degrees smoking and taking fire from some speech or chaff-like scurrility need take no great pains to extinguish it but oftentimes can put an end to it only by silence or neglect for as he that adds no fuel to the fire hath already as good as put it out so he that doth not feed anger at the first nor blow the fire in himself hath prevented and destroyed it wherefore hieronymus although he taught many other useful things yet hath given me no satisfaction in saying that anger is not perceptible in its birth by reason of its suddenness but only after its birth and while it lives for there is no other passion while it is gathering and stirring up which hath its rise and increase so conspicuous and observable this is very skilfully taught by homer by making achilles suddenly surprised with grief as soon as ever the word fell on his ear saying of him this said a sable cloud of grief covered him o'er but making agamemnon grow angry slowly and need many words to inflame him so that if these had been stopped and forbidden when they began the contest had never grown to that degree and greatness which it did wherefore socrates as oft as he perceived any fierceness of spirit to rise within him towards any of his friends setting himself like a promontory to break the waves would speak with a lower voice bear a smiling countenance and look with a more gentle eye and thus by bending the other way and moving contrary to the passion he kept himself from falling or being worsted for the first way my friend to suppress anger as you would a tyrant is not to obey or yield to it when it commands us to speak high to look fiercely and to beat ourselves but to be quiet and not increase the passion as we do a disease by impatient tossing and crying out it is true that lovers practices such as reveling singing crowning the door with garlands have a kind of alleviation in them which is neither rude nor unpleasing coming i asked not who or who she was but kissed her door full sweetly that i wot if this be sin to sin i can but choose so the weeping and lamentation which we permit in mourners doubtless carry forth much of the grief together with the tears but anger quite on the contrary is more inflamed by what the angry persons say or do the best course then is for a man to compose himself or else to run away and hide himself and retreat into quiet as into an haven as if he perceived a fit of epilepsy coming on lest he fall or rather fall upon others and truly we do most and most frequently fall upon our friends for we neither love all nor envy all nor fear all men 
but there is nothing untouched and unset upon by anger we are angry with our foes and with our friends with our own children and our parents nay with the gods above and the very beasts below us and instruments that have no life as thamorus was his horn though bound with gold he break in sire he break his melodious and well-strung lyre and pandarus wishing a curse upon himself if he did not burn his bow first broken by his hands but xerxes dealt blows and marks of his displeasure to the sea itself and sent his letters to the mountain in the style ensuing o oh, thou wretched athos whose top now reaches to the skies i charge thee put not in the way of my works stones too big and difficult to be wrought if thou do i will cut thee into pieces and cast thee into the sea for anger hath many terrible effects and many also that are ridiculous and therefore of all passions this of anger is most hated and most contemned and it is good to consider it in both respects i therefore whether rightly or not i know not began this cure with learning the nature of anger by beholding it in other men as the lacedaemonians learned what drunkenness was by seeing it in the helots and in the first place as hippocrates said that that was the most dangerous disease which made the sick man's countenance most unlike to what it was so i observed that men transported with anger also exceedingly change their visage color gait and voice accordingly i formed a kind of image of that passion to myself withal conceiving great indignation against myself if i should at any time appear to my friends or to my wife and daughters so terrible and discomposed not only with so wild and strange a look but also with so fierce and harsh a voice as i had met with in some others of my acquaintance who by reason of anger were not able to observe either good manners or countenance or graceful speech or even their persuasiveness and affability in conversation wherefore caius gracchus the orator being of a rugged disposition and a passionate kind of speaker had a pipe made for him such as musicians use to vary their voice higher or lower by degrees and with this pipe his servant stood behind him while he pronounced and gave him a mild and gentle note whereby he took him down from his loudness and took off the harshness and angriness of his voice assuaging and charming the anger of the orator as their shrill wax-joined reed who herds do keep sounds forth sweet measures which invite to sleep for my own part had i a careful and pleasant companion who would show me my angry face in a glass i should not at all take it ill in like manner some are wont to have a looking-glass held to them after they have bathed though to little purpose but to behold one's self unnaturally disguised and disordered will conduce not a little to the impeachment of anger for those who delight in pleasant fables tell us that minerva herself playing on a pipe was thus admonished by a satyr that look becomes you not lay down your pipes and take your arms and set your cheeks to rights but would not regard it yet when by chance she beheld the mean of her countenance in a river she was moved with indignation and cast her pipes away and yet here art had the delight of melody 
to comfort her for the deformity and marsyas as it seems did with a kind of muzzle and mouthpiece restrain by force the too horrible eruption of his breath when he played and so corrected and concealed the distortion of his visage with shining gold he girt his temples rough and his wide mouth with thongs that tied behind now anger doth swell and puff up the countenance very indecently and sends forth a yet more indecent and unpleasant voice moving the heart-strings which should be at rest for when the sea is tossed and troubled with winds and casts up moss and seaweed they say it is purged but those impure bitter and vain words which anger throws up when the soul has become a kind of whirlpool defile the speakers in the first place and fill them with dishonor arguing them to have always had such things in them and to be full of them only now they are discovered to have them by their anger so for a mere word the lightest of things as plato says they undergo the heaviest of punishments being ever after accounted enemies evil speakers and of a malignant disposition while now i see all this and bear it in mind the thought occurs to me and i naturally consider by myself that as it is good for one in a fever so much better is it for one in anger to have his tongue soft and smooth for if the tongue in a fever be unnaturally affected it is indeed an evil symptom but not a cause of harm but when the tongue of angry men becomes rough and foul and breaks out into absurd speeches it produces insults which work irreconcilable hatred and proves that a poisonous malevolence lies festering within for wine does not make men vent anything so impure and odious as anger doth and besides what proceeds from wine is matter for jest and laughter but that from anger is mixed with gall and bitterness and he that is silent in his cups is counted a burthen and a bore to the company whereas in anger there is nothing more commended than peace and silence as sappho adviseth when anger once is spread within thy breast shut up thy tongue that vainly barking beast nor doth the constant observation of ourselves in anger minister these things only to our consideration but it also gives us to understand another natural property of anger how disingenuous and unmanly a thing it is and how far from true wisdom and greatness of mind yet the vulgar account the angry man's turbulence to be his activity his loud threats to argue boldness and his refractoriness strength as also some mistake his cruelty for an undertaking of great matters his implacableness for a firmness of resolution and his morosity for an hatred of that which is evil for in truth both the deeds and motions and the whole mean of angry men do accuse them of much littleness and infirmity not only when they vex little children scold silly women and think dogs and horses and asses worthy of their anger and deserving to be punished as tessaphon the pancratiast who vouchsafed to kick the ass that had kicked him first but even in their tyrannical slaughters their mean-spiritedness appearing in their bitterness and their suffering exhibited outwardly in their actions are but like to the biting of serpents who when they themselves become burnt and full of pain violently thrust the venom that inflames them from themselves into those that have hurt them 
for as a great blow causes a great swelling in the flesh so in the softest souls the giving way to a passion for hurting others like a stroke on the soul doth make it to swell with anger and all the more the greater is its weakness for this cause it is that women are more apt to be angry than men are and sick persons than the healthful and old men than those who are in their perfect age and strength and men in misery than such as prosper for the covetous man is most prone to be angry with his steward the glutton with his cook the jealous man with his wife the vainglorious person with him that speaks ill of him but of all men there are none so exceedingly disposed to be angry as those who are ambitious of honor and affect to carry on a faction in a city which according to pindar is but a splendid vexation in like manner from the great grief and suffering of the soul through weakness especially there ariseth anger which is not like the nerves of the soul as one spake but like its straining and convulsive motions when it vehemently stirs itself up in its desires and endeavors of revenge indeed such evil examples as these afford us speculations which are necessary though not pleasant but now from those who have carried themselves mildly and gently in their anger i shall present you with most excellent sayings and beautiful contemplations and i begin to contemn such as say you have wronged a man indeed and is a man to bear this stamp on his neck tread him down in the dirt and such like provoking speeches whereby some do very unhandsomely translate and remove anger from the women's to the men's apartment for fortitude which in other respects agrees with justice seems only to disagree in respect of mildness which she claims as more properly her own for it sometimes befalls even worser men to bear rule over those who are better than themselves but to erect a trophy in the soul against anger which heraclitus says it is an hard thing to fight against because whatever it resolves to have it buys at no less a price than the soul itself is that which none but a great and victorious power is able to achieve since that alone can bind and curb the passions by its decrees as with nerves and tendons wherefore i always strive to collect and read not only the sayings and deeds of philosophers who wise men say had no gall in them but especially those of kings and tyrants of this sort was the saying of antigonus to his soldiers when as some were reviling him near his tent supposing that he had not heard them he stretched his staff out of the tent and said what will you not stand somewhere farther off while you revile me so was that of arcadio the achaean who was ever speaking ill of philip exhorting men to flee till they should come where none would philip know when afterwards by some accident he appeared in macedonia philip's friends were of opinion that he ought not to be suffered but be punished but philip meeting him and speaking courteously to him and then sending him gifts particularly such as were wont to be given to strangers bade him learn for the time to come what to speak of him to the greeks and when all testified that the man was become a great praiser of philip even to admiration you see said philip i am a better physician than you and when he had been reproached at the olympic solemnities and some said it was fit to make the grecians smart 
and rue it for reviling philip who had dealt well with them what then said he will they do if i make them smart those things also which pisistratus did to thrasybulus and porcina to mutius were bravely done and so was that of magus to philemon for having been by him exposed to laughter in a comedy on the public stage in these words magus the king hath sent thee letters unhappy magus thou dost know no letters and having taken philemon as he was by a tempest cast on shore at peritoneum he commanded a soldier only to touch his neck with his naked sword and to go quietly away and then having sent him a ball and hucklebones as if he were a child that wanted understanding he dismissed him ptolemy was once jeering a grammarian for his want of learning and asked him who was the father of peleus i will answer you quoth he if you will tell me first who was the father of lagus this jeer gave the king a rub for the obscurity of his birth whereat all were moved with indignation as a thing not to be endured but said ptolemy if it is not fit for a king to be jeered then no more is it fit for him to jeer others but alexander was more severe than he was wont in his carriage towards callisthenes and clytus wherefore porus being taken captive by him desired him to treat him like a king and when alexander asked him if he desired no more he answered when i say like a king i have comprised all and hence it is that they call the king of the gods meolichius while the athenians i think call him meamactes but the office of punishing they ascribe to the furies and evil genii never giving it the epithet of divine or heavenly end of section five part one recording by lucretia b section six of the morals volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the morals volume one by plutarch translated by several hands corrected and revised by william w goodwin concerning the cure of anger a dialogue part two as therefore one said of philip when he raised the city of olynthus but he is not able to build such another city so may it be said to anger thou canst overthrow and destroy and cut down but to restore to save to spare and to bear with is the work of gentleness and moderation of a camillus a metellus an aristides and a socrates but to strike the sting into one and to bite is the part of pismires and horseflies and truly while i well consider revenge i find that the way which anger takes for it proves for the most part ineffectual being spent in biting the lips gnashing the teeth vain assaults and railings full of silly threats and then it acts like children in a race who for want of governing themselves tumble down ridiculously before they come to the goal towards which they are hastening hence that rhodian said not amiss to the servant of the roman general who spake loudly and fiercely to him it matters not much what thou sayest but what this your master in silence thinks and sophocles having introduced neoptolemus and eurypylus in full armor gave a high commendation of them when he said 
into the hosts of brazen armed men each boldly charged but ne'er reviled his foe some indeed of the barbarians poison their swords but true valor has no need of collar as being dipped in reason but anger and fury are weak and easily broken wherefore the lacedaemonians are wont by the sound of pipes to take off the edge of anger from their soldiers when they fight and before they go to battle to sacrifice to the muses that they may have the steady use of their reason and when they have put their enemies to flight they pursue them not but sound a retreat as it were to their wrath which like a short dagger can be easily handled and drawn back but anger makes slaughter of thousands before it can avenge itself as it did of cyrus and pelopidas the theban agathocles being reviled by some whom he besieged bore it with mildness and when one said to him o potter whence wilt thou have pay for thy mercenary soldiers he answered with laughter from your city if i can take it and when some one from the wall derided antigonus for his deformity he answered i thought surely i had a handsome face and when he had taken the city he sold those for slaves who had scoffed at him protesting that if they reviled him so again he would call them to account before their masters furthermore i observe that hunters and orators are wont to be much foiled by anger aristotle reports that the friends of satyrus once stopped his ears with wax when he was to plead a cause so that he might not confound the matter through anger at the revilings of his enemies do we not ourselves oftentimes miss of punishing an offending servant because he runs away from us in fright when he hears our threatening words that therefore which nurses say to little children do not cry and thou shalt have it may not unfitly be applied to our mind when angry be not hasty neither speak too loud nor be too urgent and so what you desire will be sooner and better accomplished for as a father when he sees his son about to cleave or cut something with an hatchet takes the hatchet himself and doth it for him so one taking the work of revenge out of the hand of anger doth himself without danger or hurt yea with profit also inflict punishment on him that deserves it and not on himself instead of him as anger oft times doth now whereas all passions do stand in need of discipline which by exercise tames and subdues their unreasonableness and stubbornness there is none about which we have more need to be exercised in reference to servants than that of anger for neither do we envy nor fear them nor have we any competition for honor with them but we have frequent fits of anger with them which cause many offenses and errors by reason of the very power possessed by us as masters and which brings us easily to the ground as if we stood in a slippery place with no one standing by to save us for it is impossible to keep an irresponsible power from offending in the excitement of passion unless we gird up that great power with gentleness and can slight the frequent speeches of wife and friends accusing us of remissness and indeed i myself have by nothing more than by such speeches been incensed against my servants as if they were spoiled for want of beating and truly it was late before i came to understand that it was better that servants should be something the worse by indulgence than that one should distort himself through wrath and bitterness for the amendment of others and secondly observing that many by this very impunity have been brought to be ashamed to be wicked and have begun their change to virtue more from being pardoned than from being punished and that they have obeyed some upon their nod only peaceably and more willingly than they have done others with all their beating and scourging i became persuaded of this that reason was fitter to govern with than anger for it is not as the poet said wherever fear is there is modesty but on the contrary it is in the modest 
that the fear is bred which produces moderation whereas continual and unmerciful beating doth not make men repent of doing evil but only devise plans for doing it without being detected and in the third place i always remember and consider with myself that as he who taught us the art of shooting did not forbid us to shoot but only to shoot amiss so no more can it be any hindrance from punishing to teach us how we may do it seasonably and moderately with benefit and decency i therefore strive to put away anger especially by not denying the punished a liberty to plead for themselves but granting them an hearing for time gives a breathing space unto passion and a delay which mitigates and dissolves it and a man's judgment in the meanwhile finds out both a becoming manner and a proportionable measure of punishing and moreover hereby he that is punished hath not any pretense left him to object against the correction given him if he is punished not out of anger but by being first himself convinced of his fault and finally we are here saved from the greatest disgrace of all for by this means the servant will not seem to speak more just things than the master as therefore phocian after the death of alexander to hinder the athenians from rising too soon or believing it too hastily said o athenians if he is dead to-day he will be so to-morrow and on the next day after that in like manner do i judge one ought to suggest to himself who through anger is making haste to punish if it is true to-day that he hath thus wronged thee it will be true to-morrow and on the next day also nor will there be any inconvenience follow upon the deferring of his punishment for a while but if he is punished all in haste he will ever after seem to have been innocent as it hath oftentimes fallen out heretofore for which of us all is so cruel as to torment or scourge a servant because five or ten days before he burnt the meat or overturned the table or did not soon enough what he was bidden and yet it is for just such things as these while they are fresh and newly done that we are so disordered and become cruel and implacable for as bodies through a mist so actions through anger seem greater than they are wherefore we ought speedily to recall such considerations as these are to our mind and when we are unquestionably out of passion if then to a pure and composed reason the deed do appear to be wicked we ought to animadvert and no longer neglect or abstain from punishment as if we had lost our appetite for it for there is nothing to which we can more justly impute men's punishing others in their anger than to a habit of not punishing them when their anger is over but growing remiss and doing like lazy mariners who in fair weather keep loitering within the haven and then put themselves in danger by setting sail when the wind blows strong so we likewise condemning the remissness and overcomeness of our reason in punishing make haste to do it while our anger is up pushing us forward like a dangerous wind he that useth food doth it to gratify his hunger which is natural but he that inflicts punishment should do it without either hungering or thirsting after it not needing anger like sauce to whet him on to punish but when he is farthest off from desiring it then he should do it as a deed of necessity under the guidance of reason and though aristotle reports that in his time servants in etruria were wont to be scourged while the music played yet they who punish others ought not to be carried on with a desire of punishing as of a thing they delight in nor to rejoice when they punish and then repent of it when they have done whereof the first is savage the last is womanish but without either sorrow or pleasure they should inflict just punishment when reason is free to judge leaving no pretense for anger to intermeddle but this perhaps may seem to be not a cure of anger but only a thrusting by and avoiding of such miscarriages as some men fall into when they are angry 
and yet as hieronymus tells us although the swelling of the spleen is but a symptom of the fever the assuaging thereof abates the disease but considering well the origin of anger itself i have observed that divers men fall into anger from different causes and yet in the minds of all of them was probably an opinion of being despised and neglected we must therefore assist those who would avoid anger by removing the act which roused their anger as far as possible from all suspicion of contempt or insult and by imputing it rather to folly or necessity or disorder of mind or to the misadventure of those that did it thus sophocles in antigone the best resolved mind in misery can't keep its ground but suffers ecstasy and so agamemnon ascribing to ate the taking away of briseis adds since i so foolish was as thee to wrong i'll please thee now and give thee splendid gifts for supplication is an act of one who is far from contemning and when he that hath done an injury appears submissive he thereby removes all suspicion of contempt but he that is moved to anger must not expect or wait for such a submission but must rather take to himself the saying of diogenes who when one said to him they deride thee o diogenes made answer but i am not derided and he must not think himself contemned but rather himself contemn that man that offends him as one acting out of weakness or error rashness or carelessness rudeness or dotage or childishness but above all we must bear with our servants and friends herein for surely they do not despise us as being impotent or slothful but they think less of us by reason of our very moderation or good will towards them some because we are gentle others because we are loving towards them but now alas out of a surmise that we are contemned we not only become exasperated against our wives our servants and friends but we oftentimes fall out also with drunken innkeepers and mariners and ostlers and all out of a suspicion that they despise us yea we quarrel with dogs because they bark at us and assess if they chance to rush against us like him who was going to beat a driver of asses but when the latter cried out i am an athenian fell to beating the ass saying thou surely art not an athenian too and so accosted him with many a bastinado and especially self-love and morosity together with luxury and effeminacy breed in us long and frequent fits of anger which by little and little are gathered together into our souls like a swarm of bees or wasps wherefore there is nothing more conducing to a gentle behavior towards our wife and servants and friends than contentedness and simplicity if we can be satisfied with what we have and not stand in need of many superfluities whereas the man described in the poet who never is content with boiled or roast nor likes his meat what way soever dressed who can never drink unless he have snow by him or eat bread if it be bought in the market or taste victuals out of a mean or earthen vessel or sleep on a bed unless it be swelled and puffed up with feathers like to the sea when it is heaved up from the bottom but who with cudgels and blows with running calling and sweating doth hasten his servitors that wait at table as if they were sent for plasters for some inflamed ulcer he being slave to a weak morose and fault-finding style of life doth as it were by a continual cough or many buffetings breed in himself before he is aware an ulcerous and defluxive disposition unto anger and therefore the body is to be accustomed to contentment by frugality and so be made sufficient for itself for they who need but few things are not disappointed of many and it is no hard matter beginning with our food to accept quietly whatever is sent to us and not by being angry and querulous at everything 
to entertain ourselves and our friends with the most unpleasant dish of all which is anger and surely than that supper not can more unpleasant be where the servants are beaten and the wife railed at because something is burnt or smoked or not salt enough or because the bread is too cold arcesilus was once entertaining his friends and some strangers at a feast the supper was set on the board but there wanted bread the servants having it seems neglected to buy any now on such an occasion which of us would not have rent the very walls with outcries but he smiling said only what a fine thing it is for a philosopher to be a jolly feaster once also when socrates took euthydemus from the wrestling house home with him to supper his wife xantippe fell upon him in a pelting chase scolding him and in conclusion overthrew the table whereupon euthydemus rose up and went his way being very much troubled at what had happened but socrates said to him did not a hen at your house the other day come flying in and do the like and yet i was not troubled at it for friends are to be entertained by good nature by smiles and by a hospitable welcome not by knitting brows or by striking horror and trembling into those that serve we must also accustom ourselves to the use of any cups indifferently and not to use one rather than another as some are wont to single some one cup out of many as they say marius used to do or else a drinking horn and to drink out of none but that and they do the same with oil glasses and brushes affecting one above all the rest and when any one of these chances to be broken or lost then they take it heinously and punish severely those that did it and therefore he that is prone to be angry should refrain from such things as are rare and curiously wrought such as cups and seals and precious stones for such things distract a man by their loss more than cheap and ordinary things are apt to do wherefore when nero had made an octagonal tent a wonderful spectacle for cost and beauty seneca said to him you have proved yourself to be a poor man for if you chance to lose this you cannot tell where to get such another and indeed it so fell out that the ship was sunk and this tent was lost with it but nero remembering the words of seneca bore the loss of it with greater moderation but this contentedness in other matters doth make a man good-tempered and gentle towards his servants and if towards servants then doubtless towards friends and subjects also we see also that newly bought servants inquire concerning him that bought them not whether he be superstitious or envious but whether he be an angry man or not and that universally neither men can endure their wives though chaste nor women their husbands though kind if they be ill-tempered withal nor friends the conversation of one another and so neither wedlock nor friendship with anger is to be endured but if anger be away even drunkenness itself is counted a light matter for the fair rule of bacchus is a sufficient chastiser of a drunken man if the addition of anger do not change the god of wine from lyaeus and choraeus the loser of cares and the leader of dances to the savage and furious deity and antisera with its hellebore is of itself able to cure simple madness but madness mixed with anger furnishes matter for tragedies and dismal stories neither ought any even in their playing and jesting to give way to their anger for it turns good will into hatred nor when they are disputing for it turns a desire of knowing truth into a love of contention nor when they sit in judgment for it adds violence to authority nor when they are teaching for it dulls the learner and breeds in him a hatred of all learning nor if they be in prosperity for it increases envy nor if in adversity for it makes them to be unpitied if they are morose and apt to quarrel with those who commiserate them as priam did be gone ye upbraiding scoundrels haven't ye at home enough that to help bear my grief ye come 
on the other hand good temper doth remedy some things put an ornament upon others and sweeten others and it wholly overcomes all anger and moroseness by gentleness as may be seen in that excellent example of euclid who when his brother had said in a quarrel let me perish if i be not avenged of you replied and let me perish if i do not persuade you into a better mind and by so saying he straightway diverted him from his purpose and changed his mind and Polyman, being reviled by one that loved precious stones well and was even sick with the love of costly signets answered nothing but noticed one of the signets which the man wore and looked wistfully upon it whereat the man being pleased said not so Polyman, but look upon it in the sunshine and it will appear much better to you and aristippus when there happened to be a falling out between him and Escanes, and one said to him o oh, aristippus what is now become of the friendship that was between you two answered it is asleep but i will go and awaken it then coming to Escanes, he said to him what dost thou take me to be so utterly wretched and incurable as not to be worth thy admonition no wonder said Escanes, if thou by nature so excelling me in every thing didst here also discern before me what was right and fitting to be done a woman's nay a little child's soft hand with gentle stroking easier doth command and make the bristling boar to couch and fall than any boisterous wrestler of them all but we that can tame wild beasts and make them gentle carrying young wolves and the whelps of lions in our arms do in a fit of anger cast our own children friends and companions out of our embraces and we let loose our wrath like a wild beast upon our servants and fellow-citizens and we but poorly disguise our rage when we give it the specious name of zeal against wickedness and it is with this i suppose as with other passions and diseases of the soul although we call one forethought another liberality another piety we cannot so acquit and clear ourselves of any of them and as zeno has said that the seed was a mixture drawn from all the powers of the soul in like manner anger seems to be a kind of universal seed extracted from all the passions for it is taken from grief and pleasure and insolence and then from envy it hath the evil property of rejoicing at another's adversity and it is even worse than murder itself for it doth not strive to free itself from suffering but to bring mischief to itself if it may thereby but do another man an evil turn and it hath the most odious kind of desire inbred in it if the appetite for grieving and hurting another may be called a desire wherefore when we go to the houses of drunkards we may hear a wench playing the flute betimes in the morning and behold there as one said the muddy dregs of wine and scattered fragments of garlands and servants drunk at the door and the marks of angry and surly men may be read in the faces brands and fetters of the servants but lamentation is the only bard that is always to be heard beneath the roof of an angry man while his stewards are beaten and his maid servants tormented so that the spectators in the midst of their mirth and delight cannot but pity those sad effects of anger and even those who out of a real hatred of wickedness often happen to be surprised with anger can abate the excess and vehemence of it so soon as they give up their excessive confidence in those with whom they converse for of all causes this doth most increase anger when one proves to be wicked whom we took for a good man or when one who we thought had loved us falls into some difference and chiding with us as for my own disposition thou knowest very well with how strong inclinations it is carried to show kindness to men and to confide in them and therefore like those who miss their step and tread on nothing when i most of all trust to men's love and as it were prop myself up with it 
i do then most of all miss carry and finding myself disappointed am troubled at it and indeed i should never succeed in freeing myself from this too great eagerness and forwardness in my love but against excessive confidence perhaps i can make use of plato's caution for a bridle for he said that he so commended helicon the mathematician because he thought him a naturally versatile animal but that he had a jealousy of those who had been well educated in the city lest being men and the offspring of men they should in something or other discover the infirmity of their nature but when sophocles says if you search the deeds of mortals you will find the most are base he seems to insult and disparage us overmuch still even such a harsh and censorious judgment as this may make us more moderate in our anger for it is the sudden and the unexpected which do most drive us to frenzy but we ought as panaceus somewhere said to imitate anaxagoras and as he said upon the death of his son i knew before that i had begotten but a mortal so should every one of us use expressions like these of those offences which stir up to anger i knew when i bought my servant that i was not buying a philosopher i knew that i did not get a friend that had no passions i knew that i had a wife that was but a woman but if every one would always repeat the question of plato to himself but am not i perhaps such a one myself and turn his reason from abroad to look into himself and put restraint upon his reprehension of others he would not make so much use of his hatred of evil in reproving other men seeing himself to stand in need of great indulgence but now every one of us when he is angry and punishing can bring the words of aristides and of cato do not steal do not lie and why are ye so slothful and what is most truly shameful of all we do in our anger reprove others for being angry and what was done amiss through anger we punish in our passion therein not acting like physicians who purge bitter choler with a bitter pill but rather increasing and exasperating the disease which we pretend to cure while therefore i am thus reasoning with myself i endeavour also to abate something of my curiosity because for any one over curiously to inquire and pry into everything and to make a public business of every employment of a servant every action of a friend every pastime of a son every whispering of a wife causes great and long and daily fits of anger whereof the product and issue is a peevish and morose disposition wherefore god as euripides says affairs of greatest weight himself directeth but matters small to fortune he committeth but i think a prudent man ought not to commit anything at all to fortune nor to neglect anything but to trust and commit some things to his wife some things to his servants and some things to his friends as a prince to certain vicegerents and accountants and administrators while he himself is employing his reason about the weightiest matters and those of greatest concern for as small letters hurt the sight so do small matters him that is too much intent upon them they vex and stir up anger which begets an evil habit in him in reference to greater affairs but above all the rest i look on that of empedocles as a divine thing to fast from evil and i commended also those vows and professions made in prayers as things neither indecent in themselves nor unbecoming a philosopher for a whole year to abstain from venery and wine serving god with temperance all the while or else again for a certain time to abstain from lying minding and watching over ourselves that we speak nothing but what is true either in earnest or in jest after the manner of these vows then i made my own supposing it would be no less acceptable to god and sacred than theirs and i set myself first to observe a few sacred days also 
wherein I would abstain from being angry, as if it were from being drunk or from drinking wine, celebrating a kind of nephalia and melisponda with respect to my anger. Footnote. Nephalia were wineless offerings, like those to the Eumenides. Melisponda were offerings of honey. End footnote. Then, making trial of myself little by little for a month or two, I by this means in time made some good progress unto further patience in bearing evils, diligently observing and keeping myself courteous in language and behavior, free from anger and pure from all wicked words and absurd actions, and from passion, which for a little, and that no grateful pleasure, brings with itself great perturbations and shameful repentance. Whence experience, not without some divine assistance, hath, I suppose, made it evident that there was a very true judgment and assertion, that this courteous, gentle, and kindly disposition and behavior is not so acceptable, so pleasing, and so delightful to any of those with whom we converse as it is to those that have it. End of section 6 Recording by Lucretia B. Section 7 of The Morals, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wendy Almeida. The Morals, Volume 1 by Plutarch. Translated by Several Hands. Corrected and revised by William W. Goodwin. Of Bashfulness. 1. Some plants there are, in their own nature wild and barren, and hurtful to seed and garden sets, which yet among able husbandmen pass for infallible signs of a rich and promising soil. In like manner some passions of the mind, not good in themselves, yet serve as first shoots and promises of a disposition which is naturally good and also capable of much improvement by cultivation. Among these I rank bashfulness, the subject of our present discourse. No ill sign, indeed, but the cause and occasion of a great deal of harm. For the bashful oftentimes run into the same enormities as the most hardened and impudent, with this difference only, that the former feel a regret for such miscarriages, but the latter take a pleasure and satisfaction therein. The shameless person is without sense of grief for his baseness, and the bashful is in distress at the very appearance of it. For bashfulness is only modesty in the excess, and is aptly enough named dusopia, the being put out of countenance, since the face is in some sense confused and dejected with the mind. For as that grief which casts down the eyes is termed dejection, so that kind of modesty which cannot look another in the face is called bashfulness. The orator, speaking of a shameless fellow, said he carried harlots, not virgins, in his eyes. On the other hand, the sheepishly bashful betrays no less the effeminacy and softness of his mind in his looks, palliating his weakness, which exposes him to the mercy of impudence, with the specious name of modesty. Cato, indeed, was wont to say of young persons he had a greater opinion of such as were subject to color than of those that looked pale teaching us thereby to look with greater apprehension on the heinousness of an action than on the reprimand which might follow, and to be more afraid of the suspicion of doing an ill thing than of the danger of it. However, too much anxiety and timidity lest we may do wrong is also to be avoided, because many men have become cowards and been deterred from generous undertakings no less for fear than by the danger or difficulty of such attempts. 2. While therefore we must not suffer the weakness in the one case to pass unnoticed, neither must we abet or countenance invincible impudence in the other, 
such as is reported of Anaxarchus, whose dog-like carriage and effrontery, despising infamy, outfaced disgrace. A convenient mean between both is rather to be endeavoured after by repressing the over-impudent and animating the too meek temper. But as this kind of cure is difficult, so is the restraining such excesses not without danger. For as a gardener in stubbing up some wild or useless bushes makes at them carelessly with his spade or burns them off the ground, but in dressing a vine or grafting an apple or pruning an olive carries his hand with the greatest wariness and deliberation that he may not unluckily injure the tree so a philosopher in removing envy that useless and untractable plant or covetousness or immoderate love of pleasure from the mind of youth may cut deep safely and make a large scar but if he be to apply his discourse to some more sensible or delicate part such as the restraining excess of bashfulness it lies upon him to be very careful not to cut off or eradicate modesty with the contrary vice for nurses who too often wipe away the dirt from their infants are apt to tear their flesh and put them to pain and in like manner we must not so far extirpate all bashfulness in youth as to leave them careless or impudent but as those that pull down private houses adjoining to the temples of the gods prop up such parts as are contiguous to them so in undermining bashfulness due regard is to be had to adjacent modesty good nature and humanity and yet these are the very qualities by which bashfulness insinuates itself and becomes fixed in a man flattering him that he is good-natured courteous and civil and has common sense and that he is not obstinate and inexorable the stoics therefore in their discourses of modesty distinguish all along betwixt that and bashfulness leaving not so much as ambiguity of terms for a pretence to the vice however asking their good leave we shall make bold to use such words indifferently in either sense or rather we shall follow the example of homer whose authority we have for it that much harm oft times from modesty befalls much good oft times and it was not done amiss of him to make mention of the hurtfulness of it first because modesty becomes profitable only through reason which cuts off what is superfluous and leaves a just mean behind three in the first place therefore the bashful man must be persuaded and satisfied that that distemper of the mind is prejudicial to him and that nothing which is so can be eligible and withal he must be cautious how he suffers himself to be cajoled and led by the nose with the titles of courteous or sociable in exchange for those of grave great and just nor like pegasus in euripides who when bellerophon mounted him with trembling stooped more than his lord desired must he debase himself and yield to all who make their addresses to him for fear of appearing hard and ungentle it is recorded of bacchorus king of egypt a man of a very cruel nature that the goddess isis sent a kind of a serpent called aspis which winding itself about his head cast a shadow over him from above and was a means to him of determining causes according to equity but bashfulness on the contrary happening upon remiss and spiritless tempers suffers them not to express their dislike of anything or to argue against it but perverts many times the sentence of arbitrators and stops the mouths of skilful pleaders forcing them often to act and speak contrary to their conviction and the most reckless man will always tyrannize and domineer over such a one forcing his bashfulness by his own strength of impudence upon this account it is that bashfulness like a low piece of soft ground can make no resistance and decline no encounter but is exposed to the meanest actions and vilest passions 
but above all this is the worst guardian of raw and inexperienced youth for as brutus said he seems to have had but an ill education that has not learned to deny anything and no better overseer is it of the marriage bed or the woman's apartment as the repentant lady in sophocles accuses the spark that had debauched her thy tongue thy flattering tongue prevailed so this vice happening upon a disposition inclinable to debauchery prepares and opens the way and leaves all things easy and accessible to such as are ready to prefer their wicked designs presents and treats are irresistible baits for common mercenary creatures but importunity befriended with bashfulness on their side has sometimes undone the modestest women i omit what inconveniences this kind of modesty occasions when it obliges men to lend their money to such whose credit is blown upon in the world or to give bail for those they dare not trust we do this it is true with an ill will and in our heart reflect upon that old saying be bail and pay for it yet cannot make use of it in our practice for how many this fault has ruined it is no easy thing to recount creon in the play gave a very good lesson for others to follow when he told medea tis better now to brave thy direst hate than curse a foolish easiness too late yet afterwards being wrought upon through his bashfulness to grant her but one day longer he ruined himself and family by it for the same reason some suspecting designs against them of murder or poisoning have neglected to provide for their safety thus dion could not be ignorant of the treachery of callipus yet thought it unfit to entertain such thoughts of his pretended friend and guest and so perished so again antipater the son of cassander having entertained demetrius at supper and being engaged by him for the next night because he was unwilling to distrust one who had trusted him went and had his throat cut after supper polysperchon had promised cassander for an hundred talents to murder hercules the son of alexander by barsine upon this he invites him to sup but the young man having some suspicion of the thing pretends himself indisposed polysperchon coming to him said sir above all things endeavour after your father's courteous behaviour and obliging way to his friends unless haply you look on us with suspicion as if we were compassing your health the young man out of mere modesty was prevailed upon to go and was strangled as he sat at meat it is not therefore as some will have us believe insignificant or ridiculous but on the contrary very wise advice which hesiod gives welcome a friend but never call thy foe be not bashful and mealy-mouthed in refusing him that you are satisfied has a pique against you but never reject him that seemeth to put his trust in you for if you invite you must expect to be invited again and some time or other your entertainment will be repaid you if bashfulness have once softened or turned the edge of that diffidence which ought to be your guard five to the end therefore that we may get the better of this disease which is the cause of so many evils we must make our first attempts as our custom is in other things upon matters of no great difficulty as if one drink to you after you have taken what is sufficient be not so foolishly modest to do violence to your nature but rather venture to pass the glass another it may be would tempt you to play at dice while drinking be not over persuaded into a compliance for fear of being the subject of his drollery but reply with xenophanes when lasus of hermione called him coward because he refused to play at dice yes said he i confess myself the greatest coward in the world for i dare not do an ill thing again you light upon an impertinent talker that sticks upon you like a burr 
don't be bashful but break off the discourse and pursue your business these evasions and repulses whereby our resolution and assurance are exercised in matters of less moment will accustom us to it by degrees in greater occasions and here it will be but seasonable to give you a passage as it is recorded of demosthenes the athenians having one time been moved to send succors to harpalus and themselves to engage in a war against alexander it happened that philoxenus alexander's admiral unexpectedly arrived on their coast and the people being so astonished as to be speechless for very fear demosthenes cried out how would they endure the sun who are not able to look against a lamp or how would you comport yourself in weightier concerns while your prince or the people had an awe over you if you cannot refuse a glass of wine when an acquaintance offers it or turn off an impertinent babbler but suffer the eternal trifler to walk over you without telling him another time good sir at present i am in haste Six besides all this the exercising such a resolution is of great use in praising others if one of my friends harpers play lewdly or a comedian he has hired at a great rate murder a piece of menander in the acting although the vulgar clap their hands and admire i think it no moroseness or ill-breeding to sit silently all the while without servilely joining in the common applauses contrary to my judgment for if you scruple to deal openly with him in these cases what will you do should he repeat to you an insipid composition of his own or submit to your revisal a ridiculous oration you will applaud of course and enter yourself into the list of common parasites and flatterers but how then can you direct him impartially in the greatest administrations of his life how be free with him when he fails in any duties of his trust or marriage or neglects the offices incumbent on him as a member of the community i must confess i cannot by any means approve of the reply pericles made to a friend who besought him to give false evidence and that too upon oath when he thus answered as far as the altar i am wholly at your service methinks he went too far but he that has long before accustomed himself not to commend anything against his judgment or applaud an ill voice or seem pleased with indecent scurrilities will never suffer things to come to that issue nor will any one be so bold as to solicit him in this manner swear on my side give false evidence or bring in an unjust verdict seven after the same manner we may learn to refuse such as come to borrow considerable sums of us if we have used to deny in little matters where refusal is easy as archelaus king of macedon sat at supper one of his retinue a fellow who thought there was nothing so honest as to receive begged of him a golden cup but the king commanded a waiter to give it immediately to euripides for you sir said he are fit indeed to ask anything but to receive nothing and he deserves to receive though he lacks the confidence to ask thus wisely did he make his judgment and not bashful timidity his guide in bestowing favours yet we oftentimes when the honesty nearness and necessities of our friends and relations are not motives sufficient to prevail with us to their relief can give profusely to impudence and importunity not out of any willingness to bestow our money so ill but merely for want of confidence and resolution to deny this was the case of antigonus the elder being wearied out with the importunity of bias give he said to his servants one talent to bias and necessity yet at other times he was as expert at encountering such addresses as any prince and dismissed them with as remarkable answers thus a certain cynic one day begging of him a grout he made answer that is not for a prince to give and the poor man replying then bestow a talent he reparted briskly nor that for a cynic or for a dog to receive 
diogenes went about begging to all the statues in the ceramicus and his answer to some that wondered at his fancy in it was he was practising how to bear a repulse but indeed it chiefly lies upon us to exercise ourselves in smaller matters to refuse an unreasonable request that we may not be at loss to refuse on occasions of greater magnitude for no one as demosthenes says who has spent all the money that he had in unnecessary expenses will have plenty of money that he has not for his necessary expenses and our disgrace is increased many fold if we want what is necessary or decent and abound in trifles and fopperies eight yet bashfulness is not only a bad steward of our estate but even in weightier concerns it refuses to hearken to the wholesome advice of right reason thus in a dangerous fit of sickness we send not to the ablest physician for fear of giving offence to another of our acquaintance or in taking tutors and governors for our children we make choice of such as obtrude themselves upon us not such as are better qualified for that service or in our lawsuits we regard not to obtain counsel learned in the law because we must gratify the son of some friend or relation and give him an opportunity to show himself in the world nay lastly you shall find some that bear the name of philosophers who call themselves epicureans or stoics not out of choice or upon the least conviction but merely to oblige their friends or acquaintance who have taken advantage of their modesty since then the case is so with us we ought to prepare and exercise ourselves in things that we daily meet with and of course not so much as indulging that foolish weakness in the choice of a barber or fuller or in lodging in a paltry inn when better accommodation is to be had to oblige the landlord who has cringed to us but if it be merely to break ourselves of such follies in those cases still we should make use of the best though the difference be but inconsiderable as the pythagoreans were strict in observing not to cross their right knee with the left or to use an even number with an odd though all things else were indifferent we must observe also when we celebrate a sacrifice or keep a wedding or make a public entertainment to deny ourselves so far as not to invite any that have been extremely complacent to us or that put themselves upon us before those who are known for their good humour or whose conversation is like to prove beneficial for he that has accustomed himself thus far will hardly be caught and surprised nay rather he shall not so much as be tempted in greater instances nine and thus much may suffice concerning exercising ourselves my first use of what has been said is to observe that all passions and distempers of the mind are still accompanied with those very evils which by their means we hoped to avoid thus disgrace pursues ambition pain and indisposition sensuality softness and effeminacy are fretted with troubles conscientiousness with disappointment and defeats but this is nowhere more conspicuous than in bashfulness which endeavouring to avoid the smoke of reproach throws itself into the fire such men wanting confidence to withstand those that unreasonably importune them afterwards feel shame before those who justly accuse them and for fear of a slight private rebuke incur more public disgrace for example not having the heart to deny a friend that comes to borrow in short time they are reduced to the same extremity themselves and exposed openly some again after promising to help friends in a lawsuit are ashamed to face the opposite party and are forced to hide their heads and run away many have been so unreasonably weak in this particular as to accept of disadvantageous proposals of marriage for a daughter or sister and upon second thoughts have been forced to bring themselves off with an arrant lie ten 
one made this observation of the people of asia that they were all slaves to one man merely because they could not pronounce that syllable no but he spake only in raillery but now the bashful man though he be not able to say one word has but to raise his brows or nod downward as if he minded not and he may decline many ungrateful and unreasonable offices euripides was wont to say silence is an answer to a wise man but we seem to have greater occasion for it in our dealings with fools and unreasonable persons for men of breeding and sense will be satisfied with reason and fair words upon this account we should be always provided with some notable sayings and choice apothems of famous and excellent men to repeat to the bashful such as that of phocion to antipater you cannot have me for both a friend and a flatterer and that of his to the athenians when they called upon him to come in for his share to defray the expenses of a festival i am ashamed said he pointing to callicles his creditor to contribute towards your follies without paying this man his due for as thucydides says it is an ill thing to be ashamed of one's poverty but much worse not to make use of lawful endeavours to avoid it but he that is so foolishly good-natured that he cannot answer one that comes to borrow my friend no silver white have i in all my caves but gives him a promise to be better provided the wretch has made himself a slave to shame and drags a tiresome though an unforged chain perseus being about to accommodate a friend with a sum of money paid it publicly in the market and made the conditions before a banker remembering it may be that of hesiod seem not thy brother's honesty to doubt yet smiling call a witness to his hand but when his friend marvelled and asked how now so formally and according to law yea quoth he because i would receive my money again as a friend and not have to trouble the law to recover it for many out of bashfulness not taking care to have good security at first have been forced afterwards to break with their friends and to have recourse to law for their money eleven again plato writing to dionysius by helicon of Cyzicus, gives the bearer a good character for honesty and moderation but withal in the postscript tells him yet this i write of a man who as such is by nature an animal subject to change xenocrates though a man of rigid morals was prevailed upon by this kind of modesty to recommend to polysperchon a person as it proved in the end not so honest as he was reputed for when the macedonian in compliment bade him call for whatever he wanted he presently desired a talent of silver polysperchon ordered it accordingly to be paid him but despatched away letters immediately to xenocrates advising him for the future to be better acquainted with those he recommended now all this came to pass through xenocrates ignorance of his man but we oftentimes give testimonials and squander away our money to advance such as we are very well satisfied have no qualification or desert to recommend them and this too with the forfeiture of our reputation and without the pleasure that men have who are profuse upon whores and flatterers but all the while in an agony and struggling with that impudence which does violence to our reason whereas if at any time that verse can here be properly used i know the dreadful consequence and fear when such persons are at a man to forswear himself or to give a wrong sentence or to vote for an unjust bill or lastly to be bound for one that will never be able to pay the debt twelve all passions of the mind have repentance still pursuing them closely but it overtakes this of bashfulness in the very act for we give with regret and we are in confusion while we bear false witness our reputation is questioned when we engage for others and when we fail we are condemned by all men 
from this imperfection also it proceeds that many things are imposed upon us not in our power to perform as to recommend such a man to court or to carry up an address to the governor because we dare not or at least we will not confess that we are unknown to the prince or that another has more of his ear lysander on the other hand when he was in disgrace at court but yet for his great services was thought to preserve something of his former esteem with the Gisileus, made no scruple to dismiss suitors directing them to such as were more powerful with the king for it is no disgrace not to be able to do everything but to undertake or pretend to what you are not made for is not only shameful but extremely troublesome and vexatious thirteen but to proceed to another head we must perform all reasonable and good offices to those that deserve them not forced thereto by fear of shame but cheerfully and readily but where anything prejudicial or unhandsome is required of us we ought to remember the story that is related of zeno meeting a young man of his acquaintance that slunk away under a wall as if he would not be seen and having learned from him that he withdrew from a friend that importuned him to perjure himself what replied he you novice is that fellow not afraid or ashamed to require of thee what is unreasonable and unjust and darest thou not stand against him in that which is just and honest for he that first started that doctrine that knavery is the best defence against a knave was but an ill teacher advising us to keep off wickedness by imitating it but for such as presume upon our modesty to keep them off with their own weapons and not gratify their unreasonable impudence with an easy compliance is but just and good and the duty of every wise man fourteen neither is it a hard matter to put off some mean and ordinary people which will be apt to prove troublesome to you in that nature some shift them off with a jest or a smart repartee as theocritus being asked in the bath to lend his flesh-brush by two persons whereof one was a stranger to him and the other a notorious thief made answer you sir i know not well enough and you i know too well and Lysimachi, the priestess of Minerva, Polius, and Athens, when the muleteers that brought the provision for the festival desired her to let them drink, replied, No, for I fear it may grow into a custom. So again, when a captain's son, a young fluttering bully but a great coward, petitioned Antigonus for promotion, the latter answered, Sir, it is my way to reward my soldiers for their valor not their parentage fifteen but if he that is importunate with us prove a man of great honour or interest and such persons are not easily answered with excuses when they come for our vote in the senate or judicial cases at such a time perhaps it will be neither easy nor necessary to behave ourselves to them as cato did towards catullus catullus a person of the highest rank among the romans and at that time censor once waited on cato who was then quaestor and still a young man on behalf of a friend whom cato had fined and when he had used a great deal of importunity to no purpose yet would not be denied cato grew out of patience and told him it would be an unseemly sight to have the censor dragged hence by my officers catullus at this went away out of countenance and very angry but consider whether the answers of agesilaus and themistocles have not in them much more of candour and equity agesilaus being bidden by his own father to give sentence contrary to law replied i have always been taught by you to be observant of the laws and I shall endeavour to obey you at this time by doing nothing contrary to them. And Themistocles, when Simonides tempted him to commit a piece of injustice, said, You would be no good poet should you break the laws of verse, and should I judge against the law, I should make no better magistrate. 16. 
for it is not because of blunders in meter in lyric songs as plato observes that cities and friends are set at variance to their utter ruin and destruction but because of their blunders with regard to law and justice yet there are a sort of men that can be very curious and critical in their verses and letters and lyric measures and yet would persuade others to neglect that justice and honesty which all men ought to observe in offices in passing judgments and in all actions but these men are to be dealt with after the following manner an orator perhaps presses you to show him favour in a cause to be heard before you or a demagogue importunes you when you are a senator tell him you are ready to please him on condition that he make a solecism in the beginning of his oration or be guilty of some barbarous expression in his narration these terms for shame he will not accept for some we see so superstitiously accurate as not to allow of two vowels meeting one another again you are moved by a person of quality to something of ill reputation bid him come over the market-place at full noon dancing or making buffoon-like grimaces if he refuse question him once more whether he think it a more heinous offence to make a solecism or a grimace than to break a law or to perjure oneself or to show more favour to a rascal than to an honest man nicostratus the argive when archidamus promised him a vast sum of money and his choice of the spartan ladies in marriage if he would deliver up the town cromnum into his hands returned him this answer he could no longer believe him descended from hercules he said because hercules traversed the world to destroy wicked men but archidamus made it his business to debauch those that were good in like manner if one that stands upon his quality or reputation presses us to do anything dishonourable we must tell him freely he acts not as becomes a person of his character in the world seventeen but if it be a man of no quality that shall importune you you may inquire of the covetous man whether he would lend you a considerable sum without any other security than your word desire the proud man to give you the higher seat or the ambitious to quit his pretensions to some honour that lies fair for him for to deal plainly it is a shameful thing that these men should continue so stiff so resolute and so unmoved in their vicious habits while we who profess ourselves lovers of justice and honesty have too little command of ourselves not to give up and betray basely the cause of virtue if they that would practice upon our modesty do this out of desire of glory or power why should we contract disgrace or infamy to ourselves to advance the authority or set off the reputation of others like those who bestow the reward wrongfully in public games or betray their trust in collecting the poll who confer indeed garlands and honours upon other men but at the same time forfeit their own reputation and good word but suppose it be matter of interest only that puts them upon it why should it not appear an unreasonable piece of service for us to forego our reputation and conscience to no other purpose than to satisfy another man's avarice or make his coffers the heavier after all these i am afraid are the grand motives with most men in such cases and they are even conscious that they are guilty as men that are challenged and compelled to take too large a glass raise an hundred scruples and make as many grimaces before they drink eighteen this weakness of the mind may be compared to a constitution of body that can endure neither heat nor cold for let them be praised by those that thus impudently set upon them and they are at once mollified and broken by the flattery but let them be blamed or so much as suspected by the same men after their suit has been refused and they are ready to die for woe and fear we ought therefore to prepare and fortify ourselves against both extremes so as to be made a prey neither to such as pretend to frighten nor to such as would cajole us 
Thucydides is of opinion, since there is a necessary connection between envy and great undertakings, that he takes the wisest counsel who incurs envy by aiming the highest. But we who esteem it less difficult to avoid the envy of all men than to escape the censure of those we live among, ought to order things so as rather to grapple with the unjust hatred of evil men than to deserve their just accusation after we have served their base sins. We ought to go armed against that false and counterfeit praise such men are apt to fling upon us, not suffering ourselves like swine to be scratched and tickled by them, till, having got the advantage of us, they use us after their own pleasure. For they that reach out their ears to flatterers differ very little from such as stand fair and quiet to be tripped up, excepting that the former catch the more disgraceful fall. These put up with the affronts and forbear the correction of wicked men, to get the reputation of good-natured or merciful, or else are drawn into needless and perilous quarrels at the instance of flatterers, who bear them in hand all the while for the only men of judgment, the only men not to be caught with flattery, and call them the only men who have mouths and voices. Bion used to compare these men to pitchers. Take them, said he, by the ears, and you may move them as you please. Thus Alexinus, the sophist, was reporting many scandalous things in the Lyceum of Stilpo the Magarian, but when one present informed him that Stilpo always spake very honorably of him, Why, truly, says he, he is one of the most obliging and best of men. But now, Enidamus, when it was told him that Alexinus often praised him, replied, that may be, but I always talk against him, for he must be bad who either praises a bad man or is blamed by an honest one. So wary was he of being caught by such baits, agreeably to that precept of Hercules in Antisthenes, who cautioned his sons not to be thankful to such as were used to praise them, thereby meaning no more than that they should be so far from being wheedled thereby as not even to return their flatteries. That of Pindar was very apposite, and enough to be said in such a case, when one told him, I cry you up among all men, and speak to your advantage on all occasions, and I, replied he, am always very thankful, in that I take care you shall not tell a lie. 19. I shall conclude with one general rule of sovereign use against all the passions and diseases of the mind, but particularly beneficial to such as labor under the present distemper, bashfulness. And it is this, whenever they have given way to this weakness, let them store up carefully such failings in their memory, and taking therein deep and lively impressions of what remorse and disquiet they occasioned, bestow much time in reflecting upon them and keeping them fresh. For as travellers that have got a dangerous fall against such a stone, or sailors shipwrecked upon a particular promontory, keeping the image of their misfortune continually before them appear fearful and apprehensive not only of the same but even the like dangers so they that keep in mind the disgraceful and prejudicial effects of bashfulness will soon be enabled to restrain themselves in like cases and will not easily slip again on any occasion end of section seven Section 8 of The Morals, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginger Cucolo. The Morals, Volume 1 by Plutarch. Translated by several hands, corrected and revised by William W. Goodwin. That Virtue May Be Taught. 
one men deliberate and dispute variously concerning virtue whether prudence and justice and the right ordering of one's life can be taught moreover we marvel that the work of orators shipmasters musicians carpenters and husbandmen are infinite in number while good men are only a name and are talked of like centaurs giants and the cyclops and that is for any virtuous action that is sincere and unblameable and manners that are without any touch and mixture of bad passions and affections they are not to be found but if nature of its own accord should produce anything good and excellent so many things of a foreign nature mix with it just as wild and impure productions with generous fruit that the good is scarce discernible men learn to sing dance and read and to be skilful in husbandry and good horsemanship they learn how to put on their shoes and their garments they have those that teach them how to fill wine and to dress and cook their meat and none of these things can be done as they ought unless they be instructed how to do them and will ye say o oh, foolish men that the school of ordering one's life well for the sake of which are all the rest is not to be taught but to come of its own accord without reasons and without art two why do we by asserting that virtue is not to be taught make it a thing that does not at all exist for if by its being learned it is produced he that hinders its being learned destroys it and now as plato says we never heard that because of a blunder in meter in a lyric song therefore one brother made war against another nor that it put friends at variance nor that cities hereupon were at such enmity that they did to one another and suffered one from another the extremest injuries nor can any one tell us of a sedition raised in a city about the right accenting or pronouncing of a word as whether we are to say tul ya or tul ya nor that a difference arose in a family betwixt man and wife about the woof and the warp in cloth yet none will go about to weave in a loom or to handle a book or a harp unless he has first been taught though no great harm would follow if he did but only the fear of making himself ridiculous for as heraclitus says it is a piece of discretion to conceal one's ignorance and yet a man without instruction presumes himself able to order a family a wife or a commonwealth and to govern very well diogenes seeing a youth devouring his victuals too greedily gave his tutor a box on the ear and that deservedly as judging it the fault of him that he had not taught not of him that had not learned better manners and what is it necessary to begin to learn from a boy how to eat and drink handsomely in company as aristophanes expresses it not to devour their meat in haste nor giggle nor awkwardly their feet across to wiggle and yet are men fit to enter into the fellowship of a family city married estate private conversation or a public office and to manage it without blame without any previous instruction concerning good behavior and conversation when one asked aristippus this question what are you everywhere he laughed and said i throw away the fare of the waterman if i am everywhere and why canst not thou also answer that the salary given to its tutors is thrown away and lost if none are better for their discipline and instruction but as nurses shape and form the body of a child with their hands so these masters when the nurses have done with them first receive them into their charge in order to the forming of their manners and directing their steps into the first tracks of virtue to which purpose the lacedaemonian that was asked what good he did to the child of whom he had the charge answered well i make good and honest things pleasant to children these masters also teach them to bend down their heads as they go along to touch salt fish with one finger only but fresh fish bread and flesh with two thus to scratch themselves and thus to tuck up their garment three now he says that the art of physic may be proper for a tetter or a whitlow but not to be made use of for pleurisy a fever or a frenzy in what does he differ from him that should say that it is fit there should be schools and discourses and precepts to teach trifling and childish things but that all skill in greater and more manly things comes from use without art and from accidental opportunity for as he would be ridiculous who should say that one who never learned Learn to row ought not to lay hand on the oar but that he might guide the helm who was never taught it so is he that gives leave for men to be instructed in other arts but not in virtue 
he seems to be quite contrary to the practice of the scythians who as herodotus tells us put out their servants eyes to prevent them from running away but he puts the eye of reason into these base and slavish arts and plucks it from virtue but the general Iphicrates, when Callias, the son of Shabras, asked him, What art thou? Art thou an archer, or a targeteer, a trooper, or a foot-soldier? Answered, Well, I am none of all these, but one that commands them all. He therefore would be ridiculous that should say that the skill of drawing, a bow, of handling arms, of throwing with a sling, and of good horsemanship might indeed be taught. But the skill of commanding and leading an army came as it happened, one knew not how and would not he be still more ridiculous who should say that prudence only could not be taught without which all those arts are useless and unprofitable when she is the governess ranking all things in due place and order everything is assigned to become useful for instance how ungraceful would a feast be though all concerned were skilful and enough practised in cookery in dressing and serving up the meat and in filling the wine as they ought if all things were not well disposed and ordered among those that waited at the table end of section eight recording by ginger cucolo section nine of the morals Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cynthia Moyer. The Morals, Volume 1, by Plutarch. Translated by several hands. Corrected and revised by William W. Goodwin. The Account of the Laws and Customs of the Lacedaemonians It was a singular instance of the wisdom of this nation, in that they took the greatest care they could, by an early sober education, to instill into their youth the principles of virtue and good manners, that so by a constant succession of prudent and valiant men, they might the better provide for the honor and security of their state, and lay in the minds of every one a solid and good foundation of love and friendship, of prudence and knowledge, of temperance and frugality, of courage and resolution. And therefore their great lawgiver, thought it necessary for the ends of government to institute several distinct societies and conventions of the people, amongst which was that of their solemn and public living together at one table, where their custom was to admit their youth into the conversation of their wise and elderly men, that so by daily eating and drinking with them they might insensibly as it were, be trained up to a right knowledge of themselves, to a just submission to their superiors, and to the learning of whatever might conduce to the reputation of their laws and the interest of their country. For here they were taught all the wholesome rules of discipline, and daily instructed how to demean themselves from the example and practice of their great ones. And though they did not at this public meeting confine themselves to set and grave discourses concerning the civil government, but allowed themselves a larger freedom, by mingling sometimes with their politics the easy and familiar entertainments of mirth and satire, yet this was ever done with the greatest modesty and discretion, not so much to expose the person of any one, as to reprove the fault he had committed. Whatever was transacted at these stated and common feasts was to be locked up in every one's breast with the greatest silence and secrecy, insomuch as the eldest among them at these assemblies pointing to the door, acquainted him who entered the room 
that nothing of what was done or spoken there was to be talked of afterwards. At all these public meetings they used a great deal of moderation, they being designed only for schools of temperance and modesty, not for luxury and indecency. Their chief dish and only delicacy being a sort of pottage, called by them their black broth, and made of some little pieces of flesh with a small quantity of blood, salt and vinegar, and this the more ancient among them generally preferred to any sort of meat whatsoever, as the more pleasing entertainment, and of a more substantial nourishment. The younger sort contented themselves with flesh and other ordinary provisions, without tasting of this dish, which was reserved only for the old men. It is reported of Dionysius, the Sicilian tyrant, that having heard of the great fame and commendation of this broth, he hired a certain cook of Lacedaemon, who was thoroughly skilled in the make and composition of it, to furnish his table every day with so great and curious a dainty, and that he might have it in the greatest perfection, enjoined him to spare no cost in the making it agreeable and pleasant to his palate. But it seems the end answered not the pains he took in it, for after all his care and niceness, the king, as soon as he had tasted of it, found it both fulsome and nauseous to his stomach, and spitting it out with great distaste, as if he had taken down a vomit, sufficiently expressed his disapprobation of it. But the cook, not discouraged at this dislike of his master, told the tyrant that he humbly conceived the reason of this disagreeableness to him was not in the pottage, but rather in himself, who had not prepared his body for such food according to the laconic mode and custom. For hard labors and long exercises and moderate abstinence, the best preparatives to a good and healthy appetite, and frequent bathings in the river Eurotas were the only necessaries for a right relish and understanding of the excellency of this entertainment. Tis true, their constant diet was very mean and sparing, not what might pamper their bodies or make their minds soft and delicate, but such only as would barely serve to supply the common necessities of nature. This they accustomed themselves to, that so they might become sober and governable, active and bold in the defense of their country, they accounting only such men serviceable to the state who could best endure the extremes of hunger and cold, and with cheerfulness and vigor run through the fatigues of labor and the difficulties of hardship. Those who could fast longest after a slender meal, and with the least provision satisfy their appetites, were esteemed the most frugal and temperate, and most sprightly and healthful, the most comely and well proportioned. Nature, through such a temperance and moderation of diet, not suffering the constitution to run out into an unwieldy bulk or greatness of body, the usual consequence of full tables and too much ease, but rather rendering it thereby nervous and sinewy of a just and equal growth, and consolidating and knitting together all the several parts and members of it. A very little drink did serve their turn, who never drank but when an extreme thirst provoked them to it. For at all their common entertainments they studied the greatest measures of sobriety, and took care they should be deprived of all kinds of computations whatsoever. And at night, when they returned home, they went cheerfully to their sleep, 
without the assistance of any light to direct them to their lodging, that being prohibited them as an indecent thing, the better to accustom them to travel in the dark, without any sense of fear or apprehensions of danger. They never applied their minds to any kind of learning further than what was necessary for use and service. Nature indeed having made them more fit for the purposes of war than for the improvements of knowledge. And therefore for speculative sciences and philosophic studies they looked upon them as foreign to their business and unserviceable to their ends of living, and for this reason they would not tolerate them amongst them, nor suffer the professors of them to live within their government. They banished them their cities, as they did all sorts of strangers, esteeming them as things that did debase the true worth and excellency of virtue, which they made to consist only in manly actions and generous exercises, and not in vain disputations and empty notions. So that the whole of what their youth was instructed in was to learn obedience to the laws and injunctions of their governors, to endure with patience the greatest labors, and where they could not conquer to die valiantly in the field. For this reason, likewise, it was that all mechanic arts and trades, all vain and insignificant employments, such as regarded only curiosity or pleasure, were strictly prohibited them, as things that would make them degenerate into idleness and covetousness, would render them vain and effeminate, useless to themselves, and unserviceable to the state. And on this account it was that they would never suffer any scenes or interludes, whether of comedy or tragedy, to be set up among them, lest there should be any encouragement given to speak or act anything that might savor of contempt or contumely against their laws and government, it being customary for the stage to assume an indecent liberty of taxing the one with faults and the other with imperfections. As to their apparel, they were as thinly clad as they were dieted, never exceeding one garment which they wore for the space of a whole year. And this they did the better to inure them to hardship and to bear up against all the injuries of the weather, that so the extremities of heat and cold should have no influence at all upon their constitution. They were as regardless of their selves as they were negligent of their clothes, denying themselves, unless it were at some stated time of the year, the use of ointments and bathings to keep them clean and sweet, as too expensive and signs of a too soft and delicate temper of body. Their youth, as they were instructed and ate in public together, so at night slept in distinct companies in one common chamber, and on no other beds than what were made of reeds which they had gathered out of the river Eurotas, near the banks of which they grew. This was the only accommodation they had in the summer, but in winter they mingled with the reeds a certain soft and downy thistle, having much more of heat and warmth in it than the other. It was freely allowed them to place an ardent affection upon those whose excellent endowments recommended them to the love and consideration of any one. But then this was always done with the greatest innocency and modesty, and every way becoming the strictest rules and measures of virtue, it being accounted a base and dishonorable passion in any one 
to love the body and not the mind, as those did who in their young men preferred the beauty of the one before the excellency of the other. Chaste thoughts and modest discourses were the usual entertainments of their loves, and if any one was accused at any time either of wanton actions or impure discourse, it was esteemed by all so infamous a thing that the stains it left upon his reputation could never be wiped out during his whole life. So strict and severe was the education of their youth, that whenever they were met with in the streets by your grave and elderly persons, they underwent a close examination, it being their custom to inquire of them upon what business and whither they were going, and if they did not give them a direct and true answer to the question demanded of them, but shamed them with some idle story or false pretense, they never escaped without a rigorous censure and sharp correction. And this they did to prevent their youth from stealing abroad upon any idle or bad design, that so, through the uneasy fears of meeting these grave examiners, and the impossibility of escaping punishment upon their false account and representations of things, they might be kept within due compass, and do nothing that might entrench upon truth or offend against the rules of virtue. Nor was it expected only from their superiors to censure and admonish them upon any miscarriage or indecency whatsoever, but it was strictly required of them under a severe penalty, for he who did not reprove a fault that was committed in his presence, and showed not his just resentments of it by a verbal correction, was adjudged equally culpable with the guilty, and obnoxious to the same punishment. For they could not imagine that person had a serious regard for the honor of their laws and the reputation of their government, who could carelessly pass by any immorality and patiently see the least corruption of good manners in their youth. By which means they took away all occasions of fondness, partiality, and indulgence in the aged, and all presumption, irreverence, and disobedience, and especially all impatiency of reproof, in the younger sort. For not to endure the reprehension of their superiors in such cases was highly disgraceful to them, and ever interpreted as an open renunciation of their authority, and a downright opposing of the justice of their proceedings. Besides, when any was surprised in the commission of some notorious offence, he was presently sentenced to walk round a certain altar in the city, and publicly to shame himself by singing an ingenious satire, composed by himself, upon the crime and folly he had been guilty of, that so the punishment might be inflicted by the same hand which had contracted the guilt. Their children were brought up in a strict obedience to their parents, and taught from their infancy to pay a profound reverence to all their dictates and commands. And no less were they enjoined to show an awful regard and observance to all their superiors in age and authority, so as to rise up before the hoary head, and to honor the face of the old man, to give him the way when they met him in the streets, and to stand still and remain silent till he was passed by. Insomuch as it was indulged them as a peculiar privilege due to their age and wisdom, not only to have a paternal authority over their own children, 
servants and estates but over their neighbors too as if they were a part of their own family and propriety that so in general there might be a mutual care and an united interest zealously carried on betwixt them for the private good of every one in particular as well as for the public good of the communities they lived in by this means they never wanted faithful counsellors to assist with good advice in all their concerns nor hearty friends to prosecute each other's interest as it were their own by this means they never wanted careful tutors and guardians for their youth who were always at hand to admonish and instruct them in the solid principles of virtue no one durst show himself refractory to their instructions nor at the least murmur at their reprehensions insomuch that whenever any of their youth had been punished by them for some ill that had been done and a complaint thereupon made by them to their parents of the severity they had suffered hoping for some little relief from their indulgence and affection it was accounted highly dishonourable in them not to add to their punishment by a fresh correction for the folly and injustice of their complaint for by the common interest of discipline and that great care that every one was obliged to take in the education of their youth they had a firm trust and assurance in one another that they never would enjoin their children the performance of anything that was in the least unnecessary or unbecoming them though it might seem very strange and unaccountable in this wise nation that anything which had the least semblance of baseness or dishonesty should be universally approved commended and encouraged by their laws yet so it was in the case of theft whereby their young children were allowed to steal certain things as particularly the fruit of their orchards or their messes at their feasts but then this was not done to encourage them to the desires of avarice and injustice but to sharpen their wits and to make them crafty and subtle and to train them up in all sorts of wiles and cunning watchfulness and circumspection whereby they were rendered more apt to serve them in their wars which was upon the matter the whole profession of this commonwealth and if at any time they were taken in the act of stealing they were most certainly punished with rods and the penance of fasting not because they esteemed the stealth criminal but because they wanted skill and cunning in the management and concealing of it they spent a great part of their studies in poetry and music which raised their minds above the ordinary level and by a kind of artificial enthusiasm inspired them with generous heats and resolutions for action their compositions consisting only of very grave and moral subjects were easy and natural in a plain dress and without any paint or ornament containing nothing else but the just commendations of those great personages whose singular wisdom and virtue had made their lives famous and exemplary and whose courage in defence of their country had made their deaths honourable and happy nor were the valiant and virtuous only the subject of these songs but the better to make men sensible of what rewards and honours are due to the memory of such they made invectives in them upon those who were signally vicious and cowards as men who died with as much contempt as they had lived with infamy 
they generally concluded their poem with a solemn profession of what they would be, boasting of their progress in virtue, agreeable to the abilities of their nature and the expectations of their age. At all their public festivals, these songs were a great part of their entertainment, where there were three companies of singers, representing the three several ages of nature. The old men made up the first chorus, whose business was to present what they had been, after this manner. That active courage youthful blood contains, did once with equal vigor warm our veins. To which the chorus, consisting of young men only, thus answers, Valiant and bold we are, let who will try, who dare accept our challenge, soon shall die. The third, which were of young children, replied to them in this manner. Those seeds which nature in our breast did sow, shall soon to generous fruits of virtue grow. Then all those valiant deeds which you relate, we will excel and scorn to imitate. They made use of a peculiar measure in their songs when their armies were in their march towards an enemy, which being sung in a full choir to their flutes seemed proper to excite in them a generous courage and contempt of death. Lycurgus was the first who brought this warlike music into the field, that so he might moderate and soften the rage and fury of their minds in an engagement by solemn musical measures, and that their valor, which should be no boisterous and unruly thing, might always be under the government of their reason, and not of passion. To this end it was always their custom before the fight to sacrifice to the muses, that they might behave themselves with as much good conduct as with courage, and do such actions as were worthy of memory, and which might challenge the applauses and commendations of every one. And indeed, so great an esteem and veneration had they for the gravity and simplicity of their ancient music, that no one was allowed to recede in the least from the established rules and measures of it, insomuch as the ephori, upon complaint made to them, laid a severe mulct upon Terpander, a musician of great note and eminency for his incomparable skill and excellency in playing upon the harp, and who, as he had ever professed a great veneration for antiquity, so ever testified by his eulogiums and commendations the esteem he always had of virtuous and heroic actions depriving him of his harp, and, as a peculiar punishment, exposing it to the censure of the people by fixing it upon a nail, because he had added one string more to his instrument than was the usual and stated number, though done with no other design and advantage than to vary the sound and to make it more useful and pleasant. That music was ever accounted among them the best which was most grave, simple, and natural. And for this reason, too, when Timotheus, in their Carnean feasts, which were instituted in honor of Apollo, contended for a preference in his art, one of the ephori took a knife in his hand and cut the strings of his harp, for having exceeded the number of seven in it so severely tenacious were they of their ancient customs and practices, that they would not suffer the least innovation, though in things that were indifferent and of no great importance, lest an indulgence in one thing might have introduced another, till at length, by gradual and 
insensible alterations, the whole body of their laws might be disregarded and contemned, and so the main pillar which did support the fabric of their government be weakened and undermined. Lycurgus took away that superstition which formerly indeed had been the practice among them concerning their sepulchre and funeral solemnities by permitting them to bury the remains of their departed friends within the city that so they might the better secure them from the rude and barbarous violence of an enemy and to erect their monuments for them in separated places joining to their temples that having their graves and tombs always before their eyes they might not only remember but imitate the worthy actions they had done and so lessen the fears and apprehensions of death with the consideration of those honours they paid their memories when they put off their mortalities he took away those pollutions which they formerly looked upon as arising from their dead bodies and prohibited all costly and sumptuous expenses at their funerals it being very improper for those who while alive generally abstained from whatever was vain and curious to be carried to the grave with any pomp and magnificence therefore without the use of drugs and ointments without any rich odours and perfumes without any art or curiosity save only the little ornament of a red vestment and a few olive leaves they carried him to the place of burying where he was without any formal sorrows and public lamentations honourably and securely laid up in a decent and convenient sepulchre and here it was lawful for any one who would be at the trouble to erect a monument for the person deceased but not to engrave the least inscription on it this being the peculiar reward of such only who had signalized themselves in war and died gallantly in defence of their country it was not allowed any of them to travel into foreign countries lest their conversation should be tinctured with the customs of those places and they at their return introduce amongst them new modes and incorrect ways of living to the corruption of good manners and the prejudice of their own laws and usage for which reason they expelled all strangers from sparta lest they should insinuate their vices and their folly into the affections of the people and leave in the minds of their citizens the bad principles of softness and luxury ease and covetousness nothing could sooner forfeit the right and privilege of a citizen than refusing their children that public education which their laws and country demanded of them for as none of them were on any account exempt from obedience to their laws so if any one out of an extraordinary tenderness and indulgence would not suffer his sons to be brought up according to their strict discipline and institutions he was straightways disfranchised for they could not think that person could ever prove serviceable to their government who had not been educated with the same care and severity with his fellow subjects and it was no less a shame and reproach to the parents themselves who could be of such mean and abject spirits as to prefer the love of their children to the love of their country and the satisfaction of a fond and imprudent passion to the honour and security of their state nay further as there was a community of children so there was of their goods and estates it being free for them in case of necessity to make use of their neighbours servants as if they were their own 
and not only so, but of their horses and dogs, too, unless the owners stood in need of them themselves, whenever they designed the diversion of hunting, an exercise peculiar to this nation, and to which they were accustomed from their youth. And if upon any extraordinary occasion any one was pressed with the want of what his neighbors were possessed of, he went freely to them and borrowed, as though he had been the right proprietary of their storehouses, and being supplied answerably to his necessities, he carefully sealed them up again and left them secure. In all their warlike expeditions, they generally clothed themselves with a garment of a purple color, as best becoming the profession of soldiers, and carrying in them a signification of that blood they were resolved to shed in the service of their country. It was of use, likewise, not only to cast a greater terror into their adversaries, and to secure from their discovery the wounds they should receive, but likewise for distinction's sake, that in the heat and fury of the battle they might discriminate each other from the enemy. They always fought with consideration and cunning, craft being many times of more advantage to them than downright blows. For it is not the multitude of men, nor the strongest arm and the sharpest sword, that make men masters of the field. Whenever a victory was gained through a well-contrived stratagem, and thereby with little loss of men and blood, they always sacrificed an ox to Mars. But when the success was purely owing to their valor and prowess, they only offered up a cock to him, it being in their estimation more honorable for their generals and commanders to overcome their enemies by policy and subtlety, than by mere strength and courage. One great part of their religion lay in their solemn prayers and devotion, which they daily offered up to their gods, heartily requesting of them to enable them to bear all kinds of injuries with a generous and unshaken mind, and to reward them with honor and prosperity according to their performances of piety and virtue. Besides, it was a great part of that honor they paid their gods, of whatever sex they were, to adorn them with military weapons and armor, partly out of superstition and an extraordinary reverence they had for the virtue of fortitude, which they preferred to all others, and which they looked upon as an immediate gift of the gods, as being the greatest lovers and patrons of those who were endued with it, and partly to encourage every one to address his devotions to them for it, insomuch as Venus herself, who in other nations was generally represented naked, had her armor too, as well as her particular altars and worshippers. Whenever they take any business of moment in hand, they generally pray to fortune in a set form of words for their success in it, it being no better in their esteem than profaneness and irreverence to their gods to invoke them upon slight and trivial emergencies. No discovery of what is bad and vicious comes with greater evidence to the spirits and apprehensions of children who are unable to bear the force of reason than that which is offered to them by way of example. Therefore the Spartan discipline did endeavor to preserve their youth, on whom philosophical discourses would have made but small impression, from all kinds of intemperance and excess of wine by presenting before them all the indecencies of their drunken helots, persons indeed who were their slaves, 
and employed not only in all kinds of servile offices, but especially in tilling of their fields and manuring of their ground, which was let out to them at reasonable rates, they paying in every year their returns of rent, according to what was anciently established and ordained amongst them at the first general division of their lands. And if any did exact greater payments from them, it was esteemed an execrable thing amongst them, they being desirous that the Helots might reap gain and profit from their labors, and thereupon be obliged faithfully to serve their masters as well as their own interest with greater cheerfulness and industry. And therefore their lords never required more of them than what their custom and contracts exacted of them. They adjudged it necessary for the preservation of that gravity and seriousness of manners which was required of their youth for the attainments of wisdom and virtue, never to admit of any light and wanton, any ludicrous or effeminate poetry which made them allow of no poets among them but such only who for their grave and virtuous compositions were approved by the public magistrate. That being hereby under some restraint, they might neither act nor write anything to the prejudice of good manners, or to the dishonor of their laws and government. And therefore it was that when they heard of Achelochus's arrival at Sparta, though a Lacedaemonian and of an excellent wit, yet they presently commanded him to depart the city, having understood how that in a poem of his he had affirmed it was greater wisdom for a man to throw his arms away and secure himself by flight than to stand to his own defense with the hazard of his life, or therein to die valiantly in the field. His words were after this manner. Let who will boast their courage in the field, I find but little safety from my shield. Nature's, not honor's laws, we must obey. This made me cast my useless shield away, and by a prudent flight and cunning save a life which valor could not from the grave. A better buckler I can soon regain, but who can get another life again? It was a received opinion amongst many nations that some of their gods were propitious only to their men and others only to their women which made them sometimes prohibit the one and sometimes the other from being present at their sacred rites and solemnities. But the Lacedaemonians took away this piece of superstition by not excluding either sex from their temples and religious services. But as they were always bred up to the same civil exercises, so they were to the same common performances of their holy mysteries, so that by an early knowledge of each other there might be a real love and friendship established betwixt them, which ever stood most firm upon the basis of religion. Their virtuous man, as he was to do no wrong, so likewise was not to suffer any without a due sense and modest resentment of it. And therefore the Ephori laid a mulct upon Scyraphidas, because he could so tamely receive the many injuries and affronts that were offered him, concluding that he who was so insensible of his own interest as not to stand up in a bold and honest vindication of himself from the wrongs and injustice that may be done to his good name and honor, would without all doubt be as dull and listless when an opportunity should invite him to it in appearing for the defense of the fame and reputation of his country. 
action and not speaking was the study and commendation of a spartan and therefore polite discourses and long harangues were not with them the character of a wise or learned man their speech being always grave and sententious without any ornament or tedious argumentation they accustomed themselves to brevity and upon every subject to express themselves in the finest words with as much satire and smartness as possible insomuch as they had a law among them for the instruction of their youth by which they were enjoined to practice a close and compendious style in all their orations which made them banish one kephisophon a talkative rhetorician for boasting publicly that he could upon any subject whatsoever entertain his auditory for a whole day together alleging this as a sufficient reason for their justification that it was the part of a good orator to adjust his discourse according to the weight and dignity of the matter he was to treat of there was indeed a strange and unnatural custom amongst them annually observed at the celebration of the bloody rites of diana orthia where there was a certain number of children not only of the vulgar sort but of the gentry and nobility who were whipped almost to death with rods before the altar of the goddess their parents and relations standing by and all the while exhorting them to patience and constancy in suffering although this ceremony lasted for the space of a whole day yet they underwent this barbarous rite with such a prodigious cheerfulness and resolution of mind as never could be expected from the softness and tenderness of their age they did not so much as express one little sigh or groan during the whole solemnity but out of a certain emulation and desire of glory there was a great contention among them who should excel his companions in the constancy of enduring the length and sharpness of their pains and he who held out the longest was ever the most esteemed and valued person amongst them and the glory and reputation wherewith they rewarded his sufferings rendered his after life much more eminent and illustrious they had a very slight regard to maritime affairs on the account of an ancient law amongst them whereby they were prohibited from applying of themselves to the becoming of good seamen or engaging themselves in any sea fight afterwards indeed through the necessity of affairs and the security of their country they judged it convenient when they were invaded by the athenians and other nations to furnish themselves with a navy by which it was that lysander who was then the general in that expedition obtained a great victory over the athenians and thereby for a considerable time secured the sovereignty of the seas to themselves but finding afterwards this grievance arising from it that there was a very sensible corruption of good manners and decay of discipline amongst them from the conversation of their rude and debauched mariners they were obliged to lay this profession wholly aside and by a revival of this law endeavour to retrieve their ancient sobriety and by turning the bent and inclinations of the people into their old channel again to make them tractable and obedient modest and virtuous though indeed they did not long hold to their resolution herein any more than they were wont to do in other matters of moment which could not but be variable according to the circumstances of affairs and the necessities of their government for though 
great riches and large possessions were things they hated to death, it being a capital crime and punishment to have any gold or silver in their houses, or to amass up together heaps of money, which was generally made with them of iron or leather, for which reason several had been put to death, according to that law which banished covetousness out of the city, on the account of an answer of their oracle to Alcamenes and Theopompus, two of their Spartan kings, that the love of money should be the ruin of Sparta. Yet notwithstanding the severe penalty annexed to the heaping up much wealth, and the example of those who had suffered for it, Lysander was highly honoured and rewarded for bringing in a great quantity of gold and silver to Lacedaemon, after the victory he had gained over the Athenians and the taking of the city of Athens itself, wherein an inestimable treasure was found. So that what had been a capital crime in others was a meritorious act in him. It is true, indeed, that as long as the Spartans did adhere closely to the observation of the laws and rules of Lycurgus, and keep their oath religiously, to be true to their own government, they outstripped all the other cities of Greece for prudence and valor, and for the space of five hundred years became famous everywhere for the excellency of their laws and the wisdom of their policy. But when the honor of these laws began to lessen, and their citizens grew luxurious and exorbitant, when covetousness and too much liberty had softened their minds and almost destroyed the wholesome constitution of their state, their former greatness and power began by little and little to decay and dwindle in the estimation of men. And as by reason of these vices and ill customs they proved unserviceable to themselves, so likewise they became less formidable to others, insomuch as their several allies and confederates, who had with them jointly carried on their common good and interest, were wholly alienated from them. But although their affairs were in such a languishing posture, when Philip of Macedon, after his great victory at Chironea, was by the Grecians declared their general both by land and sea, as likewise his son Alexander after the conquest of the Thebans, yet the Lacedaemonians, though their cities had no other walls for their security, but only their own courage, though by reason of their frequent wars they were reduced to low measures and small numbers of men, and thereby become so weak as to be an easy prey to any powerful enemy, yet retaining amongst them some reverence for those few remains of Lycurgus's institution and government, they could not be brought to assist these two, or any other of their Macedonian kings, in their wars and expeditions. Neither could they be prevailed with to assist at their common assemblies and consults with them, nor pay any tribute or contributions to them. But when all those laws and customs, which are the main pillars that support a state, enacted by Lycurgus and so highly approved of by the government, were now universally despised and unobserved, they immediately became a prey to the ambition and usurpation, to the cruelty and tyranny of their fellow citizens. And having no regard at all to their ancient virtues and constitution, they utterly lost their ancient glory and reputation, and by degrees, as well as weaker nations, did in a very little time everywhere degenerate into poverty, contempt, and servitude, being at present 
subject to the Romans, like all the other cities of Greece. End of section 9《Section 10 of the Morals, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — The Morals, Volume 1, by Plutarch. Translated by several hands. Corrected and revised by William W. Goodwin. — Concerning Music. Onesicrates, Sotericus, Lysias. The wife of Phocion the Just was always wont to maintain that her chiefest glory consisted in the warlike achievements of her husband. For my part, I am of opinion that all my glory, not only that peculiar to myself, but also what is common to all my familiar friends and relations, flows from the care and diligence of my master that taught me learning. For the most renowned performances of great commanders tend only to the preservation of some few private soldiers or the safety of a single city or nation, but make neither the soldiers nor the citizens nor the people anything the better. But true learning, being the essence and body of felicity and the source of prudence, we find to be profitable and beneficial, not only to one house or city or nation, but to all the race of men. Therefore, by how much the more the benefit and advantage of learning transcends the profits of military performances, by so much the more is it to be remembered and mentioned as most worthy your study and esteem. For this reason, upon the second day of the Saturnalian festival, the famous Onesicrates invited certain persons, the best skilled in music, to a banquet, by name Sotericus of Alexandria and Lysias, one of those to whom he gave a yearly pension and all had done and the table was cleared to dive said he most worthy friends into the nature and reason of the human voice is not an argument proper for this merry meeting as being a subject that requires a more sober scrutiny but because our chiefest grammarians define the voice to be a percussion of the air made sensible to the ear and for that we were yesterday discoursing of grammar which is an art that can give the voice form and shape by means of letters and store it up in the memory as a magazine let us consider what is the next science to this which may be said to relate to the voice. In my opinion, it must be music. For it is one of the chiefest and most religious duties belonging to man, to celebrate the praise of the gods, who gave to him alone the most excelling advantage of articulate discourse, as Homer has observed, in the following verses. With sacred hymns and songs that sweetly please, the Grecian youth all day the gods appease. Their lofty paeans bright Apollo hears, and still the charming sounds delight his ears. Now then, you that are of the grand musical chorus, tell your friends, who was the first that brought music into use? What time has been added for the advantage of the science? Who have been the most famous of its professors? And lastly, for what and how far it may be beneficial to mankind? This the scholar propounded, to which Lysias made reply. Noble Onesicrates, said he, you desire the solution of a hard question that has been by many already proposed. For of the Platonics the most, of the peripatetic philosophers the best, have made it their business to compile several treatises concerning the ancient music and the reasons why it came to lose its pristine perfection. Nay, the very grammarians and musicians themselves who arrived to the height of education have expended much time and study upon the same subject, whence has arisen great variety of discording opinions among the several writers. Heraclides, in his Compendium of Music, asserts that Amphion, the son of Jupiter and Antiope, was the first that invented playing on the harp and lyric poesy, being first instructed by his father, which is confirmed by a small manuscript preserved in the city of Sicyon, wherein is set down a catalogue of the priests, poets, and musicians of Argos. In the same age, he tells us, Linus the Euboan composed several elegies. Anthes of Anthedon in Boeotia was the first author of hymns, and Pyrrhus of Pyria the first that wrote in the praise of the muses. Philemon also, the Delphian, set forth in verse a poem in honour of the nativity of Latona, Diana, and Apollo, 
and was the first that instituted dancing about the temple of Delphi. Thamyris, of Thracian extraction, had the best voice and the neatest manner of singing of any of his time, so that the poets feigned him to be a contender with the muses. He is said to have described in a poem the Titans' war against the gods. There was also Demodocus, the Corsirian, who is said to have written the destruction of Troy and the nuptials of Vulcan and Venus, and then Phemius of Ithaca composed a poem entitled The Return of Those Who Came Back with Agamemnon from Troy. Not that any of these stories before cited were complied in a style like prose without metre. They were rather like the poems of Stesichorus and other ancient lyric poets, who composed in heroic verse and added a musical accompaniment. The same Heraclides writes that Terpander, the first that instituted the lyric nomes, set verses of Homer as well as his own to music, according to each of these nomes, and sang them at public trials of skill. He also was the first to give names to the lyric nomes. In imitation of Terpander, Clonus, an elegiac and epic poet, first instituted nomes for flute music, and also the songs called prosodia. And Polymnestus, the Colophonian, in later times used the same measure in his compositions. Now the measures appointed by these persons, noble Onesocrates, in reference to such songs as are to be sung to the flutes or pipes, were distinguished by these names. Apothetus, Elegiac, Camarchius, Schönian, Sepian, Tenadius, and Trimelis, or of three parts. To these succeeding ages added another sort, which were called Polymnastia. But the measures set down for those that played and sung to the harp, being the invention of Terpander, were much more ancient than the former. To these he gave the several appellations of Boeotian, Aeolian, Trochaean, the Acute, Sepian, Terpandrian, and Tetraidian. And Terpander made preludes to be sung to the lyre in heroic verse. Besides, Timotheus testifies how that the lyric nomes were anciently appropriated to epic verses, for Timotheus merely intermixed the dithyrambic style with the ancient nomes in heroic measure, and thus sang them, that he might not seem to make too sudden an innovation upon the ancient music. But as for Terpander, he seems to have been the most excellent composer to the harp of his age, for he is recorded to have been four times in succession a victor at the Pythian games and certainly he was one of the most ancient musicians in the world. For Glaucus the Italian, in his treatise of the ancient poets and musicians, asserts him to have lived before Archilochus, affirming him to be the second next to those that first invented wind music. Alexander, in his collections of Phrygia, says that Olympus was the first that brought into Greece the manner of touching the strings with a quill, and next to him were the Idaean dactyli, Hyagnus was the first that sang to the pipe, after him his son Marcius, then Olympus, that Terpander imitated Homer in his verses, and Orpheus in his musical compositions, but that Orpheus never imitated any one, since in his time there were none but such as composed to the pipe, which was a manner quite different from that of Orpheus. Clonus, a composer of nomes for flute music, and somewhat later than Terpander, as the Arcadians affirm, was born in Tegea, or as the Boeotians allege, at Thebes. After Terpander and Clonus flourished Archilochus. Yet there are some writers who affirm that Ardalus the Trozenian taught the manner of composing to wind music before Clonus. There was also the poet Polymnestus, the son of Melis the Colophonian, who invented the Polymnestian measures. They farther wrote that Clonus invented the nomes Apothetus and Schönian, of Polymnestus mention is made by Pindar and Alcman, both lyric poets, but of several of the lyric nomes said to be instituted by Terpander, they make Philemon, the ancient Delphian author. Now the music appropriated to the harp, such as it was in the time of Terpander, continued in all its simplicity till Phrynis grew into esteem. For it was not the ancient custom to make lyric poems in the present style, or to intermix measures and rhythms for in each nome they were careful to observe its own proper pitch. Whence came the expression nome, from nomos, law, because it was unlawful to alter the pitch appointed for each one. At length, falling from their devotion to the gods, they began to sing the verses of Homer and the other poets. 
This is manifest by the poems of Terpander. Then, for the form of the harp, it was such as Sepion, one of Terpander's scholars, first caused to be made. And it was called the Asian harp, because the lesbian harpers bordering upon Asia always made use of it. And it is said that Periclitus, a lesbian by birth, was the last harper who won a prize by his skill, which he did at one of the Spartan festivals called Carnea. But he being dead, that succession of skilful musicians which had so long continued among the lesbians expired. Some there are who erroneously believe that Hipponax was contemporary with Terpander, when it is plain that Hipponax lived after Periclitus. Having thus discoursed of the several nomes appropriated to the stringed as well as to the wind instruments, we will now speak something in particular concerning those peculiar to the wind instruments. First, they say, that Olympus, a Phrygian player upon the flute, invented a certain nome in honor of Apollo, which he called Polycephalus, or of many heads. This Olympus, they say, was descended from the first Olympus, the scholar of Marcius, who invented several forms of composition in honor of the gods. And he, being a boy beloved of Marcius, and by him taught to play upon the flute, first brought into Greece the laws of harmony. Others ascribe the polycephalus to Cratus, the scholar of Olympus, though Protinus will have Olympus the Younger to be the author of it. The Harmatian nome is also said to be invented by Olympus, the scholar of Marcius. This Marcius was by some said to be called Massus, which others deny, not allowing him any other name but that of Marcius, the son of that Hyagnus, who invented the art of playing upon the pipe. But that Olympus was the author of the Harmatian nome is plainly to be seen in Glaucus's treatise of the ancient poets, and that Stesichorus of Hymera imitated neither Orpheus nor Terpander nor Antilochus nor Talus, but Olympus, and that he made use of the Harmatian nome and the dactylic dance, which some rather apply to the Orthian mood, while others aver it to have been in the invention of the Mycians, for that some of the ancient pipers were Mycians. There was also another mood in use among the ancients called Cradius, which Hipponax says Mimnerus always delighted in. For formerly they that played upon the flute sang also elegies at the same time set to notes, which the description of the Panathenaea concerning the musical combat makes manifest. Among the rest, Saccadus of Argos set several odes and elegies to music, he himself being also a good flute player and thrice a victor at the Pythian games. Of him Pindar makes mention. Now, whereas in the time of Polymnestus and Saccadus there existed three musical moods, the Dorian, Phrygian, and Lydian, it is said that Saccadus composed a strophe in every one of these moods, and then taught the choruses to sing the first after the Dorian manner, the second according to the Phrygian, and the third after the Lydian manner, and this nome was called trimeris, or threefold, by reason of the shifting of the moods although in the Sicyonian catalogue of the poets Clonus is said to be the inventor of this name. Music then received its first constitution from Terpander at Sparta. Of the second constitution, Thaletus the Gortinian, Xenodamus the Cytherian, Xenocritus the Locrian, Polymnestus the Colophonian, and Saccadus the Argive were deservedly acknowledged to be the authors. For these, having introduced the Gymnopediae into Lacedaemon, settled the so-called apodeixis, or exhibitions, among the Arcadians, and the endematia in Argos. Now Thaletus, Xenodamus, and Xenocritus, and their scholars, were poets that addicted themselves altogether to making of paeans. Polymnestus was all for the Orthian or military strain, and Saccadus for elegies. Others, and among the rest Pratinus, affirm Xenodamus to have been a maker of songs for dances. Hyperchemus, and not of Paeans, and a tune of Xenodamus is preserved, which plainly appears to have been composed for a dance. Now, that a Paean differs from a song made for a dance is manifest from the poems of Pindar, who made both. Polymnestus also composed nomes for flute music, but in the Orthian nome he made use of his lyric vein, as the students in harmony declare. But in this we cannot be positive, because we have nothing of certainty concerning it from antiquity and whether Thaletus of Crete was a composer of hymns is much doubted. For Glaucus, asserting Thaletus to be born after Archilochus, says that he imitated the odes of Archilochus, only he made them longer, and used the paeonic and cretic rhythm, 
which neither Archilochus nor Orpheus nor Terpander ever did. For Thaletas learned these from Olympus, and became a good poet besides. As for Xenocritus the Locrian from Italy, it is much questioned whether he was a maker of paeans or not, as being one that always took heroic subjects with dramatic action for his verses, for which reason some there were who called his arguments Dithyrambic. Moreover, Glaucus asserts Thaletas to have preceded him in time. Olympus, by the report of Aristoxenus, is supposed by the musicians to have been the inventor of the enharmonic species of music, for before him there was no other than the diatonic and chromatic. And it is thought that the invention of the enharmonic species was thus brought to pass, for that Olympus, before altogether composing and playing in the diatonic species, and having frequent occasion to shift to the diatonic parhypet, sometimes from the paramese and sometimes from the mese, skipping the diatonic lycanus, he found the beauty that appeared in the new character, and thus, admiring a conjunction or scheme so agreeable to proportion, he made this new species in the Doric mood. For now he held no longer to what belonged either to the diatonic or to the chromatic, but he was already come to the enharmonic. And the first foundations of enharmonic music which he laid were these. In enharmonics the first thing that appears is the spondiasmus to which none of the divisions of the tetrachord seems properly to belong, unless any one will take the more intense spondiasmus to be diatonic. But he that maintained this would maintain a falsehood and an absurdity in harmony, a falsehood because it would be less by a diesis than is required by the leading note, an absurdity in harmony because, even if we should place the proper nature of the more intense spondiasmus in the simple chromatic, it would then come to pass that two double tones would follow in order, the one compounded, the other uncompounded. For the thick and harmonic now used in the middle notes does not seem to be the invention of the forementioned author. But this is more easily understood by hearing any musician play in the ancient style, for then you shall find the semitone in the middle parts to be uncompounded. These were the beginnings of enharmonic music. Afterwards the semitone was also divided, as well in the Phrygian as Lydian moods. But Olympus seems to have advanced music by producing something never known or heard of before, and to have gained to himself the honor of being the most excellent, not only in the Grecian, but in all other music. Let us now proceed to rhythms, for there were several varieties of these, as well in musical as in rhythmical composition. And here, Terpander, among all those novelties with which he adorned music, introduced an elegant manner that gave it much life. After him, beside the Terpandrian, which he did not relinquish, Polymnestus brought in use another of his own, retaining, however, the former elegant manner, as did also Thaletus and Saccadus. Other innovations were made by Alcman and Stesichorus, who nevertheless receded not from the ancient forms. But Crexus, Timotheus, and Philoxenus, and those other poets of the same age, growing more arrogant and studious of novelty, affected those other manners now called philanthropic and thematic. For now the fewness of strings and the plainness and majesty of the old music are looked upon as absolutely out of date. And now, having discoursed to the best of my ability of the ancient music and the first inventors of it, and how succeeding ages brought it to more and more perfection, I shall make an end, and give way to my friend Sotericus, not only greatly skilled in music, but in all the rest of the sciences for we have always labored rather on the practical than the contemplative part. Which, when Lysias had said, he forbear speaking any farther. But then Sotericus thus began. Most noble Onesicrates, said he, since you have engaged us to speak our knowledge concerning the most venerable excellencies of music, which is most pleasing to the gods, I cannot but approve the learning of Master Lysias and his great memory in reciting all the inventors of the ancient music and those who have written concerning it but I must needs say that he has given us this account trusting only to what he has found recorded. We, on the other side, have not heard of any man that was the inventor of the benefits of music, but of the god Apollo adorned with all manner of virtue. The flute was neither the invention of Marcius, nor Olympus, nor Hyagnus, nor was the harp Apollo's invention only, but as a god he was the inventor of all the music, both of the flute and the harp. This is manifest from the dances and sacrifices which were solemnized to Apollo, as Alcaeus and others in their hymns relate. His statue also placed in the temple of Delos holds in his right hand a bow, 
At his left the graces stand, with every one a musical instrument in her hands, one carrying a harp, another a flute, another with a shepherd's pipe set to her lips. And that this is no conceit of mine appears from this, that Anticles and Ister have testified the same in their commentaries upon these things. And the statue is reported to be so ancient that the artificers were said to have lived in the time of Hercules. The youth, also, that carries the tempic laurel into Delphi, is accompanied by one playing upon the flute. And the sacred presents of the Hyperboreans were sent of old to Delos, attended with flutes, pipes, and harps. Some have thought that the god himself played upon the flute, as the best of lyrics, Alcman relates. Corinna also asserts that Apollo was by Minerva taught to pipe. Venerable is therefore music altogether, as being the invention of the gods. The ancients made use of it for its worth, as they did all other beneficial sciences, but our men of art, condemning its ancient majesty instead of that manly, grave, heaven-born music so acceptable to the gods, have brought into the theatres a sort of effeminate musical tattling, mere sound without substance, which Plato utterly rejects in the third book of his Commonwealth, refusing the Lydian harmony as fit only for lamentations, and they say that this was first instituted for doleful songs. Aristoxenus, in his first book of music, tells us how that Olympus sang an elegy upon the death of Python in the Lydian mood, though some will have Menelipides to be the author of that song. Pindar, in his paean on the nuptials of Niobe, asserts that the Lydian harmony was first used by Anthippus. Others affirm that Torebus was the first that made use of that sort of harmony, among the rest Dionysus the iambic writer. The mixed Lydian moves the affections, and is fit for tragedies. This mood, as Aristoxenus alleges, was invented by Sappho, from whom the tragedians learned it, and joined it with the Doric. The one becomes a majestic lofty style, the other mollifies and stirs to pity, both which are the properties of tragedy. The history of music, however, made Pythocles the flute-player to be the author of it, and Lysus reports that Lamprocles the Athenian, Finding that the diazuxis, or separation of two tetrachords, was not where almost all others thought it had been, but towards the treble, made such a scheme as is now, from paramese to the highest hypate. But for the softer Lydian, being contrary to the mixed Lydian, and like the Ionian, they say it was invented by Damon the Athenian. But as for those sorts of harmony, the one being sad and doleful, the other loose and effeminate, Plato deservedly rejected them, and made choice of the Dorian as more proper for sober and warlike men. Not being ignorant, however, as Aristoxenus discourses in his second book of music, that there might be something advantageous in the rest to a circumspect and wary commonwealth. For Plato gave much attention to the art of music as being the hearer of Draco the Athenian and Metellus the Agrigentine. But considering, as we have intimated before, that there was much more majesty in the Dorian mood, it was that he preferred. He knew, moreover, that Alcman, Pindar, Simonides, and Bacchylides had composed several Parthenia in the Doric mood, and that several prosodia, or supplications to the gods, several hymns, and tragical lamentations, and now and then love verses, were composed to the same melody. But he contented himself with such songs as were made in honour of Mars or Minerva, or else such as were to be sung at solemn offerings, called spondea. For these he thought sufficient to fortify and raise the mind of a sober person, not being at all ignorant in the meantime of the Lydian and Ionian, of which he knew the tragedians made use. Moreover, the ancients well understood all the sorts of styles, although they used but few for it was not their ignorance that confined them to such narrow instruments and so few strings, nor was it out of ignorance that Olympus and Terpander, and those that came after them, would not admit of larger instruments and more variety of strings. This is manifest from the poems of Olympus and Terpander and all those that were their imitators. For, being plain and without any more than three strings, these so far excelled those that were more numerously strung, insomuch that none could imitate Olympus's play and they were all inferior to him when they betook themselves to their polychords. Then again, that the ancients did not through ignorance abstain from the third string is the spondaic style, their use of it in play makes apparent. For, had they not known the use of it, they would never have struck it in harmony with parhypate. But the elegancy and gravity that attended the spondaic style by omitting the third string 
induced them to transfer the music to paranet. The same reason may serve for neat. For this in play they struck in chord to meze, induced them to transfer the music to paranete. The same reason may serve for nete. For this in play they struck in concord to meze, but in discord to paranete. Although in song it did not seem to them proper to the slow spondaic motion. And not only did they do this, but they did the same with nete of the conjunct heptachords, for in play they struck it in concord to meze and licanos, and in discord to paranete and parhypet. But in singing those touches were no way allowable, as being ungrateful to the ear, and shaming the performer. As certain it is from the Phrygians that Olympus and his followers were not ignorant of the third string, for they made use of it not only in pulsation, but in their hymns to the mother of the gods and several other Phrygian songs. Nor is it less apparent, with regard to Hupatai, that they never abstained for want of skill from that tetrachord in the Dorian mood. Indeed, in other moods they knowingly made use of it, but removed it from the Dorian mood to preserve its elegant gravity. The same thing was done also by the tragedians. For the tragedians have never to this day used either the chromatic or the enharmonic scale, while the lyre, many generations older than tragedy, used them from the very beginning. Now, that the chromatic was more ancient than the enharmonic is plain, for we must necessarily account it of greater antiquity according to the custom and use of men themselves. Otherwise it cannot be said that any of the differences and distinctions were ancienter the one than the other. Therefore, if any one should allege that Aeschylus or Phrynichus abstained from the chromatic out of ignorance, would he not be thought to maintain a very great absurdity? Such a one might as well aver that Panocrates lay under the same blindness, who avoided it in most, but made use of it in some things. Therefore he forbore not out of ignorance, but judgment, imitating Pindar and Simonides, and that which is at present called the ancient manner. The same may be said of Tertius the Mantinian, Andreas the Corinthian, Thrasyllus the Phliasian, and several others who, as we well know, abstained by choice from the chromatic, from transition, from the increased number of strings, and many other common forms of rhythms, tunes, diction, composition, and expression. Telephanes of Megara was so great an enemy to the pipe made of reed, called syrinx, that he would not suffer the instrument-maker to join it to the flute, pipe made of wood or horn, and chiefly for that reason forbore to go to the Pythian games. In short, if a man should be thought to be ignorant of that which he makes no use of, there would be found a great number of ignorant persons in this age. For we see that the admirers of the Dorian composition make no use of the Antigenedian, the followers of the Antigenedian reject the Dorian and other musicians refused to imitate Timotheus, being almost all bewitched with the trifles and the idle poems of Polyidus. On the other side, if we dive into the business of variety and compare antiquity with the present times, we shall find there was great variety then, and that frequently made use of. For then the variation of rhythm was more highly esteemed, and the change of their manner of play more frequent. We are now lovers of fables, they were then lovers of rhythm. Plain it is, therefore, that the ancients did not refrain from broken measures out of ignorance, but out of judgment. And yet what wonder is this when there are so many things necessary to human life which are not unknown, though not made use of by those who have no occasion to use them? But they are refused, and the use of them is altogether neglected, as not being found proper on many occasions. Having already shown that Plato, neither for want of skill nor for ignorance, blamed all the other moods and castes of composition, we now proceed to show that he really was skilled in harmony. For in his discourse concerning the procreation of the soul, inserted into Timaeus, he has made known his great knowledge in all the sciences, and of music among the rest, in this manner. After this, saith he, he filled up the double and treble intervals, taking parts from thence, and adding them to the midst between them, so that there were in every interval two middle terms. This proem was the effect of his experience in music, as we shall presently make out. The means from whence every mean is taken are three, arithmetical, enharmonical, geometrical. Of these the first exceeds and is exceeded in number, the second in proportion, the third neither in number nor proportion. Plato, therefore, 
desirous to show the harmony of the four elements in the soul, and harmonically also to explain the reason of that mutual concord arising from discording and jarring principles, undertakes to make out two middle terms of the soul in every interval, according to harmonical proportion. Thus, in a musical octave there happen to be two middle distances, whose proportion we shall explain. As for the octaves, they keep a double proportion between their two extremes. For example, let the double arithmetical proportion be six and twelve, this being the interval between the chupate meson and the nete diexogmenon, six, therefore, and twelve being the two extremes. The former note contains the number six and the latter twelve. To these are to be added the intermediate numbers, to which the extremes must hold the proportion, the one of one and a third, and the other of one and a half. These are the numbers eight and nine. For as eight contains one and a third of six, so nine contains one and a half of six. Thus you have one extreme. The other is twelve, containing nine and a third part of nine, and eight and half eight. These, then being the numbers between six and twelve, and the interval of the octave consisting of a diatessaron and diapente, it is plain that the number eight belongs to meze and the number nine to paramese, which being so, it follows that hypate is to meze as paramese to nete of the disjunct tetrachords, for it is a fourth from the first term to the second of this proportion, and the same interval from the third term to the fourth. The same proportion will be also found in the numbers, for as six is to eight, so is nine to twelve, and as six is to nine, so is eight to twelve for eight is one and a third part of six, and twelve of nine, while nine is one and a half part of six, and twelve of eight. What has been said may suffice to show how great was Plato's zeal and learning in the liberal sciences. End of section 10《Section 11 of the Morals, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Morals, Volume 1, by Plutarch. Translated by several hands, corrected and revised by William W. Goodwin. Concerning Music. Now that there is something of majesty, something great and divine in music, Aristotle, who is Plato's scholar, thus labors to convince the world. Harmony, saith he, descended from heaven, and is of a divine, noble, and angelic nature. But being fourfold as to its efficacy, it has two meanings, the one arithmetical, the other enharmonical. As for its members, its dimensions, and its excesses of intervals, they are best discovered by number and equality of measure, the whole art being contained in two tetrachords. These are his words. The body of it, he saith, consists of discording parts, yet concording one with another, whose means nevertheless agree according to arithmetical proportion. For the upper string being fitted to the lowest in the ratio of two to one produces a perfect diapason. Thus, as we said before, nete consisting of twelve units, and hypate of six, the paramese accords with the hypate according to the sesquialter proportion, and has nine units, whilst meze has eight units. So that the chiefest intervals through the whole scale are the diatessaron, which is the proportion of four to three, the diapente, which is the proportion of three to two, and the diapason, which is the proportion of two to one while the proportion of nine to eight appears in the interval of a tone. With the same inequalities of excess or diminution, all the extremes are differenced one from another, and the means from the means, either according to the quantity of the numbers or the measure of geometry, which Aristotle thus explains, observing that nete exceeds meze by a third part of itself, and hypate is exceeded by paramese in the same proportion, so that the excesses stand in proportion. For by the same parts of themselves they exceed and are exceeded, that is, the extremes, nete and hypate, exceed and are exceeded by meze and paramese in the same proportions, those of four to three and of three to two. Now these excesses are in what is called harmonic progression. But the distances of nete from meze and of paramese from hypate 
expressed in numbers, are in the same proportion. Twelve to eight equals nine to six. For paramese exceeds meze by one-eighth of the latter. Again, nete is to hypate as two to one, paramese to hypate as three to two, and meze to hypate as four to three. This, according to Aristotle, is the natural constitution of harmony as regards its parts and its numbers. But according to natural philosophy, both harmony and its parts consist of even, odd, and also even odd. Altogether it is even, as consisting of four terms, but its parts and proportions are even, odd, and even odd. So, nete is even, as consisting of twelve units, paramese is odd of nine, meze even of eight, and hypate even odd of six, i.e., two times three. Whence it comes to pass that music, herself and her parts, being thus constituted as to excesses and proportion, the whole accords with the whole, and also with each one of the parts. But now, as for the senses that are created within the body, such as are of celestial and heavenly extraction, and which by divine assistance affect the understanding of men by means of harmony, namely sight and hearing, do by the very light and voice express harmony and others which are their attendants so far as they are senses likewise exist by harmony. For they perform none of their effects without harmony, and although they are inferior to the other two, they are not independent of them. Nay, those two also, since they enter into human bodies at the very same time with God himself, claim by reason a vigorous and incomparable nature. Manifest from hence, therefore, it is, why the ancient Greeks, with more reason than others, were so careful to teach their children music, for they deemed it requisite by the assistance of music to form and compose the minds of youth to what was decent sober and virtuous believing the use of music beneficially efficacious to incite to all serious actions especially to the adventuring upon warlike dangers to which purpose they made use of pipes or flutes when they advanced in battle array against their enemies like the lacedaemonians who upon the same occasion caused the castorian melody to be played before their battalions Others inflamed their courage with harps, playing the same sort of harmony when they went to look danger in the face, as the Cretans did for a long time. Others, even to our own times, continue to use the trumpet. The Argives made use of flutes at their wrestling matches called Stenea, which sort of sport was first instituted in honor of Danaus, but afterwards consecrated to Jupiter Stenaeus or Jupiter the Mighty. And now, at this day, it is the custom to make use of flutes at the games called Pentathla, although there is now nothing exquisite or antique, nothing like what was customary among men of old time, like the song composed by Hierax for this very game. Still, even though it is sorry stuff and nothing exquisite, it is accompanied by flute music. But among the more ancient Greeks, music in theatres was never known, for they employed their whole musical skill in the worship of the gods and the education of youth at which time, there being no theatres erected, music was yet confined within the walls of their temples, as being that with which they worshipped the supreme deity and sang the praises of virtuous men. And it is probable that the word theatron, at a later period, and theorein, to behold, much earlier, were derived from theos, God. But in our age is such another face of new inventions that there is not the least remembrance or care of that use of music which related to education, for all our musicians make it their business to court the theatre muses and study nothing but compositions for the stage. But some will say, did the ancients invent nothing themselves? Yes, say I, they did invent, but their inventions were grave and decent. For they who have written the history of music attribute to Terpander the addition of the Dorian Nete, which before was not in use. Even the whole Mixolydian mood is a new invention. Such were also the Orthian manner of melody, with Orthian rhythms, and also the Trochaeus Semantus. And if we believe Pindar, Terpander was the inventor of the Scolian, or Rondelay. Archilochus also invented the rhythmic composition of the iambic trimeter, the change to rhythms of different character, the melodramatic delivery, and the accompaniment proper to each of these. He is also presumed to be the author of the epodes, tetrameters, the cretic and the prosodiac rhythms, and the augmentation of the heroic verse. Some make him author also of the elegiac measure, as likewise of the extending the iambic to the paean epibatus, the prolonged and heroic to the prosodiac and cretic. 
and Archilochus is first said to have taught how iambics could be partly recited to the stroke of the lyre and partly sung. From him the tragedians learned it, and from them Crexus took it, and made use of it in his dithyrambics. It is thought that he invented also playing on the lyre at intervals in the song, whereas the ancients played only during the singing. Of the Hypolydian mood they make Polymnestus the inventor, and the first that taught the lowering and raising of the voice. Oiluses and Oibole. To the same Olympus, to whom they also ascribe the first invention of Grecian and well-regulated gnomic music, they attribute likewise the finding out, the enharmonic music, the prosodiac measure to which is composed the hymn to Mars, and the Korean measure which he used in the hymns to the mother of the gods. Some report him to be the author also of the Bacchius, and every one of the ancient songs show that this is so. But Lazus of Hermione, transferring the rhythms to suit the dithyrambic time, and making use of an instrument with many notes, made an absolute innovation upon the ancient music by the use of more notes and those more widely distributed. Aristophanes, the comic poet, making mention of Philoxenus, complains of his introducing lyric verses among the cyclic choruses, where he brings in music thus speaking, He filled me with discordant measures airy, wicked hyperbole and niglary, and to uphold the follies of his play, like a lank radish, bowed me every way. Other comedians have since set forth the absurdity of those who have been slicers and manglers of music. Now, that the right moulding or ruin of ingenuous manners and civil conduct lies in a well-grounded musical education, Aristoxenus has made apparent. For, of those that were contemporary with him, he gives an account of Talasius the Theban, who in his youth was bred up in the noblest excellences of music, and, moreover, studied the works of the most famous lyrics, Pindar, Dionysius the Theban, Lampris, Pratinus, and all the rest who were accounted most eminent, who played also to perfection upon the lute, and was not a little industrious to furnish himself with all those other accomplishments of learning. But being past the prime of his age, he was so bewitched with the theatre's new fangles, and the innovations of multiplied notes, that despising these noble precepts and that solid practice to which he had been educated, he betook himself to Philoxenus and Timotheus, and among those delighted chiefly in such as were most depraved with diversity of notes and baneful innovation. And yet when he made it his business to make verses and labour both ways, as well in that of Pindar as that of Philoxenus, he could have no success in the latter. And the reason proceeded from the truth and exactness of his first education. Therefore, if it be the aim of any person to practice music with skill and judgment, let him imitate the ancient manner. Let him also adorn it with those other sciences, and make philosophy his tutor which is sufficient to judge what is, in music, decent and useful. For music being generally divided into three parts, diatonic, chromatic, and enharmonic, it behooves one who comes to learn music to understand poetry, which uses these three parts, and to know how to express his poetical inventions in proper musical form. First, therefore, we are to consider that all musical learning is a sort of habituation, which does not teach the reason of her precepts at one and the same time to the learner. Moreover, we are to understand that to such an education there is not requisite an enumeration of its several divisions, but every one learns by chance what either the master or scholar, according to the authority of the one and the liberty of the other, has most affection for. But the more prudent sort reject this chance medley way of learning, as the Lacedaemonians of old, the Mantinians and the Pellenians, who, making choice either of one single method, or else but very few styles, used only that sort of music which they deemed most proper to regulate the inclinations of youths. This will be apparent if any one shall examine every one of the parts, and see what is the subject of their several contemplations. For harmony takes cognizance of intervals, systems, classes of harmonious sounds, notes, tones, and systematical transmutations. Farther than this it goes not and therefore it would be in vain to inquire of harmony whether the poet have rightly, and so to speak musically chosen, the Dorian for the beginning, the mixed Lydian and Dorian for the end, or the hypophrygian and Phrygian for the middle. For the industry of harmony reaches not to these, and it is defective in many other things, as not understanding the force and extent of elegant aptness and proper concinnity. 
neither did ever the chromatic or enharmonic species arrive to such force of aptitude as to discover the nature and genius of the poem for that is the work of the poet it is as plain that the sound of the system is different from the sound of the descant sung in the same system which however does not belong to the consideration of harmonical studies there is the same to be said concerning rhythms for no rhythm can claim to itself the force of perfect aptitude for we call a thing apt and proper when we consider the nature of it the reason of this we say is either a certain plain or mixed composure or both like the enharmonic species of olympus by him set in the phrygian mood and mixed with the paean epibatus which rendered the beginning of the key naturally elegant in what is called the nome of minerva for having made choice of his key and measure he only changed the paean epibatus for the trochee which produced his enharmonic species however the enharmonic species and phrygian tone remaining together with the whole system the elegancy of the character was greatly altered for that which was called harmony in the nome of minerva was quite another thing from that in the introduction he then that has both judgment as well as skill is to be accounted the most accurate musician for he that understands the dorian mood not being able withal to discern by his judgment what is proper to it and when it is fit to be made use of shall never know what he does nay he shall quite mistake the nature and custom of the key. Indeed, it is much questioned among the Dorians themselves whether the enharmonic composers be competent judges of the Dorian songs. The same is to be said concerning the knowledge of rhythm, for he that understands a peon may not understand the proper use of it, though he know the measure of which it consists. Because it is much doubted among those that make use of peons whether the bare knowledge make a man capable to determine concerning the proper use of those rhythms, or, as others say, whether it aspire to presume so far. Therefore it behooves that person to have two sorts of knowledge who will undertake to judge of what is proper and what improper. First, of the custom and manner of elegancy for which such a composition was intended, and next, of those things of which the composition consists. And thus, that neither the bare knowledge of harmony, nor of rhythm, nor of any other things that singly by themselves are but a part of the whole body of music, is sufficient to judge and determine either of the one or the other what has been already said may suffice to prove now then there being three species into which all harmony is divided equal in the magnitude of systems or intervals and force of notes and tetrachords we find that the ancients never disputed about any more than one for they never troubled themselves with the chromatic or diatonic but differed only about the enharmonic and there no farther than about the great interval called the diapason the further subdivision indeed caused some little variance but they nearly all agreed that harmony itself is but one therefore he must never think to be a true artist in the understanding and practice of music who advances no farther than the single knowledge of this or that particular but it behooves him to trace through all the particular members of it and so to be master of the whole body by understanding how to mix and join all the divided members for he that understands only harmony is confined to a single manner. Wherefore, in short, it is requisite that the sense and understanding concur in judging the parts of music, and that they should neither be too hasty, like those senses which are rash and forward, nor too slow, like those which are dull and heavy. Though it may happen sometimes, through the inequality of nature, that the same senses may be too slow and too quick at the same time which things are to be avoided by a sense and judgment that would run an equal course for there are three things at least that at the same instant strike the ear the note the time and the word or syllable by the note we judge of the harmony by the time of the rhythm and by the word of the matter or subject of the song as these proceed forth altogether it is requisite the sense should give them entrance at the same moment but this is certain where the sense is not able to separate every one of these and consider the effects of each apart, there it can never apprehend what is well or what is amiss in any. First, therefore, let us discourse concerning coherence, for it is necessary that coherence accompany the discerning faculty, for judgment of good or bad is not to be made from notes disjoined, broken time, and shattered words, but from coherence, for there is in practice a certain commixture of parts which commonly are not compounded. We are next to consider whether the masters of music are sufficiently capable of being judges of it. Now I aver the negative, 
for it is impossible to be a perfect musician and a good judge of music by the knowledge of those things that seem to be but parts of the whole body, as by excellency of hand upon the instrument, or singing readily at first sight, or exquisiteness of the ear, so far as this extends to the understanding of harmony and time. Neither does the knowledge of time and harmony, pulsation or elocution, or whatever else falls under the same consideration, perfect their judgment. Now, for the reasons why a musician cannot gain a perfect judgment from any of these, we must endeavor to make them clear. First, then, it must be granted that of things about which judgment is to be made, some are perfect and others imperfect. Those things which are perfect are the compositions in general, whether sung or played, and the expression of those, whether upon the instruments or by the voice, with the rest of the same nature. The imperfect are the things to these appertaining, and for whose sake they are made use of. Such are the parts of expression. A second reason may be found in poetry, with which the case is the same. For a man that hears a consort of voices or instruments can judge whether they sing or play in tune, and whether the language be plain or not. But every one of these are only parts of instrumental and vocal expression, not the end itself, but for the sake of the end. For by these and things of the same nature shall the elegancy of elocution be judged, whether it be proper to the poem which the performer undertakes to sing. The same is to be said of the several passions expressed in the poetry. The ancients now made principal account of the moral impression, and therefore preferred that fashion of the antique music which was grave and least affected. Therefore the Argives are said to have punished deviation from the ancient music, and to have imposed a fine upon such as first adventured to play with more than seven strings, and to introduce the Mixolydian mood. Pythagoras, that grave philosopher, rejected the judging of music by the senses, affirming that the virtue of music could be appreciated only by the intellect. And therefore he did not judge of music by the ear, but by the harmonical proportion, and thought it sufficient to fix the knowledge of music within the compass of the diapason. But our musicians nowadays have so utterly exploded the most noble of all the moods, which the ancients greatly admired for its majesty, that hardly any among them make the least account of enharmonic distances. And so negligent and lazy are they grown, as to believe the enharmonic diasis to be too contemptible to fall under the apprehension of sense, and they therefore exterminate it out of their compositions, deeming those to be triflers that have any esteem for it, or make use of the mood itself for proof of which they think they bring a most powerful argument which rather appears to be the dullness of their own senses, as if whatever fled their apprehensions were to be rejected as useless and of no value. And then again they urge that its magnitude cannot be perceived through its concord, like that of the semitone, tone, and other distances, not understanding that at the same time they throw out the third, fifth, and seventh, of which the one consists of three, the other of five, and the last of seven diases and on the same principle all the intervals that are odd should be rejected as useless, inasmuch as none of them is perceptible through concord, and this would include all which by means of even the smallest diasis are measured by odd numbers. Whence it necessarily follows that no division of the tetrachord would be of use but that which is to be measured by all even intervals, as in the syntonic diatonic and in the tonian chromatic. But these opinions are not only contrary to appearance, but repugnant one to another, for they themselves chiefly make use of those divisions of tetrachords in which most of the intervals are either unequal or irrational, to which purpose they always soften both Lycanus and Parinete, and lower even some of the standing sounds by an irrational interval, bringing the trite and Parinete to approach them. And especially they applaud the use of those systems in which most of the intervals are irrational, by relaxing not only those tones which are by nature movable, but also some which are properly fixed, as it is plain to those that rightly understand these things. Now for the advantages that accrue to men from the use of music, the famous Homer has taught us, introducing Achilles, in the height of his fury toward Agamemnon, appeased by the music which he learned from Chiron, a person of great wisdom. For thus says he, Amused at ease the godlike man they found, Pleased with the solemn harps of harmonious sound, The well-wrought harp from conquered Thebe came, Of polished silver was its costly frame. With this he soothes his angry soul, And sings the immortal deeds of heroes and of kings. Learn, says Homer, from hence the true use of music. 
for it became Achilles, the son of Peleus the Just, to sing the famous acts and achievements of great and valiant men. Also, in teaching the most proper time to make use of it, he found out a profitable and pleasing pastime for one's leisure hours. For Achilles, being both valiant and active, by reason of the disgust he had taken against Agamemnon, withdrew from the war. Homer, therefore, thought he could not do better than by the laudable incitements of music and poetry to inflame the hero's courage for those achievements which he afterwards performed. And this he did, calling to mind the great actions of former ages. Such was then the ancient music, and such the advantages that made it profitable. To which end and purpose we read that Hercules, Achilles, and many others made use of it, whose master, wisest Chiron, is recorded to have taught not only music, but morality and physic. In brief, therefore, a rational person will not blame the sciences themselves, if any one make use of them amiss, but will adjudge such a failing to be the error of those that abuse them, so that whoever he be that shall give his mind to the study of music in his youth, if he meet with a musical education, proper for the forming and regulating his inclinations, he will be sure to applaud and embrace that which is noble and generous, and to rebuke and blame the contrary as well in other things as in what belongs to music. And by that means he will become clear from all reproachful actions, for now, having reaped the noblest fruit of music, he may be of great use, not only to himself, but to the commonwealth. While music teaches him to abstain from everything indecent, both in word and deed, and to observe decorum, temperance, and regularity. Now, that those cities which were governed by the best laws took care always of a generous education in music, many testimonies may be produced. But for us it shall suffice to have instanced Terpander, who appeased a sedition among the Lacedaemonians, and Thaletus the Cretan, of whom Pratinus writes that being sent for by the Lacedaemonians by advice of the oracle, he freed the city from a raging pestilence. Homer tells that the Grecians stopped the fury of another noisome pestilence by the power and charms of the same noble science. With sacred hymns and songs that sweetly please, the Grecian youth all day the gods appease. Their lofty paeans bright Apollo hears, and still the charming sounds delight his ears. These verses, most excellent master, I thought requisite to add as the finishing stone to my musical discourse, which were by you cited before, to show the force of harmony. For, indeed, the chiefest and sublimest end of music is the graceful return of our thanks to the gods, and the next is to purify and bring our minds to a sober and harmonious temper. Thus, said Sotericus, most excellent master, I have given you what may be called an encyclic discourse of music. Nor was Sotericus a little admired for what he had spoken, as one that both by his countenance and speech had shown his zeal and affection for that noble science. After all, said Onesicratus, I must needs applaud this in both of you, that you have kept within your own spheres and observed your proper limits. For Lysias, not insisting any further, undertook only to show us what was necessary to the making a good hand, as being an excellent performer himself. But Sotericus has feasted us with a discovery of the benefit, the theory, the force, and right end of music. But one thing I think they have willingly left for me to say, for I cannot think them guilty of so much bashfulness that they should be ashamed to bring music into banquets, where certainly, if anywhere, it cannot but be very useful, which Homer also confirms to be true. Song and the merry dance, the joy of feasts. Not that I would have any one believe from these words that Homer thought music useful only for pleasure and delight, there being a profounder meaning concealed in the verse for he brought in music to be present at the banquets and revels of the ancients, as believing it then to be of greatest use and advantage to repel and mitigate the inflaming power of the wine. To which our Aristoxenus agrees, who alleges that music was introduced at banquets for this reason, that as wine, intemperately drunk, wakens both the body and mind, so music, by its harmonious order and symmetry, assuages and reduces them to their former constitution and therefore it was that Homer reports that the ancients made use of music at their solemn festivals. But for all this, my most honoured friends, methinks you have forgot the chiefest thing of all, and that which renders music most majestic. For Pythagoras, Archytas, Plato, and many others of the ancient philosophers were of the opinion that there could be no motion of the world, or rolling of the spheres, without the assistance of music, 
since the supreme deity created all things harmoniously. But it would be unseasonable now to enter upon such a discourse, especially at this time, when it would be absurd for music to transgress her highest and most musical office, which is to give the laws and limits of time and measure to all things. Therefore, after he had sung a paean and offered to Saturn and his offspring with all the other gods and the muses, he dismissed the company. End of section 11、section、12 of the Morals, Volume、1. Section This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Morals, Volume、1, by Plutarch. Translated by several hands. Corrected and revised by William W. Goodwin. Section 12. Of the Tranquility of the Mind. Part 1. Plutarch wisheth all health to his posseus. It was late before I received your letter, wherein you make your request that I would write something to you concerning the tranquility of the mind, and of those things in the Timaeus which require a more perspicuous interpretation. At the same time, a very urgent occasion called upon our common friend and companion Eros to sail directly to Rome. That which quickened him to a greater expedition was a dispatch he received from Fundanus, that best of men, who, as his custom is, always enjoins the making haste. Therefore, wanting full leisure to consummate those things justly which you requested, and being on the other side unwilling to send one from me to your dear self empty handed, I have transcribed my commonplace book. And hastily put together those collections which I had by me concerning this subject. For I thought you a man that did not look after flourishes of style and the affected elegance of language, but only required what was instructive in its nature and useful to us in the conduct of our lives. And I congratulate that bravery of temper in you, that though you are admitted into the confidence of princes, and have obtained so great a vogue of eloquence at the bar that no man hath exceeded you, you have not. Like the tragic Merops, suffered yourself to be puffed up with the applause of the multitude, and transported beyond those bounds which are prescribed to our passions. But you call to mind that which you have so often heard that a rich slipper will not cure the gout, a diamond ring a whitlow, nor will an imperial diadem ease the headache. For what advantage is there in honor, riches, or an interest at court? To remove all perturbations of mind and procure an equal tenor of life, if we do not use them with decency when they are present to our enjoyment, and if we are continually afflicted by their loss when we are deprived of them. And what is this but the province of reason, when the sensual part of us grows turbulent and makes excursions, to check its sallies and bring it again within the limits it hath transgressed, that it may not be carried away and so perverted with the gay appearance of things? For, as Xenophon gives advice, we ought to remember the gods and pay them particular devotions when our affairs are prosperous, that so when an exigency presseth us, we may more confidently invoke them, now that we have conciliated their favor and made them our friends. So wise men always ruminate upon those arguments which have any efficacy against the troubles of the mind before their calamities happen, that so the remedies being long prepared, they may acquire energy and work with more powerful operation. For as angry dogs are exasperated by everyone's rating them, and are flattered to be quiet only by his voice to which they are accustomed, so it is not easy to pacify the brutish affections of the soul, but by familiar reasons, and such as are used to be administered in such inward distempers. Besides, he that affirmed that whosoever would enjoy tranquility of mind must disengage himself from all private and public concerns. Would make us pay dear for our tranquillity by buying it with idleness, as if he should prescribe thus to a sick man. Lie still, poor wretch, and keep thy bed. Now, stupefaction is a bad remedy for desperate pain in the body, and verily he would be no better physician for the soul who should order idleness, softness, and neglect of friends, kinsfolk, and country, in order to remove its trouble and grief. It is likewise a false position that those live most contentedly who have the least to do. For then, by this rule, women would be of more sedate dispositions than men, since they only sit at home and mind their domestic affairs. Whereas, in fact, as Hesiod expresseth it, the virgin's tender limbs are kept from cold, not the least wind to touch them is so bold. 
But nevertheless, we see that grief and troubles and discontentments arising from jealousy or superstition or vain opinions flow as it were with a torrent into the apartments of the females. And though Laertes lived twenty years in the fields secluded from the world, and only a toothless hag did make his bed, draw him his drink, and did his table spread. Though he forsook his house and country, and fled from a kingdom, yet grief with his sloth and sadness still kept him company. There are some to whom idleness hath been an affliction, as, for instance, but raging still, amidst his navy sat the stern Achilles, steadfast in his hate, nor mixed in combat, nor in council joined, but wasting cares lay heavy on his mind. In his black thoughts revenge and slaughter roll, and scenes of blood rise dreadful in his soul. And he himself complains of it, being mightily disturbed, after this manner. I live an idle burden to the ground. Hence it is that Epicurus adviseth those who aspire to glory not to stagnate in their ambition, but be in perpetual motion, and so obey the dictates of their genius in managing the commonwealth. Because they would be more tormented and would suffer greater damages by idleness, if they were disappointed of that they were in the eager pursuit of. But the philosopher is absurd in this, that he doth not excite men who have abilities to qualify themselves for charges in the government, but only those who are of a restless and unquiet disposition. For the tranquillity and perturbation of the mind are not to be measured by the fewness or multitude of our actions, but by their beauty or turpitude. Since the omission of what is good is no less troublesome than the commission of evil. As for those who think there is one positive state of life, which is always serene, some fancying it to be of husbandmen, others of those who are unmarried, and some of kings, Menander clearly shows them their error in these verses. I thought those men, my Fania, always best, who take no money up at interest, who disengaged from business, spend the day, and in complaints don't sigh the night away, who, troubled, lamentable groans don't fetch, thus breathing out, Ah, miserable wretch! Those whom despairing thoughts don't waking keep, but without startings sweetly take their sleep. He goes on and observes to us that the same lot of misfortune falls to the rich as well as the poor. These neighbors' slender confines do divide. Sorrow and human life are still allied. It the luxurious liver doth infest, and robs the man of honor of his rest. In stricter ties doth the poor engage, with him grows old to a decrepit age. But as timorous and raw sailors in a boat, when they grow sick with the workings of the waves, think they shall overcome their pukings if they go on board of a ship, but their being equally out of order go into a galley, but are therefore never the better because they carry their nauseousness and fear along with them, so do the several changes of life only shift and not wholly extirpate the causes of our trouble. And these are only our want of experience, the weakness of judgment, and a certain impotence of mind which hinders us from making a right use of what we enjoy. The rich man is subject to this uneasiness of humor as well as the poor, the bachelor as well as the man in wedlock. This makes the pleader withdraw from the bar, and then his retirement is altogether as irksome. And this infuseth a desire into others to be presented at court, and when they come here, they presently grow weary of the life. Poor men when sick do peevishly complain, the sense of want doth aggravate their pain. For when the wife grows officious in her attendance, the physician himself is a disease, and the bed is not made easy enough to his mind. Even his friend importunes him with his visits. He doth molest him when he first doth come, and when he goes away he's troublesome, as Ion expresseth it. But when the heat of the disease is over, and the former temperature of the body is restored, then health returns, and brings with it all those pleasant images which sickness chased away. So that he that yesterday refused eggs and delicate cakes, and the finest manchets, will now snap eagerly at a piece of household bread, with an olive and a few watercresses. So reason makes all sorts of life easy, and every change pleasant. Alexander wept when he heard from Anaxarchus that there was an infinite number of worlds, and his friends asking him if any accident had befallen him, he returns this answer. Do not you think it a matter worthy of lamentation that, 
when there is such a vast multitude of them, we have not yet conquered one? But Crates, with only his scrip and tattered cloak, laughed out his life jocosely, as if he had been always at a festival. The great power and command of Agamemnon gave him an equal disturbance. Look upon Agamemnon, Atreus' son. What might loads of trouble he hath on? He is distracted with perpetual care. Jove that inflicts it gives him strength to bear. Diogenes, when he was exposed to sail in the market and was commanded to stand up, not only refused to do it, but ridiculed the auctioneer with this piece of raillery. What? If you were selling a fish, would you bid it rise up? Socrates was a philosopher in the prison, and discoursed with his friends, though he was fettered. But Phaeton, when he climbed up into heaven, thought himself unhappy there, because nobody would give him his father's chariot and the horses of the sun. As therefore the shoe is twisted to the shape of the foot and not in the opposite way, so do the affections of the mind render the life conformable to themselves. For it is not custom, as one observed, which makes even the best life pleasant to those who choose it, but it must be prudence in conjunction with it, which makes it not only the best of its kind, but sweetest in its enjoyment. The fountain, therefore, of tranquillity being in ourselves, let us cleanse it from all impurity and make its streams limpid, that all external accidents, by being made familiar, may be no longer grievous to us, since we shall know how to use them well. Let not these things thy least concern engage, for though thou fret, they will not mind thy rage. Him only good and happy we may call, who rightly useth what doth him befall. For Plato compared our life to a game at dice, where we ought to throw for what is most commodious for us, but when we have thrown to make the best of our casts. We cannot make what chances we please turn up if we play fair. This lies out of our power. That which is within our power, and is our duty if we are wise, is to accept patiently what fortune shall allot us, and so to adjust things in their proper places, that what is our own may be disposed of to the best advantage, and what hath happened against our will may offend us as little as possible. But as to men who live without measures, and with no prudence, like those whose constitution is so sickly and infirm, that they are equally impatient both of heats and colds, prosperity exalts them above their temper, and adversity dejects them beneath it. Indeed, each fortune disturbs them, or rather they raise up storms to themselves in either, and they are especially querulous under good circumstances. Theodorus, who was called the atheist, was used to say that he reached out his instructions with the right hand, and his auditors received them with their left hands. So men of no education, when fortune would even be complacent to them, are yet so awkward in their observance that they take her addresses on the wrong side. On the contrary, men that are wise, as the bees draw honey from the thyme, which is a most unsavory and dry herb, extract something that is convenient and useful even from the most bitter afflictions. This therefore let us learn and have inculcated upon us. Like the man who threw a stone at a bitch but hit his stepmother, on which he exclaimed, Not so bad. So we may often turn the direction of what fortune obtrudes upon us contrary to our desires. Diogenes was driven into banishment, but it was not so bad for him, for of an exile he became a philosopher. Zeno of Citium, when he heard that the only ship he had left was sunk by an unmerciful tempest, with all the rich cargo that was in her, break out into this exclamation, Fortune, I applaud thy contrivance, who by this means has reduced me to a threadbare cloak in the piazza of the Stoics. What hinders then but that these examples should be the patterns of our imitation? Thou stoodst candidate for a place in the government, and wast balked in thy hopes. Consider that thou wilt live at ease in thy own country, following thy own affairs. Thou wast ambitious to be the confidant of some great person, and suffered so repulse. Thou wilt gain thus much by it, that thou wilt be free from danger, and disembarrassed from business. Again, Hast thou managed any affairs full of intricacy and trouble? Hot water doth not so much cherish the soft members of the body, as Pindar expresseth it, as glory and honor joined with power sweeten all our toils, and make labor easy. Hast thou met with any unfortunate success? Has calumny bit, or envy hissed at thee? 
there is yet a prosperous gale, which sits fair to convey thee to the port of the Muses, and land thee at the academy. This Plato did, after he made shipwreck of the friendship of Diogenes. And indeed it highly conduceth to the tranquility of the mind, to look back upon illustrious men, and see with what temper they have borne their calamities. For instance, doth it trouble thee that thou wantest children? Consider that kings of the Romans have died without them, had kingdoms to leave, but no heirs. Doth poverty and low condition afflict thee? It is put to thy option. Wouldst thou not rather of all the Boeotians be Epaminondas, and of all the Romans Fabricius? But thy bed is violated, and thy wife is an adulteress. Didst thou never read this inscription at Delphi? Here am I set by Aegis' royal hand, who both the earth and ocean did command. And yet did the report never arrive thee that Alcibiades debauched this king's wife, Timaea, and that she herself whispered archly to her maids that the child was not the genuine offspring of her husband, but a young Alcibiades? Yet this did not obstruct the glory of the man, for notwithstanding his being a cuckold, he was the greatest and most famous among the Greeks. Nor did the dissolute manners of his daughter hinder Stilpo from enlivening his humor and being the jolliest philosopher of his time. For when Metrocles upbraided him with it, he asked him whether he was the offender or his mad girl. He answered that it was her sin, but his misfortune. To which Stilpo replied, But are not sins lapses? No doubt of it, saith Metrocles. And is not that properly called lapse when we fall off from the attainment of those things we were in the pursuit of? He could not deny it. He pursued him further with this question. And are not these unlucky traverses misfortunes to them who are thus disappointed? Thus by a pleasant and philosophical reasoning he turned the discourse, and showed the cynic that his calumny was idle, and he barked in vain. But there are some whom not only the evil dispositions of their friends and domestics, but those of their enemies give disturbance to. For a proneness to speak evil of another, anger, envy, ill nature, a jealous and perverse temper, are the pests of those who are infected with them. And these serve only to trouble and exasperate fools, like the brawls of scolding neighbors, the peevishness of our acquaintance, and the iniquity or want of qualifications in those who administer the government. But thou seemest to me to be especially concerned with affairs of this nature, for, like the physicians mentioned by Sophocles, who bitter color cleanse and scour, with drugs as bitter and as sour? Thou dost let other men's enormities sour thy blood, which is highly irrational. For, even in matters of private management, thou dost not always employ men of wit and address, which are the most proper for such an execution, but sometimes those of rough and crooked dispositions. And to animate vert upon them for every peccadillo thou must not think belongs to thee, nor is it easy in the performance. But if thou makest that use of them, as surgeons do of forceps to pull out teeth or ligatures to bind wounds, and so appear cheerful whatever falls out, the satisfaction of thine mind will delight thee more than the concern at other men's privity and malicious humor will disturb thee. Otherwise, as dogs bark at all persons indifferently, so, if thou persecutest everybody that offends thee, thou wilt bring the matter to this pass by thy imprudence, that all things will flow down into the imbecility of thy mind, as a place void and capable of receiving them, and at last thou wilt be filled with nothing but other men's miscarriages. For if some of the philosophers inveigh against compassion which others' calamities affect us with, as a soft affection, saying that we ought to give real assistance to those in distress and not to be dejected or sympathized with them, and if, which is a thing of higher moment, they discard all sadness and uneasiness when the sense of a vice or a disease is upon us, saying that we ought to cure the indisposition without being grieved, is it not highly consonant to reason that we should not storm or fret if those we have to do with are not so wise and honest as they should be? Let us consider the thing truly, my Posseus, lest, whilst we find fault with others, we prove partial in our respect through inadvertency, and lest our censuring their failings may proceed not so much from a hatred of their vices as from love of ourselves. We should not have our passions moved at every provocation, nor let our desires grow exorbitant beyond what is just. For these little aversions of our temper engender suspicions, and infuse moroseness into us, which makes us surly to those who precluded the way to our ambition, or who made us fall into those disastrous events we would have willingly shunned. 
But he that hath a smoothness in his nature and a talent of moderation can transact and converse with mankind easily and with mildness. Let us recapitulate, therefore, what we have said. When we are in a fever, everything that we taste is not only unsavory but bitter. But when we see others relish it without any disgust, we do not then lay the blame either upon the meat or drink, but conclude that only ourselves and the disease are in fault. In like manner we shall cease to bear things impatiently, if we see others enjoy them with alacrity and humor. And this likewise is a great promoter of the tranquility of mind, if, amongst those ill successes which carry a dismal appearance, we look upon other events which have a more beautiful aspect, and so blend them together that we may overcome the bad by the mixture of the good. But although, when our eyes are dazzled with too intense a splendor, we refresh our sight by viewing something that is green and florid, yet we fix the optics of our mind upon doleful objects, and compel them to dwell upon the recital of our miseries, plucking them perforce, as it were, from the consideration of what is better. And here we may insert that which was said to a pragmatical fellow, handsomely enough. Why so quick-sighted others' faults to find, but to thy own so partially art blind? Tis malice that exasperates thy mind. But why, my friend, art thou so acute to discern even thy own misfortunes, and so industrious to renew them and set them in thy sight, that they may be the more conspicuous, while thou never turnest thy considerations to these good things which are present with thee, and thou dost enjoy? But as cupping glasses draw the impurest blood out of the body, so thou dost extract the quintessence of infelicity to afflict thyself. In this thou art no better than the Chian merchant, who, while he sold abundance of his best and most generous wine to others, called for some what was pricked and vapid to taste at supper. And one of his servants, asking another what he left his master doing, he made this answer, that he was calling for bad when the good was by him. For most men leave the pleasant and delectable things behind them, and run with haste to embrace those which are not only difficult, but intolerable. Aristippus was not of this number, for he knew, even to the niceness of a grain, to put prosperous against adverse fortune into the scale, that the one might outweigh the other. Therefore, when he lost the noble farm, he asked one of his dissembled friends, who pretended to be sorry, not only with regret but impatience, for his mishap, Thou hast but one piece of land, but have I not three farms yet remaining? He assenting to the truth of it. Why then, saith he, should I not rather lament your misfortune, since it is the raving only of a madman to be concerned at what is lost, and not rather rejoice in what is left? Thus, as children, if you rob them of one of their play games, will throw away the rest, and cry and scream. So, if fortune infests us only in one part, we grow fearful and abandon ourselves wholly to her attacks. But somebody will object to me. What is it that we have? Rather, what is it that we have not? One is honorable, the other is master of a family. This man hath a good wife, the other a faithful friend. Antipater of Tarsus, when he was upon his deathbed and reckoning up all the good events which had befallen him, would not omit a prosperous voyage which he had when he sailed from Cilicia to Athens. Even the trite and common blessings are not to be despised, but ought to take up a room in our deliberations. We should rejoice that we live, and are in health, and see the sun, that there are no wars nor seditions in our country, that the earth yields to cultivation, and that the sea is open to our traffic, that we can talk, be silent, do business, and be at leisure when we please. They will afford us greater tranquility of mind present, if we form some ideas of them when they are absent. If we often call to our remembrance how solicitous the sick man is after health, how acceptable peace is to put out a war, and what a courtesy it will do to us to gain credit and acquire friends in a state of note where we are strangers and unknown, and contrariwise, how great a grief it is to forego these things when we once have them. For surely a thing does not become great and precious when we have lost it, while it is of no account so long as we possess it, for the value of a thing cannot be increased by its loss. But we ought not to take pains to acquire things as being of great value, and to be in fear and trembling lest we may lose them, as if they were precious, and then all the time they are safe in our possession to neglect them as if they were of no importance. But we are so used to them that we may reap satisfaction and gain a solid pleasure from them, that so we may be the better enabled to endure their loss with evenness of temper. But most men, as Arcasillaus observed, 
think they must be critics upon other men's poems, survey their pictures with a curious eye, and examine their statues with all the delicacy of sculpture, but in the meanwhile transiently pass over their own lives, though there be some things in them which will not only detain, but please their consideration. But they will not restrain the prospect to themselves, but are perpetually looking abroad, and so become servile admirers of other men's fortune and reputation, as adulterers are always gloating upon other men's wives, and condemning their own. Besides, this is a thing highly conducing to the tranquility of the mind, for a man chiefly to consider himself and his own affairs. But if this always cannot take place, he should not make comparisons with men of a superior condition to himself, though this is the epidemical frenzy of the vulgar. As, for instance, slaves who lie in fetters applaud their good fortune whose shackles are off. Those who are loose from their bonds would be free men by manumission. These again aspire to be citizens. The citizen would be rich, the wealthy man would be a governor of a province, the haughty governor would be a king, and the king a god, hardly resting content unless he can hurl thunderbolts and dart lightning. So all are eager for what is above them, and are never content with what they have. The wealth of golden gyges has no delight for me. Likewise, no emulation doth my spirits fire, the action of the gods I don't admire. I would not to be great a tyrant be, the least appearances I would not see. But one of Thasus, another of Chios, one of Galatea, and a fourth of Bithynia, not contenting themselves with the rank they enjoyed amongst their fellow citizens, where they had honor and commands, complain that they have not foreign characters and are not made patricians of Rome, and if they attain that dignity, that they are not praetors. And if they arrive even to that degree, they still think themselves ill dealt with that they are not consuls. And when promoted to the fasces, that they were declared the second and not the first. And what is all this but ungratefully accusing fortune, and industriously picking out occasions to punish and torment ourselves? But he that is in his right senses and wise for his own advantage, out of those many millions which the sun looks upon, who of the products of the earth do eat? If he sees any one in the mighty throng who is more rich and honorable than himself, he is neither dejected in his mind nor countenance, nor doth he pensively sit down deploring his unhappiness, but he walks abroad publicly with an honest assurance. He celebrates his own good genius, and boasts of his good fortune in that it is happier than a thousand other men's which are in the world. In the Olympic Games you cannot gain victory choosing your antagonist. But in human life affairs allow thee to excel many and to bear thyself aloft, and to be envied rather than envious. Unless indeed thou dost match thyself unequally with a Briarius or a Hercules. Therefore, when thou art surprised into a false admiration of him who is carried in his sedan, cast thy eyes downward upon the slaves who support his luxury. When thou art wondering at the greatness of Xerxes crossing the Hellespont, consider those wretches who are digging through Mount Athos, who are urged to their labor with blows, blood being mixed with their sweat. Call to mind that they had their ears and noses cut off because the bridge was broken by the violence of the waves. Think upon that secret reflection they have, and how happy they would esteem thy life and condition. Socrates, hearing one of his friends crying out, How dear things are sold in this city! The wine of Chios costs a mina, the purple fish three, and a half pint of honey five drachmas. He brought him to the meal shop, and showed him that half a peck of flour was sold for a penny. "'Tis a cheap city," said he. Then he brought him to the oil man's, and told him he might have a quart of olives for two farthings. At last he went to the salesman's, and convinced him that the purchase of a sleeveless jerkin was only ten drachmas. "'Tis a cheap city," he repeated. So, when we hear others declare that our condition is afflicted because we are not consuls and in eminent command, let us then look upon ourselves as living not only in a bare happiness, but splendor, and that we do not beg our bread, and are not forced to subsist by carrying of burdens, or by flattery. But such is our folly, that we accustom ourselves rather to live for other men's sakes than our own. And our dispositions are so prone to upbraidings and to be tainted with envy, that the grief we conceive at others' prosperity lessens the joy we ought to take in our own. But to cure thee of this extravagant emulation, Look not upon the outside of these applauded men, which is so gay and brilliant, but draw the gaudy curtain, and carry thy eyes inward, and thou shalt find most gnawing disquiets to be dissembled under these false appearances. When the renowned Pittacus, who got him so great a name for his fortitude, wisdom, and justice, was entertaining his friends at a noble banquet, 
and his spouse in an angry humor came and overturned the table. His guests, being extremely disturbed at it, he told them, Every one of you hath his particular plague, and my wife is mine, and he is very happy, who hath this only. The pleading lawyer is happy at the bar, but the scene opening shows a civil war. For the good man hath a domestic strife, he is a slave to that imperious creature, wife. Scolding without doors doth to him belong, but she within them doth claim all the tongue. Pecked by his female tyrants, him I see, whilst from this grievance I myself am free. These are the secret stings which are inseparable from honor, riches, and dominion, and which are unknown to the vulgar, because a counterfeit luster dazzleth their sight. All pleasant things Atreides doth adorn, the merry genius smiled when he was born. And they compute this happiness from his great stores of ammunition, his variety of managed horses, and his battalions of disciplined men. But an inward voice of sorrow seems to silence all this ostentation with mournful accents. Jove in a deep affliction did him plunge. Observe this likewise. Old man, I reverence thy aged head, who to a mighty length has spun thy thread. Safe from all dangers, to the grave goest down, ingloriously, because thou art unknown. Such expostulations as these with thyself will serve to dispel this querulous humor, which makes thee fondly applaud other people's conditions and appreciate thy own. End of section 12《》section 13 of The Morals, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Morals, Volume 1, by Plutarch. Translated by several hands. Corrected and revised by William W. Goodwin. Section 13. Of the Tranquility of Mind, Part 2. This likewise greatly obstructs the tranquility of the mind, that our desires are immoderate and not suited to our abilities of attainment, which, like sails beyond the proportion of the vessel, help only to overset it, so that, being blown up with extravagant expectations, if ill success frustrates our attempts, we presently curse our stars and accuse fortune, when we ought rather to lay the blame upon our enterprising folly. For we do not reckon him unfortunate who will shoot with a plowshare and let slip an ox at a hare. Nor is he born under an unlucky influence who cannot catch a buck with a sling or a dragnet, for it was the weakness and perverseness of his mind which inflamed him on to impossible things. The partial love of himself is chiefly in fault, which infuseth a vicious inclination to arrogate and an insatiable ambition to attempt everything. For they are not content with the affluence of riches and the accomplishments of mind, that they are robust, have a complacence of humor and strength of brain for company, that they are privados to princes and governors of cities, unless they have dogs of great sagacity and swiftness, horses of a generous strain, nay, unless their quails and cocks are better than other men's. Old Dionysius, not being satisfied that he was the greatest potentate of his time, grew angry, even to a frenzy that Philoxenus the poet exceeded him in the sweetness of his voice, and Plato in the subtleties of disputation. Therefore he condemned one to the quarries, and sold the other into Aegina. But Alexander was of another temper, for when Chryso the famous runner contended with him for swiftness, and seemed to be designedly lagging behind and yielding the race, he was in a great rage with him. And Achilles in Homer spake very well when he said, None of the Greeks for courage me excel. Let others have the praise of speaking well. When Megabizus the Persian came into the shop of Apelles and began to ask some impertinent questions concerning his art, the famous painter checked him into silence with this reprimand. As long as thou didst hold thy peace, thou didst appear to be a man of condition, and I paid a deference to the eclat of thy purple and the luster of thy gold. But now, since thou art frivolous, Thou exposest thyself to the laughter even of my boys that mix the colors. Some think the Stoics very childish when they hear them affirm that the wise man must not only deserve that appellation for his prudence, be of exact justice and great fortitude, 
but must likewise have all the flowers of a rhetorician and the conduct of a general, must have the elegancies of a poet, be very wealthy, and called a king. But these good men claim all these titles for themselves, and if they do not receive them, they grow peevish and are presently out of temper. But the qualifications of the gods themselves are different, for the one is styled the deity of war, another of the oracle, a third of traffic. And Jupiter makes Venus preside over marriages and be goddess of the nuptial bed, the delicacy of her sex being unapt for marital affairs. And there are some things which carry a contrariety in their nature and cannot be consistent. As, for instance, the study of the mathematics and practice in oratory are exercises which require a great leisure and freedom from other concerns. But the intrigues of politics cannot be managed, and the favor of princes cannot be attained or cultivated without severe application and being involved in affairs of high moment. Then the indulgence ourselves to drink wine and eat flesh makes the body strong, but it effeminates the mind. Industry to acquire and care to preserve our wealth do infinitely increase it, but the contempt of riches is the best refinement in our philosophic journey. Hence it is very manifest that there is a wide difference in things, and that we ought to obey the inscription of the Pythian oracle, that every man should know himself, that he should not constrain his genius but leave it to his own propensions, and then that he should apply himself to that to which he is most adapted, and not do violence to nature by dragging her perforce to this or that course of life. With generous provender they the horse do feed, that he may win the race with strength and speed. The mighty ox is fitted to the yoke, and by his toil the fertile clods are broke. The dolphin, when a ship he doth espy, straight the good-natured fish his fins doth ply. By the ship's motion he his own doth guide and lovingly swims constant to her side. And if you'd apprehend the foaming boar, the monster by a mastiff must be tore. But he is stupid in his wishes who takes it amiss that he is not a lion, who with a proud insulting air doth tread, rough as the mountains where he first was bred. Or that he is not a malta shock, delicately brought up in the lap of a fond widow, he is not a jot more rational who would be an Empedocles, a Plato, or a Democritus, and write about the universe and the reality of things therein, and at the same time would sleep by the dry side of an old woman because she is rich, as Euphorion did, or be admitted to debauch with Alexander amongst his club of drunkards, as Midias was, or to be concerned that he is not in as high a vogue of admiration as is Menius was for his riches, and Epaminondas for his virtue. For those who run races do not think they have injury done them if they are not crowned with those garlands which are due to the wrestlers, but they are rather transported with joy at their own rewards. Sparta has fallen to thy lot. Honor and adorn her. Solon hath expressed himself to this purpose. Virtue for sordid wealth shall not be sold. Its beauty far outshines the miser's gold. This without fortune's shocks doth still endure but that's possession is insecure. And Strato, who wrote of physics, when he heard that Menedemus had a great number of scholars, asked, What wonder is it if more come to wash than be anointed? And Aristotle, writing to Antipater, declared that Alexander was not the only one who ought to think highly of himself because his dominion extended over many subjects, since they had a right to think as well of themselves who entertained becoming sentiments of the gods. So that, by having a just opinion of our own excellences, we shall be disturbed with the less envy against those of other men. But now, although in other cases we do not expect figs from the vine nor grapes from the olive tree, yet, if we have not the complicated titles of being rich and learned, philosophers in the schools and commanders in the field, if we cannot flatter and have the facetious liberty to speak what we please, nay, if we are not counted parsimonious and splendid in our expenses at the same time, we grow uneasy to ourselves, and despise our life as maimed and imperfect. Besides, nature seems to instruct us herself, for, as she ministers different sorts of food to her animals, and hath endowed them with diversity of appetites, some to eat flesh, others to pick up seed, and others to dig up roots for their nourishment, so she hath bestowed upon her rational creatures various sorts of accommodations to sustain their being. The shepherd hath one distinct from the plowman, 
the fowler hath another peculiar to himself, and the fourth lives by the sea. So that in common equity we ought to labor in that vocation which is appointed and most commodious for us, and let alone the rest. And so not to prove that Hesiod fell short of the truth when he spake after this manner. The potter hates another of the trade, if by his hands a finer dish is made. The smith his brother smudge with scorn doth treat, if he his iron strikes with brisker heat. And this emulation is not confined to mechanics and those who follow the same occupations, but the rich man envies the learned. He that hath a bright reputation envies the miser's guineas, and the pettifogger thinks he is outdone in talking by the sophister. Nay, by heaven, he that is born free sottishly admires the servile attendance of him who is of the household to a king. And the man that hath patrician blood in his veins calls the comedian happy, who acts his part gracefully and with humor, and applauds even the mimic who pleaseth with farce and scaramouchy gestures. Thus by a false estimate of happiness they disturb and perplex themselves. Now that every man hath a storehouse of trouble and contentment in his own bosom, and the vessels which contain good and evil are not placed at Jupiter's threshold, but in the recesses of the mind, the variety of our passions is an abundant demonstration. The fool doth not discern, and consequently cannot mind, the good that is obvious to him, for his thoughts are still intent upon the future. But the prudent man retrieves things that were lost out of their oblivion, by strength of recollection renders them perspicuous, and enjoys them as if they were present. Happiness having only a few coy minutes to be courted in, the man that hath no intellect neglects this opportunity, and so it slides away from his sense and no more belongs to him. But like him that is painted in hell twisting a rope, and who lets the ass that is by him devour all the laborious textures as fast as he makes them, so most men have such a lethargy of forgetfulness upon them that they lose the remembrance of all great actions, and no more call to mind their pleasant intervals of leisure and repose. The relish of their former banquets has grown insipid, and delight hath left no piquant impression upon their palates. By this means they break as it were the continuity of life, and destroy the union of present things to the past, and dividing yesterday from today, and today from tomorrow, they utterly efface all events, as if they had never been. For, as those who are dogmatical in the schools, and deny the augmentation of bodies by reason of the perpetual flux of all substance, do strip us out of ourselves and make no man to be the same today that he was yesterday, so those who bury all things that have perceived them in oblivion, who lose all the notices of former times and let them all be shattered carelessly out of their minds, do every day make themselves void and empty, and they become utterly dependent on the morrow, as if those things which happened last year and yesterday and the day before were not to affect their cognizance and be occurrences worthy their observation. This is a great impediment to the tranquillity of the mind. But that which is its more sensible disturbance is this, that as flies upon a mirror easily slide down the smooth and polished parts of it, but stick to those which are rugged and uneven and fall into its flaws, so men let what is cheerful and pleasant flow from them, and dwell only upon sad melancholy remembrances. Nay, as those of Olynthus carry beetles into a certain place, which from the destruction of them is called their slaughterhouse, where, all passages being stopped against their escape, they are killed by the weariness of perpetual flying about, so when men have once fallen upon the memory of their former sorrows, no consolation can take them off from the mournful theme. But as in a landscape we draw the most beautiful colors, so we ought to fill the prospects of our minds with the most agreeable and sprightly images, that, if we cannot utterly abolish those which are dark and unpleasant, we may at least obscure them by more gay and lively representations. For as the strings of a lute or bow, so is the harmony of the world alternately tightened and relaxed by vicissitude and change, and in human affairs there is nothing that is unmixed, nothing that is unallied. But as in music there are some sounds which are flat and some sharp, and in grammar some letters that are vocal and some mute, but neither the man of concord nor syntax doth industriously decline one sort, but with the fineness of his art mixeth them together. So in things in this world which carry a direct opposition in their nature to one another, when, as Euripides expresseth it, 
The good things with the evil still are joined, and in strict union mutually combined. The checkered worth doth beautiful appear, for what is sweet allays the more severe. Yet we ought not to be discouraged or have any despondencies. But in this case let us imitate the musicians, who drown the harsh cadences with others that more caress the ear. So, by tempering our adverse fortune with what is more prosperous, let us render our lives pleasant and of an equal tone. For that is not true which Menander tells us. Soon as an infant doth salute the day, a genius his first cryings doth obey, and to his charge comes hastily away. The demon doth assist the tender lad, shows him what's good, and saves him from the bad. But the opinion of Empedocles deserves more our approbation, who saith that, as soon as any one is born, he is carefully taken up and governed by two guardian spirits. There were Cathonia and far-seen Heliope, and bloody Darius and grave face Harmonia, Callisto and Aeshra, Thusa and Denia, with lovely Nemertes and black-fruited Asaphaea. By this diversity of characters is expressed only the variety of our passions, and these are the seeds of discontent we brought into the world with us. Since now these disorder our lives and make them unequal, he that is master of himself wishes for the better, but expects the worse. But he useth them both with a moderation suitable to that injunction, do not anything too much. For, as Epicurus said, not only does he that is least impatient after tomorrow enjoy it most when it comes, but honor, riches, and power give those the greatest complacency who are not tormented with any apprehensions that the contrary will befall them. For an immoderate craving after things of this nature infuseth a fear of losing them, equal to the first intemperate desire. This deadens the fruition, and makes the pleasure as weak and unstable as flame driven by the wind. But he to whom his reason hath given the assurance that he can boldly say to fortune, Welcome to me, if good thou bringest aught, and if thou fail, I will take little thought. This is the man who can confidently enjoy what is present with him, and who is not afflicted with such cowardice of thoughts as to be in constant alarms, lest he should lose his possessions, which would be an intolerable grievance. But let us not only admire, but imitate that temper of mind in Anaxagoras, which made him express himself in these words upon the death of his son. I knew that I had begotten a mortal. And let us apply it to all the casualties of life after this manner. I know my riches have only the duration of a day. I know that the same hand which bestowed authority upon me would spoil me of those ornaments and take it away again. I know my wife to be the best of women, but still a woman. My friend to be faithful, yet the cement might be broken, for he was a man, which, as Plato saith, is a very inconstant creature. These previous expostulations and preparations, if anything fall out which is against our mind but not contrary to our expectation, will cure the palpitation of our hearts, make our disturbances settle and go down, and bring our minds to a consistence. Not indulging us in these lazy exclamations, Who would have thought it? I looked for better, and did not expect this. Carneades gives us a short memoir concerning great things, that the cause from whence all our troubles proceed is that they befall unexpectedly. The kingdom of Macedon, compared with the Roman Empire, sank in the competition. For it was not only an inconsiderable part of it, yet when Perseus lost it he not only deplored his own misfortune, but he was thought by all the most abject and miserable of mankind. Yet Amelius that conquered him, when he delivered up the commands of sea and land into the hands of a successor, was crowned and did sacrifice, and was esteemed happy. For he knew, when he received his honor, that it was but temporary, and that he must lay down the authority he had taken up. But Perseus was stripped of his dominions by surprise. The poet hath prettily illustrated what it is for a thing to fall out unexpectedly. For Ulysses, when his dog died, could not forbear crying, yet would not suffer himself to weep when his wife sat by him crying, but stopped his tears. For here he came strengthened with reason, and beforehand acquainted with the accident. But before it was the suddenness of the disaster which raised his sorrow and threw him into complaints. Generally speaking, 
Those things which happen to us against our will afflict us partly by a pungency that is in their nature, and partly custom and opinion so effeminate us that we are impatient under them. But against all contingencies we should have that of Menander in readiness. Afflictions to thyself thou dost create, thy fancy only is unfortunate. For what are afflictions to thee if they touch neither thy body nor thy soul? Of this sort is the low extraction of thy father, the adultery of thy wife, the loss of a garland, or being deprived of the upper seat in an assembly. And with all those crosses thou mayest have ease of mind and strength of body. But to those things which in their own nature excite our grief, such as sickness, pains of the body, and the death of our friends and children, we ought to apply that of Euripides. Alas, alas, and well a day! But why, alas, and well away? Not else to us hath yet been dealt, but that which daily men have felt. There is no reasoning more effectual to restrain our passions and hinder our minds from falling into despair than that which sets before us a physical necessity and the common lot of nature. And it is our bodies only that lie exposed to this destiny, and which we offer, as it were, as a handle to fortune. But the fort royal is still secure where our strength lies and our most precious things are treasured up. When Demetrius took Megara, he asked Stilpo whether he had not suffered particular damage in the plundering, to which he made this answer, that he saw nobody that could rob him. So when fate hath made all the depredations upon us it possibly can, and hath left us naked, yet there is nothing still within us which is out of reach of the pirate, which conquering Greece could never force away. Therefore we ought not so to vilify and depress our nature as if it could not get the ascendant over fortune, and had nothing of firmness and stability in it. But we ought rather to consider that, if any part of us is obnoxious to this, it is only that which is the smallest and the most impure and sickly too, whilst the better and more generous we have the most absolute dominion of, and our chiefest goods are placed in it, such as true discipline, a right notion of things, and reasonings which in their last results bring us unto virtue which are so far from being abolished that they cannot be corrupted. We ought likewise, with an invincible spirit and a bold security as regards futurity, to answer fortune in those words which Socrates retorted upon his judges, Anatus and Miletus may kill, but they cannot hurt me. So she can afflict me with a disease, can spoil me of my riches, disgrace me with my prince, and bring me under a popular odium. But she cannot make a good man wicked, or the brave man a mean and degenerate coward. She cannot cast envy upon a generous temper, or destroy any of those habits of the mind which are more useful to us in the conduct of our lives when they are within the command of our wills than the skill of a pilot in a storm. For the pilot cannot mitigate the billows, or calm the winds. He cannot sail into the haven as often as he has occasion, or without fear and trembling abide any danger that may befall him. But, after having used all his efforts, he at last recommits himself to the fury of the storm, pulls down all his sails by the board, whilst the lower mast is within an inch of the abyss, and sits trembling at the approaching ruin. But the affectations of the mind in a wise man procure tranquillity even to the body, for he prevents the beginnings of disease by temperance, a spare diet, and moderate exercise. But if an evil begin more visibly to show itself, as we sometimes steer our ship by rocks which lie in the water, he must then furl in his sails and pass by it, as Esclepiades expresseth it. But if the waves grow turbulent and the sea rougher, the port is at hand, and he may leave his body as he would a leaky vessel and swim ashore. For it is not so much the desire of life as the fear of death which makes the fool have such a dependence upon the body and stick so fast to its embraces. So Ulysses held fast by the fig tree, dreading Charybdis that lay under him. Where the wind would not suffer him to stay, nor would it serve to carry him away. So that on this side was but a slender support, and there was inevitable danger on the other. But he who considers the nature of the soul, and that death will transport it to a condition either far better or not much worse than what he now enjoys, hath contempt of death to sustain him as he traveleth on in his pilgrimage of life. No small viaticum towards tranquility of mind. For as to one that can live pleasantly so long as virtue and the better part of mankind are predominant, 
and can depart fearlessly so soon as hostile and unnatural principles prevail, saying to himself, Fate shall release me when I please myself. What in the whole scope of the creation can be thought of that can raise a tumult in such a man, or give him the least molestation? Certainly he that threw out that brave defiance to fortune in these words, I have prevented thee, O fortune, and have shut up all thy avenues to me, did not speak it confiding in the strength of walls or bars, or the security of keys, but it was an effect of his learning, and the challenge was a dictate of his reason. And these heights of resolution any men may attain to if they are willing, and we ought not to distrust or despair of arriving to the courage of saying the same things. Therefore we should not only admire, but be kindled with emulation, and think ourselves touched with the impulse of a divine instinct, which piques us on to the trial of ourselves in matters of less importance, that thereby we may find how our tempers bear to be qualified for greater, and so may not incuriously decline that inspection we ought to have over ourselves, or take refuge in the saying, Perchance nothing will be more difficult than this. For the luxurious thinker, who withdraws himself from severe reflections, and is conversant about no objects but what are easy and delectable, emasculates his understanding, and contracts a softness of spirit. But he that makes grief, sickness, and banishment the subjects of his meditation, who composeth his mind sedately, and poiseth himself with reason to sustain the burden, will find that those things are vain, empty, and false, which appear so grievous and terrible to the vulgar, as his own reasonings will make out to him in every particular. But many are shocked at this saying of Menander, no man can tell what will himself befall. In the means, while being monstrously ignorant, what a noble expedient this is to disperse our sorrows, to contemplate upon, and to be able to look fortune steadily in the face, and not to cherish delicate and effeminate apprehensions of things, like those bred up in the shade, under false and extravagant hopes which have not strength to resist the first adversity. But to the saying of Menander we may make this just and serious reply, it is true that a man while he lives can never say, This will never befall me. But he can say this, I will not do this or that, I will scorn to lie, I will not be treacherous or do a thing ungenerously, I will not defraud or circumvent anyone. And to do this lies within the sphere of our performance, and conduceth extremely to the tranquility of the mind. Whereas on the contrary, the being conscious of having done a wicked action leaves stings of remorse behind it, which, like an ulcer in the flesh, makes the mind smart with perpetual wounds. For reason, which chases away all other pains, creates repentance, shames the soul with confusion, and punishes it with torment. But as those who are chilled with an og or that burn with a fever feel acuter griefs than those who are scorched with the sun or frozen up with the severity of the weather, so those things which are casual and fortuitous give us the least disturbance, because they are external accidents. But the man whom the truth of this makes uneasy, Another did not run me on this shelf, I was the cause of all the ills myself. Who laments not only his misfortunes but his crimes, finds his agonies sharpened by the turpitude of the fact. Hence it comes to pass that neither rich furniture nor abundance of gold, not a descent from an illustrious family or greatness of authority, not eloquence and all the charms of speaking, can procure so great a serenity of life as a mind free from guilt kept untainted not only from actions, but purposes that are wicked. By this means the soul will not only be unpolluted, but undisturbed. The fountain will run clear and unsullied, and the streams that flow from it will be just and honest deeds, ecstasies of satisfaction, a brisk energy of spirit which makes a man an enthusiast in his joy, and a tenacious memory sweeter than hope, which, as Pindar saith, with a virgin warmth cherisheth old age. For as censers, even after they are empty, do for a long time after retain their fragrancy, as Carneades expresseth it, so the good actions of a wise man perfume his mind and leave a rich scent behind them, so that joy is, as it were, watered with these essences, and owes its flourishing to them. This makes him pity those who do not only bewail, but accuse human life, as if it were only a region of calamities and a place of banishment appointed for their souls. That saying of Diogenes extremely pleaseth me, who, seeing one sprucing himself up very neatly to go to a great entertainment, asked him whether every day was not a festival to a good man. 
and certainly that which makes it the more splendid festival is sobriety. For the world is a spacious and beautiful temple. This a man is brought into as soon as he is born, where he is not to be a dull spectator of immovable and lifeless images made by human hands, but is to contemplate sublime things, which, as Plato tells us, the divine mind has exhibited to our senses as likenesses of things in the ideal world, having the principles of life and motion in themselves, such as are the sun, moon, and stars, rivers which are supplied with fresh accessions of water, and the earth, which with a motherly indulgence suckles the plant and feeds her sensitive creatures. Now since life is the introduction and the most perfect initiation into these mysteries, it is but just that it should be full of cheerfulness and tranquility. For we are not to imitate the little vulgar, who wait impatiently for the jolly days which are consecrated to Saturn, Bacchus, and Minerva, that they may be merry with hired laughter and pay such a price to the mimic and stage dancer for their diversions. At all these games and ceremonies we sit silent and composed, for no man laments when he is initiated in the rites, when he beholds the games of Apollo or drinks in the Saturnalia. But when the gods order the scenes at their own festivals or initiate us into their own mysteries, the enjoyment becomes sordid to us, and we wear out our wretched lives in care, heaviness of spirit, and bitter complaints. Men are delighted with the harmonious touches of an instrument. They are pleased likewise with the melody of the birds, and it is not without some recreation that they behold the beasts frolicsome and sporting. But when the frisk is over and they begin to bellow and curl their brows, the ungrateful noise in their angry looks offend them. But as for their own lives, they suffer them to pass away without a smile, to boil with passions, to be involved in business, and eaten out with endless cares. And to ease them of their solicitudes, they will not seek out for remedies themselves, nor will they even hearken to the reasons or admit the consolations of their friends. But if they would only give ear to these, that they might bear their present condition without fault-finding, remember the past with a joy and gratitude, and live without fear or distrust, looking forward to the future with a joyful and lightsome hope. End of section 13